Hello friends. This is Revenger What If. How are you all? So in this video, we will see. What if Naruto reincarnated with the Maelstrom power in the new world? Naruto x Young Justice crossover. But before we start, if you want more amazing stuff like this, then be sure to subscribe to our channel and like this video. Also if possible share this video with your friends. Now without wasting any more time, let's begin the story. Dinah lifted the chopsticks to her mouth and took a bite from her smoked salmon. It was absolutely delicious. This was her first time visiting Japan. She always meant to come visit the country but rarely ever has the free time to have a personal life since joining the Justice League. In fact the reason that she is in the country at the moment is because she is on official Justice League business. The past three days she has been trying to find a certain child hero that sprung up in Tokyo recently. First mention of this new underage hero was about three months ago. It was one of several topics that Batman brought up in a meeting. She didn't think it was that big of a deal as long as the kid is helping others, but Batman is the type of person who doesn't trust a single person in the world especially ones that display any sorts of superhuman powers. If a person in the world shows up with superhuman powers whether villain, hero, or civilian, Batman will create a massive profile on the person in case the person ever becomes a threat. The Dark Knight doesn't take any chances when it comes to global safety. As much as she hates to admit it, Batman tends to save many lives with his paranoia even those of his fellow heroes. Getting back on track, this new child hero popped up around three months ago during a terrorist bombing. Over 50 lives were saved that day by the child hero who revealed the power to manipulate and control the elements of water and wind. Amateur video of the incident showed a large tidal wave of water appearing out of thin air creating a protective sphere around survivors. This wall of swirling water knocked away falling debris and doused flames in an instant. What was more impressive was when the wall of water exploded outward in a massive tidal wave putting out the majority of the flames followed by strong gusts of wind put out the rest. There was no video footage on the hero, but many survivors caught sight of a child in a black and silver outfit with golden blonde hair. A couple weeks later more sightings of the child hero started to pop up. Soon enough Tokyo had its own hero protecting it. A small chuckle comes from the gorgeous woman as she recalls some of the ridiculous names that are floating around the internet. Some people have too much free time on their hands. She reaches into her jacket pulling out a photo of the young hero. He looks to be from 11 to 14 though it is hard to tell with the black face mask covering his face from the nose down. Definitely a blonde and wears a grey vest over a long sleeve black shirt. The image is blurry making any other distinguishing physical characteristics near impossible to make out even with the advanced technology at the fingertips of the league. If she had to harbor a guess she would say that he is between 5 and 5 foot 5 inches at the tallest. Putting the picture away, she finishes her meal and leaves the small restaurant. The past three days she has been trying to spot any signs of the young hero but was not having any luck. She was sent on this mission by Batman due to her ability to speak Japanese. Plus, she knew on some level he was counting on her physical appearance to be appealing to the child. It was extremely east, but if the kid truly is a teenager then chances are like most boys his age he will give her a chance to talk mostly to enjoy her presence. Boys and men of all ages tend to make time to listen to a pretty woman. Unfortunately, there hasn't been much criminal activity and the small crimes that were committed didn't draw out her prey. If she couldn't make contact within the next 24 hours she was going to head back home. No offense, but she was missing the action of doing real work to help others. She didn't get in the hero business to hunt down children. Tokyo, 2 p.m. Naruto sat on the edge of a 30-story building with a steaming bowl of noodles in hand. Ocean blue eyes are staring out over the city drinking in the sights that few ever have the pleasure of enjoying. Being able to use chakra to run up sides of buildings helps to give him such perfect views. Slurping down some more noodles, he thinks on the past few months like usual. To think that a half year ago he was in a completely different dimension and constantly on the run. He never would have had time to enjoy a nice bowl of noodles in the elemental nations. When one is a missing ninja, one has to keep on the move or risk being killed or worse, captured. Konoha labeled him as a missing ninja after he ran away at the age of six. Normally, a child wouldn't be declared a missing ninja since he wasn't technically a ninja. In his case he carried the most powerful of the tailed demons inside of him and Konoha couldn't risk him falling into the hands of another village. 
As much as the citizens of his beloved village hated him, having the power of the nine-tailed demon was a military deterrent to other hidden villages. Plus, he snuck into the Hokage's private chambers and stole the forbidden scroll of seals. Pretty impressive for a six-year-old with a year of training at the academy. Though at the same time it was extremely sad that a six-year-old can get past Anbu. It wasn't hard for him to survive on his own, after spending six years of having to fend on his own in a village where everyone wanted to kill him, he developed incredible survival instincts. He had the ability to sense negative emotions and used that to stay away from those that wished him harm. Extremely handy in avoiding Hunter Ninja. The main problem he had was learning to use Jutsu due to his limited understanding of Chakra. By limited he meant non-existent. All he knew about Chakra was to make a leaf stick to his forehead and the three basic Jutsu taught at the academy. He sucked at the clone Jutsu and barely could perform the replacement Jutsu. However, he was a master at the transformation Jutsu which he used frequently to get out of trouble. It may be an academy level Jutsu but it was one of his favorites. Once he turned 10, he gained a new ability that made understanding Chakra and learning new Jutsu much easier. A rare bloodline ability. With it, he managed to learn a great deal of jutsu and gain strength he needed to survive against new powerful enemies. By the time he turned 14, he was pretty strong able to fight on even grounds with chunin level ninja. Junin level ninja and higher required him to tap into the demon's chakra which was never a good thing as Kurama's chakra had the tendency to be felt for miles. It usually revealed his location in a heartbeat and made it hard for him to escape. He grew tired of fighting against Konoha Hunter Ninja. He even fought against several members of an organization called Akatsuki that wanted to steal Kurama's power for their own desires. There was never a moment of rest, until Kurama suggested tampering with a time space seal created in the scroll. Kurama had the crazy idea that if he poured enough chakra into the seal, the demon could rip open a hole to a new dimension. Apparently the ability to travel to separate dimension was a power that the Sage of Six Path possessed. The idea of living in a new world where you would be able to move around freely without looking over his shoulder every second was too good an opportunity to pass up. Kurama did demand one thing in return should it work. The demon wanted to be set free. Naruto had no problem with that at all. The two worked on the seal for two weeks while constantly avoiding Akatsuki and Leaf Hunter Ninja. Six months later, Naruto is in a city called Tokyo enjoying a bowl of ramen without any worries in the world. This is a strange new world. None of the people have any chakra at all. In this world life exists without chakra. He is the only person in the world with chakra, well at least in Tokyo that has chakra and can use it. Surprisingly enough, that doesn't make him a god or a god-like figure. People may not possess chakra, but there are those with powers that dwarf his own. There is a whole league of people that have individuals with incredible powers that could go head to head with him. One name that is worldwide and is considered the strongest in the world is Superman. A man with the power to fly, shoot heat beams from his eyes, move at speeds that are faster than a speeding bullet, strength of a god, and a body that is stronger than steel. Naruto knows from experience that even the strongest of individuals can be beat, but he highly doubts anything short of a cage level ninja could hope to take on Superman. Then again, ninja don't fight head on instead using deception and various tricks to take down an opponent. Judging from the several videos he watched of Superman fighting, the superhero is a bit straightforward in his fighting style. That alone might be enough for an elite ninja to capitalize on. Naruto would love the chance to fight against Superman to test his own strength against the strongest in the world. Though his chakra reserves are much smaller now without Kurama, he is working on getting back to full strength. Speaking of superheroes, he is becoming something of a hero lately. Three months ago he helped put out a large fire, he wasn't going to help at first. One thing one learns as a missing ninja is to keep hidden at all times so as not to leave a trail for hunter ninja to follow. However, he spotted a crying little girl that was wailing for her parents. Usually, he would have ignored such a scene, but he is in a new world far away from the elemental nations. There would be no point in Konoha or Akatsuki to come to this world since Kurama is the sole reason that he was being hunted and the demon is not with him any longer. So against all his instincts, he saved the girl and in the process saved dozens of other people. Naruto quickly fled the scene not wanting to risk his luck. Later on, while eating some dumplings, 
He watched the news and was surprised that he was being hailed a hero. People that he saved or family and friends of those he saved were thanking him. He was being thanked by others. No one had ever thanked him for anything. Heck, no one ever wanted him around. These people that he didn't even know were happy he was around. Some even went on to say that they hoped he stayed to continue to protect Tokyo. It felt really nice. For the first time he didn't feel like an outcast. Ironic, it took him coming to a new world where he literally is an outcast in order to find acceptance. So over the next three months he helped take down a few criminals just to test the waters. The people in Tokyo loved him. They wanted to know more about him. Journalists were desperately trying to find information on him. Naruto had to admit that he loved being shown so much respect. It is the reason he decided to stay in Tokyo instead of traveling the world. Why leave a place where he is wanted? I could go without the nicknames though, thinks Naruto. Man, some of those hero names that people are trying to give to him are horrible. Kid Hero, Waterboy, and Masked Blonde are just a few that make him want to come forth and reveal his true name. Though if he did that his superhero name might turn out to be Fishcake. Naruto is an awesome name but people tend to think it is Fishcake instead of Maelstrom. Oh well, maybe a name that he likes will pop up. Stranger things have happened. Placing the bowl in the pouch on the back of his waist, he stands up. He forms a hand seal and disappears in a swirl of leaves. Tokyo, 7 p.m. Hey pretty lady, why don't you come with us? Yeah, we can have some fun. Dinah smiles at the Yakuza thugs. Thanks, but I have other plans. She goes to walk past the gangster, but the five gangsters surround her preventing her from leaving. Her eyes bored into the one blocking her path. He is a couple inches shorter than her with slanted black shades and a wise smirk. I think you better take our offer, smirks the leader. I wouldn't want to hurt that pretty face. Laughter comes from the other members. All of them are leering at her with perverted gleams or licking their lips. No doubt the ideas running through their heads are degrading to all women. I was thinking the same thing, replies Dinah. A frown forms on the man's face. He gives a small nudge with his head. The tallest member of the group steps forward reaching out to grab her. In a quick movement, she grabs the offending hand and breaks the wrist with a vicious twist. A scream of pain erupts from the man. The others back away in fear as their fellow gang member falls to his knees clutching his broken wrist in pain. Kill her. The fight doesn't last more than a minute. Dinah easily takes down all five thugs. Calculated punches and kicks soon leave all five Yakuza members lying on the ground unconscious. A sigh escapes the woman as she leaves the alley and continues to walk down the sidewalk. That wasn't any fun at all. She had hoped to relieve her boredom a bit, but idiots like that tend to be all talk no substance. The world would be so much better without such people. Dinah sees a shadow move out of the corner of her eye. Curiously, she keeps on walking keeping an eye on the shadows. She spots another alley up ahead. Turning into it, her eyes try to track any strange movement. Her instincts are telling that someone is following her. Whoever you are, I suggest you come out, says Dinah. The woman stands confidently. A sudden idea fills her head. You wouldn't happen to be the child hero that everyone is talking about. If you are, I have come to meet with you. I am the Black Canary, a member of the Justice League. In the shadows, Naruto stares upon the woman. She is definitely one of the most beautiful women that he ever laid eyes upon. The woman has curves in all the right places with the black leather pants and top accentuating those curves. It gives him a great view of her impressive cleavage as well. He watched her fight against those Yakuza. Her movements were precise, elegant. This is a woman that was trained deeply in Taijutsu. He was traveling in these parts of the city due to a recent rise in gang activity in these parts. Watching the news helped him find the spots where criminal activity was more common. He never expected to see a woman trained like him. Unfortunately, his interest in her caused him to accidentally reveal his presence. Now here they were in alley with her trying to speak to him. She is using a language that is foreign to him. His eyes widen when he understands a couple words. Black canary, thinks Naruto. Ocean blue eyes narrow upon the woman. Yes, he recognizes her. What is she doing here? Canary almost slaps her forehead realizing the reason she was sent here. Sorry, I forgot that you might not understand English. She starts to speak in Naruto's native tongue. I have come here as a representative of the Justice League. 
We have heard about your talents and wish to offer you a chance to join the league. Naruto gains a suspicious gaze. Why would a league of heroes want him to join? They don't know anything about him. Something is not right. Perhaps he needs to make this woman disappear in order to show the league that he is not going to be controlled by anyone. Well, you won't be joining the league as an official member. The truth is that a team of young heroes is being created to help train future young heroes like you into one day being full-fledged members of the Justice League, explains Canary. I promise I am only here to talk. The former missing ninja can sense no negative emotions which means that she is speaking the truth. Lying is a negative emotion due to its deceptive nature. It is impossible to lie to him or speak in half-truths. He can sense such negative emotions without fail. That means that this is Black Canary of the Justice League and she truly desires to recruit him to join a team of young heroes. He does like being a hero. The respect and gratitude he gets is like a dream come true. It was one of his dreams growing up to be a great hero like the fourth Hokage. A dream he was forced to give up once he realized that there was a demon sealed inside of him and that the people would never be able to see past that. Now he was being given the chance to join the greatest heroes in the world. Canary waits patiently for a reply. She is starting to think that maybe she was talking to thin air. Sighing, she turns around to leave. Her eyes widen in surprise to see a kid blocking her path. He stands at average height with a slim build. The boy wears a white hoodie with the hoodie back to reveal spiky golden blonde hair being held up by a black high 8. On the metal plate of his high 8 is a 9 with a scratch through it. The rest of the outfit consisted of a white long sleeved hoodie baggy black pants, and blue Nike sneakers. Though she is unable to see his face, judging from the amazing ocean blue eyes and golden blonde hair, she knows that under that mask is a face that can break any woman's heart. So, are you interested? Smiles Canary. I work better on my own, replies Naruto. Sorry, but the Justice League is a team. No matter how strong an individual is, there are some problems that can't be solved by alone. Naruto can't argue with that. There are many fights that he would have ended up dead if not for Kurama's help. He reaches up scratching the back of his head. Canary finds his scratching to be endearing. Okay, I will give it a try. But if I don't like it I am leaving, says Naruto. You are free to leave whenever you desire. She walks over to him. Her eyes notice the way his body tenses preparing to take her down should she prove to be a threat. Giving a reassuring smile, she stops in front of him. Do you have a name? Uzumaki Naruto. Fishcake. Smirks Canary. Naruto gives her a deadpan expression. Maelstrom. Canary laughs in amusement before walking out the alley. He pulls up his hoodie and follows the woman. Break Batman is doing one last check on the computer. Four ice villains attacking on the same day was too much of a coincidence for him to overlook. There is something going on in secret, but he has been unable to discover that secret. It is something that he will have to work on at a later time, at the moment he needs to prepare a new team. A team of young heroes that will operate in the shadows. He has high hopes for this team of young heroes. The Justice League needs a team that can operate outside the law. Criminals are proving to be more elusive and organized than in the past. This team will be able to take down those criminal organizations while the Justice League can maintain its public image. He had been hoping to create a similar team with more experienced heroes, but this is even better than his original plans. These young heroes can be trained from scratch making them much more cohesive in the long run. An incoming message interrupts Batman's thoughts. Canary's image appears on the screen. I found the boy. He agreed to join the team, but there might be an issue. What is it? He speaks Japanese. It is going to make communication between him and the other members very difficult, says Canary. We knew that could be an obstacle from the beginning. Batman stares at Canary. Any information at all on him? Canary frowns, there is no existing record on him at all. I am at the mountain and ran his name through every database in the world that we have access to. The information appears on a screen opposite her image. Batman's eyes narrow upon the name. Uzumaki Naruto, now that is an interesting name. He is not familiar with the last name Uzumaki. Several years he spent in Japan training under various martial arts masters so he knows the culture very well. He even agreed to give me a blood sample and nothing. Naruto says that he is an orphan that grew up on the streets and I believe him. I can tell that he is not giving me the full story, but we all have our secrets. 
Batman runs the blood sample through several illegal databases. How is he adjusting to the new surroundings? In the same manner that you would, smirks Canary. I swear it feels like he is a spitting image of you. Batman doesn't find humor in that statement. In fact, that comment worries him a great deal. Still, it is better to have this unknown child working under the command of the Justice League than out there on his own. A child with the power to manipulate the elements as a weapon that many like Luther or Raj will desire as a pawn. Men like that are even able to sway experienced warriors like Batman to their side. I am on my way. The screens vanish. Batman stays a second before heading toward the Zeta tubes. There is much on the Dark Knight's mind. Mount Justice in a flash of light, Naruto and Canary appear inside the mountain. I need to contact a friend, I will be back shortly. Feel free to explore the cave. She walks towards the main computer terminal. Naruto spins around to see the point where he came into the cave. It doesn't make any sense. A second ago he was in a phone booth and the next second he is inside this carved out mountain. Never did he encounter such technology or a jutsu like that. No, there was that one individual in Akatsuki that had the power to become intangible and teleport to any location. But to be able to teleport to any location at will is a power that any ninja would kill to have. He never thought that it could be replicated through technology. Then again, the technology in the elemental nations pales in comparison to the technology in this world. He learned that within a few days of arriving in Tokyo, the Justice League's technology is even more advanced than anything he used in Tokyo, but that is not saying much as he lived on rooftops and kept out of touch with society. Only technology he used since arriving was a vending machine. Though he shouldn't be surprised too much that the Justice League has such technology at its fingertips. It explains how certain members like Canary without the ability to fly or run at super speeds is able to get around the world so fast. Naruto begins to examine the carved out mountain. Much better than the places he used to stay at. A wave of negative emotions hits his senses making him turn to face that direction. There is an older boy walking towards him. Superman, ocean blue eyes narrow upon the boy that is almost an identical copy to Superman. No, that is not Superman. Superman is a grown man not a teenager. This must be the son of Superman. Superboy stares at the unknown boy that is eyeing him critically. There is no information at all on the short blonde. Cadmus made sure to telepathically download information on every single hero in the world even the ones not in the Justice League. He has information on sidekicks as well. Who is this new kid? Recognized Aqualad, B02, recognized Robin, B01, recognized Kid Flash, B03. In a large flash of light, three sidekicks appear. Oh yeah, time to go on some real missions. I am so psyched, smirks Kid. This place reminds me of the Batcave, smirks Robin. Aqualads notices an unknown individual across from Superboy. It is good to see you again, Superboy. Superboy gives a small nod. The protege of Aquaman turns to face the newcomer. I am Aqualad, it is nice to meet you. He offers his hand. Naruto stares at the hand making new move to shake it. Kid raises an eyebrow. Talk about friendly, who is this kid? Aqualad and Kid look at Robin. I got nothing, frowns Robin. Batman steps forward drawing the attention of all the sidekicks. A small screen opens up behind Batman that begins to translate his words into Japanese text. Welcome to the original headquarters of the Justice League. Since you are so determined to fight the good fight, you will do it under League terms. Red Tornado has volunteered to supervise the team, Canary will be the team trainer, and I will deploy you on missions. Real missions? Robin notices that his words was translated as well. Why is there a screen translating all the words into kanji? Covert missions, states Batman. The Justice League will still handle the big images. Flash smirks, there is a reason we have the symbols on our chest. But the bad guys are proving to be more resourceful, finishes Aquaman. The six of you will be a team. Batman gestures at Naruto. His name is Uzumaki Naruto and he will joining the team as the six member. He speaks Japanese, but will be taking English lessons from Canary and Red Tornado. Robin glances around. Wait, who is the fifth member? Batman looks behind the team. The team turns around to see Martian Manhunter and a pretty girl wearing a similar outfit standing next to the Justice League member. She is very pretty with long red hair falling down past her shoulders, green skin, 
and developing curves. The girl wears a white top, blue cape, blue skirt, and matching blue boots. Hi, greets the girl. It is an honor to be on the team. Wally nudges Robin. I am liking this gig more and more. Giving a charming smile, he starts to talk to the girl. Hey, I am Kid Flash. That is Robin, Aqualad, and Superboy but feel free to forget their names. Robin and Aqualad follow Kid Flash over to the new girl. Hey Superboy, Naruto, come meet Miss M, waves Robin. Superboy walks over to the group. Naruto turns away instead facing Batman. There is something about the Dark Knight that commands respect and power, it is like being in the presence of a Hokage. Batman may not have any superpowers like other members on the Justice League, but Naruto can see that Batman is a true warrior. A true warrior doesn't need superpowers to be great. No, all that is needed for a true warrior is training and discipline. Batman has that in spades. I will be staying in Tokyo when not on missions or training, says Naruto. Batman shows no emotion. The mountain has plenty of rooms. I am more comfortable living on my own. Very well, Batman reaches onto his utility belt drawing a watch. He tosses it at Naruto. Naruto places the watch around his wrist with a small click. That watch will issue an alert when there is a training or mission. However, due to the need for you to learn English you will have separate training from the rest of the team. Understood. Naruto turns around walking over to the Zeta tubes. The computer activates as a bright light fills the cavern. Recognize Uzumaki Naruto, B06. The ninja vanishes from the cavern. Aqualad frowns. This is supposed to be a team yet one of their teammates doesn't seem interested in getting to know them at all. He never heard of an Uzumaki Naruto. That doesn't mean much as his interaction with other sidekicks was limited to Robin, Kid Flash, and Speedy. He knows that the world is filled with heroes of all ages, but he never met a sidekick that acted like Batman and that is saying something considering that Robin is Batman's sidekick. For the first time, he is starting to worry that this team might not work. Naruto sits at the computer with a bored expression. It has been a week since he was invited to join the team. In that time there has been no missions or training. The no missions he understands since the team is new and has no experience out in the field, but the no training part is strange. He understands that the Justice League is busy fighting criminals all over the world. However, this team will never work without proper training. He knows this from experience. It was a short time after learning a couple jutsu from the Forbidden Scroll of Seals that he thought knowing a couple jutsu made him invincible. If not for Kurama he would have died against a couple hunter ninja. That was when he learned that in order to become strong he had to train and not just focus on learning a few jutsu. He may have never been on a team but he figures that it works in the same manner. One needs to train together in order to work as a team. But maybe he is wrong. The Justice League is a team organization so they know better than him. The past few days he has been spending his time learning English from Red Tornado. Red Tornado is an emotionless android that doesn't play around or joke. A vast difference from Kurama who constantly made degrading comments and insulted others. It was an interesting experience learning from an emotionless android. Tornado never strayed from the topic at hand. All the teaching was focused on learning English with no distractions. Naruto was not sure how he felt on Tornado as a sensei. On one hand he was learning a great deal and could understand a small amount of English even speak a few words. But on the other hand he couldn't get a single read on the android. Of course, Tornado was not the main reason that Naruto was learning at an accelerated rate. Naruto was using a special ability that he activated when he was nine. A special pair of eyes that allow him to memorize and copy anything that he witnesses. Kurama hated his eyes due to the fact that an evil man in the past used the eyes to control the demon fox. It was that reason he made a promise to never use the Sharingan on Kurama. It was during a fight in the land of Earth that he activated the Sharingan for the first time. He ran into another missing ninja that was looking to steal the Forbidden Scroll of Seals from him. The missing ninja was a Chunin level ninja. Naruto was 9 years old and didn't even know the basics of chakra control with two academy jutsu under his belt. The fight, if one could call it that, was a beating that involved Naruto being bounced around on the ground like a rubber ball. Kurama channeled chakra to Naruto's eyes in order to help him with tracking the earth ninja's movements. Technically, it worked as Naruto was able to follow the earth ninja's movements to deliver a fatal blow. 
It wasn't until a couple days later when Kurama finished healing his wounds that Naruto practiced channeling chakra to his eyes when he discovered that when he channeled chakra to them his ocean blue eyes bled red with a single black tomo in each. That was when Kurama explained to him that he inherited a powerful dujutsu known as the Sharingan. Once he developed the Sharingan, he was able to see the way the chakra was channeled by watching other ninja. He watched ninja channel chakra to their feet to walk on walls and water. As his Sharingan grew more advanced he was able to see through Genjutsu, copy ninjutsu and taijutsu of his enemies, and gain better control over Kurama's chakra. Kurama hated the Sharingan, but even the demon fox had to admit that the dujutsu came in handy when Akatsuki started to hunt him. The Sharingan was a dujutsu that was inherited by those with the Uchiha blood. Kurama theorized that Naruto must have had distant Uchiha relatives in his ancestry. It might have been the reason that the fourth Hokage chose to seal Kurama inside Naruto in hopes that the Uchiha blood would help in controlling the demon's power. This was just a theory but it did make sense. Naruto didn't care much about being related to the Uchiha clan because those bastards were as mean to him as the rest of the villagers. All he cared about was learning to become strong so that anyone that tried to hurt him would end up face first in the dirt. He was using the Sharingan now to copy and memorize the English language. Using the Sharingan he memorized every single kanji and romaji translation to English. Unfortunately, Tornado is an android therefore doesn't have any lip movements. If he was training with Canary he could use the Sharingan to copy her lip movements in order to learn new words. But he didn't want to reveal his Sharingan to the Justice League or the team until he knew that he could trust them without a doubt. A true ninja never reveals his trump card until necessary. Naruto knows that he needs to learn English to communicate with his teammates but this training is so boring. He much rather spend his time fighting crime in Tokyo or training to learn some new jutsu. Turning the computer off, he heads to the Zeta tube. Time to head back home. July 15, 10. 00 AM. Do you plan on giving them a mission anytime soon? Canary leans against the console. Batman doesn't even spare her a glance as he continues to type at the computer. The team will receive a mission as soon as I have one for them. A frown forms on Canary's face. She was never on board with the team to begin with. The idea of using kids as spies rubbed her the wrong way. She ended up going along with it because she knew that it was better to have the young heroes working under Justice League supervision than running off on their own. But if Batman doesn't give them a mission soon that team will be running off on their own like they did at Cadmus. Batman glances at Canary. I am searching for a mission to give them, but one that will not get them killed. He goes back to typing. All of them have been trained individually but a team operates in a different manner. If they can't learn to be patient then we might as well let them operate on their own as it will yield the same results as giving them missions they are not prepared to handle. A sigh comes from the heroine. As usual, he is right. We need to do something to make them feel as if we are taking the team seriously. None of them are ready to be fighting crime on their own, says Canary. Perhaps a little team training wouldn't hurt. Not all of them are waiting away for a mission. Batman pulls up a video of Naruto exploring the cave and using the training facility. The first thing that he asked about after his first language lesson with Tornado was how to use the training simulator. He has continuously used it over the past week when not in Tokyo. Canary is impressed. It looks like there is at least one member on the team that is taking this team seriously. None of the other young heroes have been taking advantage of the facility at the mountain or Batman would have brought it up. As for his lessons, in a month or two he will be able to speak fluently in English. Her eyes widen. That fast? Yes, his learning rate is very high, says Batman with a voice full of suspicion. He is a kid. Canary gives the Dark Knight a look. I can tell from his eyes that Naruto has not had an easy life. You were worried that him being on his own could make him at risk to people like Luther, but spying on him might make him turn away from using his powers for good. The best thing to do is earn his trust and let him come to us. Batman glances at Canary. She doesn't back down. The subject is changed when an alert comes in from Captain Adam. Batman and Canary drop the argument to face a bigger issue. July 18, 9 am humming a tune, Miss Martian walks around the base. She was hoping to run into Superboy to start up a conversation. He showed up to eat the breakfast that she cooked, but took the plate and left the dining area before she could invite him to eat with her. It has been almost two weeks since she started to live at the mountain. 
In that time she has interacted with Superboy for barely a few minutes at a time during meals. She really wanted to get to know him better, but he didn't seem to have any interest in her at all. Today was the day that she was going to change that. Or at least she hoped. Now that she truly thinks on the matter, she has not spoken to any of her teammates since the team was officially formed. The six of them were supposed to be a team yet none of them interacted at all with each other. She had hoped that when she came to Earth that she would make friends. When her uncle offered her the chance to join this new team with others her age, she jumped at the opportunity. A chance to finally fit in. The problem is that none of her friends are around. All she has been doing the past two weeks is cooking new recipes and trying to get Superboy to give her more than a minute each day. She is starting to think that maybe she won't make friends here on Earth. Such thoughts lead her to the memories of her lonely days on Mars. Megan enters the training room in hopes of finding Superboy. She doesn't find Superboy, but she does run into another teammate. In the middle of the training room doing one-handed handstand push-ups is the sixth member of the team, Uzumaki Naruto. The only member of the team that didn't introduce himself to her. Her ruby red eyes examine the younger boy. He is 14 years old, but has a body that grown men would kill to have. There is not a single ounce of fat on his body. Naruto is not overly bulky, but with each push up his muscles bulge revealing a muscular body gained from years of extreme physical exercise. A blush heated her cheeks as she realized she was staring. It is hard not to stare when he isn't wearing a shirt. Naruto pushed straight up launching 10 feet into the air from a single arm thrust. Twisting around, he lands lightly on his toes. He turns his head to look straight at Miss Martian. Megan splutters realizing that she was caught. Hi, blushes Megan. I am Miss Martian, but you can call me Megan. There is no response from the boy. Hello Megan. She snaps her fingers. I forgot you don't speak English. My name is Megan, don't be alarmed. I am using telepathy to speak to you. There is no shock or surprise from Naruto. He hears the voice in his head and continues to stare at her with an emotionless expression. Megan shifts nervously under such an intense stare. She used her telepathy to talk to him because mental communication can instantly be translated into whatever his native language is so that the two can talk. Now she is starting to regret this whole thing. Uzumaki Naruto, nice to meet you, replies Naruto mentally. A smile lights up her face. I hope I am not interrupting. I was looking for Superboy, I didn't mean to bother you, apologizes Megan. You are not bothering me. I am getting some training in is all. Naruto crouches into a fighting stance. He begins to throw punches and kicks at an invisible opponent. His eyes drift over to Megan. Did you wish to train? I can come back at a later time. Megan throws up her hands shaking her head. No thanks, I am not good at physical activities. Isn't that the point of training? To increase your skill in a certain area? I comma I didn't think of it like that, she gains a light blush in embarrassment. Still. I focus more on my telepathy and telekinesis. A shrug comes from the boy. He continues to practice his taijutsu. Megan bites her lip not knowing what else to say. Naruto isn't bothered at all by the silence. He said all that he wanted to say so in his mind the conversation is long since over. Um, what are your powers? Mine are telekinesis and telepathy, but I already told you that plus we are talking mentally, rambles Megan. A pause comes from the ninja. He contemplates whether to tell her the truth about his abilities. Sooner or later the team is going to learn about his abilities. In the ninja world a ninja needs to guard one's secrets in order to have a trump card against enemies. This is not the elemental nations. And like he thought earlier, he will eventually reveal his abilities during a mission. I use ninjutsu and taijutsu, answers Naruto. Ninjutsu? Taijutsu? Naruto brings his hands together and formed three hand seals at speeds that Megan can barely follow. She is amazed at the speed that he formed those strange hand gestures. Transformation no jutsu, thinks Naruto. A cloud of smoke explodes outward. The smoke envelopes Naruto. When it clears Megan's eyes widen upon seeing an identical copy of herself. You shape shifted. No, it is ninjutsu, replies Megan Naruto. Megan tilts her head, is it similar to magic? Sure. Sorry, apologizes Megan. He feels a bit guilty. I am able to use ninjutsu through the use of chakra. Chakra is the combination of physical and spiritual energy. In a cloud of smoke he reverts to his original form. 
I can use it to cast illusions and manipulate the illusions. The transformation I used earlier was an illusion not an actual transformation. Understanding appears in her eyes. I get it, Megan smiles feeling a bit closer to him, I forgot to tell you that I can shapeshift. She begins to transform into a girl version of Naruto. Naruto stares at her not impressed with the transformation. Smiling sheepishly, she turns back to her original form. Boys are harder to mimic. You should train that, it could come in handy on a mission, says Naruto. I never thought about that. I guess I could work on it, nods Megan. Can you do anything else? What is Taijutsu? Taijutsu is hand to hand combat. My skills in that area are more pronounced when fighting against an opponent. I could show you in a spar, explains Naruto. Megan takes a step back, shaking her head. No thanks, I'll take your word for it. Naruto is a bit disappointed, but doesn't show it. So who is your mentor? Mentor? The superhero that trained you. Robin has Batman, Kid Flash has the Flash. No one trained me. Everything I learned, I learned on my own. Oh, Megan doesn't know what else to say to that. She has a feeling that there is more to the story. As much as she would love to learn more, she can tell from his tone that he is not going to say anything about his past. Recognized B02, Aqualad. In a flash of light Aqualad in civilian clothing enters the mountain. Megan smiles glad to have another teammate to talk to. Hey Aqualad, beams Megan. Naruto turns to face the protege of Aquaman. Greetings Megan, Naruto, smiles Aqualad. Naruto gives a small nod. He walks over to where his shirt lays and puts it on. How did it go with Speedy? Will he be joining us? Aqualad shakes his head. I am afraid not. He has decided to go his own path. Megan gives an apologetic look. Recognized B01, Robin. Naruto frowns. It looks like there will be no more training since the entire team has decided to show up. He hasn't seen any of them in about two weeks and the one day he chooses to get some training down all of them start to show up. Yo, waves Robin. You ready to get our first mission? Megan, have you seen Red Tornado? He went out for a bit and said he would be back by 11, answers Superboy. The clone walks towards the group with a nonchalant expression. Why do you want to see him? Why else? We want a mission. Robin gains an upset expression. It has been almost two weeks and we haven't had a single mission. I am tired of waiting around. Time to get some action. Aqualad nods in agreement, we didn't start this team to play around. Recognized B03, Kid Flash. Is he here yet? Kid runs towards the others in civilian clothing. Robin pulls up the monitor. A smirk plays on the boy wonder's face, he is coming in now. Let's get going. Kid runs off on his own. Robin and Aqualad follow. Superboy shrugs before following them. Megan looks at Naruto. I guess we should join them. Naruto stares at her blankly. She smiles encouragingly at him. Flying into the air, she heads after the others. Asai escapes the ninja. Reluctantly, he heads in the same direction as the others. Break Red Tornado makes his descent towards the ground. The android notices the sidekicks all waiting outside. Landing, the android walks towards the group. Why have you all come out here to meet me? We were hoping to get a mission, smirks Wally. Batman handles mission assignments. Yeah, but it has been over a week, Red Tornado interrupts Robin. You will be tested soon enough. Until then you can keep busy by familiarizing yourself with the cave. Robin, Wally, and Aqualad share a look. The words that Speedy spoke to them last night come back to them. Your Junior Justice League is a joke, it is meant to keep you busy and in your place. This is not a social club, frowns Aqualad. True but I hear social interaction is key to team building. Those are the last words that Red Tornado speaks before heading inside the cave. Naruto stares up at the clouds. He understands a little of the language, but not enough to keep up with the conversation. Certain words and phrases registered in his mind. So paying half attention, he chose to stare up at the clouds. It is a beautiful day. Kid Flash scowls, keep us busy. Does he really think we are buying that? Frowns Robin. What do we do now? We tour the clubhouse, says Aqualad just as upset as the others. Well, Superboy and I live here. We can give a tour, offers Megan. Superboy folds his arms across his chest, don't include me. Kid appears next to Megan, will do, 
A private tour sounds much better. No one said anything about private, sighs Robin. Team building, we all go, states Aqualad. Megan looks over at Naruto. We're going to tour the cave. I already know the entire layout, replies Naruto. Red Tornado said that socializing will help team building, says Megan. Very well, Aqualad, Kid, and Robin look between Megan and Naruto. The three then look at Superboy. Superboy gives them a shrug. Okay, this way, smiles Megan. The four glance at each other before shrugging. Naruto lags behind the group not bothering to listen to the guided tour. Break. So why did the league stop using the base? Asks Superboy. Robin answers that question. The Joker found out the location and launched a massive attack on the Justice League. Most of the cave was destroyed. It forced the league to move to a new headquarters. Superboy frowns, so they traded it in for a tourist trap? Megan's eyes widen. Wait, if the bad guys know where we are what is to stop them from attacking us? We must be on constant alert. Laughter comes from Robin. The bad guys don't know that we know about them knowing the location of the cave. Megan looks at Robin in confusion. He means to say that we are hiding in plain sight, explains Kid. Oh, that makes sense. Superboy sniffs the air. Naruto picks up on the scent a second after the clone. I smell smoke. My cookies. Megan flies off in the direction of the smell. Kid shrugs before speeding after her. The others soon follow. She flies straight into the kitchen. Using her telekinetic powers, she opens up the oven door and levitates a tray of burnt cookies onto the counter. I was trying out Granny's recipe from episode 17, she trails off. Naruto's eyes narrow. I wanted to bake something nice for the team. Robin chuckles coming up beside the girl. I am sure they would have turned out great. He doesn't seem to mind. I'll turn to look at Kid who is munching down on the burnt cookies. What? Kid swallows. I have a serious metabolism. I'll make more. It was sweet of you to make any, says Aqualad. Megan blushes lightly. Thanks, Aqualad. We're off duty. Call me Calderon. In fact, my friends call me Calder. My name is Wally. Wally leans forward, giving her a wink. See how I trust you with my real name unlike Dark Shades over there. Batman has forbid him from giving out his name. Robin sends a light glare at Wally that is hidden behind the shades. My name is easy it is Megan Moores, but you can call me Megan. It is an Earth name and I am on Earth now, smiles Megan. Superboy turns preparing to leave the room. A telepathic voice belonging to Megan fills everyone's head. Don't worry Superboy, we will find you an Earth name too. The clone's eyes widen. Get out of my head. What? The others wince not used to having a voice in their head besides their own. Naruto stands with a bored expression. This is how everyone communicates on Mars. Megan stop. Calder gives her a hard look. On Earth that is an extreme invasion of privacy. Megan lowers her eyes. I didn't know. Just stay out of my head. Superboy stomps out of the room with rage in his eyes. Cadmus left him with a bad taste for telepathy, whispers Wally. Megan's eyes fill with guilt. Her eyes glance over at Naruto who remains silent. It doesn't bother me, shrugs Naruto. In order to break the tension Megan comes up with an idea. Hello Megan, I know what we can do. She flies out of the room. The others follow with Superboy sitting on the couch. Superboy senses someone staring at him and turns his head. Naruto stares at Superboy with a blank expression. Move, says Naruto awkwardly. Superboy frowns. The ninja turns leaving the room. Standing up, Superboy follows the ninja. Megan leads the team to the hangar. This is my Martian bioship. A large red and black sphere rests in the middle of the hangar. Robin, Calder, and Wally all share a look at the so-called ship. Cute, not very aerodynamic but cute, says Wally. It is at rest silly. I will wake it up, smiles Megan. Using her telepathy, she commands the ship to wake up. The red sphere transforms into a large alien ship. It spins around so that the back of the ship is facing the team. The skin of the ship morphs providing an entrance, come on. Naruto examines the ship. For a moment when no one is looking, his ocean blue eyes bleed to red with three black tomo. A second later his eyes are back to normal. He can't believe that this large thing is actually alive. It possesses its own unique energy or life force. 
The ship reminds him of Kisami's sword Samahada. Samahada was also a living object not just a mere sword. Naruto, are you coming? Asks Megan mentally. He heads up the ramp making a mental note to examine the ship further in the future. The ship transforms on the inside creating a pit with six total seats. Megan takes a seat in the chair at the head of the ship while the others sit down in the other seats. Robin takes a seat and four black tendrils immediately strap him in. This is pretty cool, smirks Wally. Red Tornado please open the hangar door, says Megan. Incredible, smiles Robin. Wally sighs dreamily, she sure is. He is staring at Megan. She turns to look at him. I mean the ship and like all ships it is a she. Fast with his feet not with his mouth. Dude, Calder leans over to whisper to Superboy, I don't need to be a psychic to know that you are feeling guilty. Superboy glances at Calder. There is a knowing smile on Calder's face. You overreacted. It happens, just say you're sorry. Megan stares at Superboy with worried eyes. Robin notices the exchange. Give it time, he will come around. He doesn't seem to like me much, frowns Megan. You two do realize he has super hearing right? says Wally. Superboy heard every word but continues to stare out the window. I know, how about showing us some of the Martian shape shifting? Naruto pokes at the side of the ship. The entire ship is organic. It is like Megan's clothes that allowed her to shape shift her body and uniform. He has never encountered anything like this. Is this some type of alien technology? How advanced is the technology in this world to be able to create living organisms? Red Tornado to Team there has been an emergency alert triggered at Happy Harbor Power Plant. You are to investigate the situation, coveredly. Sending coordinates now. Copy that, adjusting course, replies Megan. Red Tornado is keeping us busy again, states Robin. Megan glances at Robin. A simple fire led you to Superboy. Who knows what this will lead us to? We should investigate the cause. I think I know, says Superboy. I'll turn to look outside the window. Heading straight towards them is a large tornado. Megan grips the controls tightly. The ship is spun around several times before the tornado continues on towards the power plant. She lands the ship in the parking lot. The team rushes out to see explosions coming from inside the power plant. Robin are tornadoes common in, Calder turns to see his friend gone. Megan gasps in surprise. Where did he go? She looks around trying to find where the boy wonder went. All that is heard is a childlike laughter. Calder groans in annoyance. Why does Robin always run off on his own? No way am I getting left behind. Wally puts on his goggle before taking off at high level speeds. Naruto was slightly impressed with Robin and Kid Flash. Robin moved like a ninja able to vanish even in broad daylight. Kid possessed high chunin level speed almost on par with a junin. That is impressive since Naruto's own speed was at chunin level, currently. Superboy uses his super strength to leap high into the air ready for a fight as well. Let's go. They might need us, Calder draws his water bearers. Megan flies into the air following her friend. Inside the power plant, a blast of wind sends Robin flying backwards. I got this. Wally runs at high speeds at the individual covered in red and black armor. The villain creates a gust of wind on the ground spinning Wally out of control before tossing him through the far wall. The speedster lies on the ground nursing a major headache. Superboy runs through the front doors. Who is your friend? I don't know, but he plays rough, grits Robin. Standing up, the boy wonder reaches into his jacket pulling out a couple bird a rangs. A robotic voice comes from the villain. Forgive me, you may call me Mr. Twister. Mr. Twister stands over six feet tall with shining bright red and black armor with several blue tubes connected on various parts. I was hoping to fight a real hero not some kids. This is very disturbing, says the villain. Robin scowls, I am sorry to disturb you. I will try to make you more turbed. He tosses the bird a rangs at Mr. Twister. Mr. Twister creates a gust of wind knocking away the bird a rangs with incredible ease. Superboy leaps into the air aiming a fist at the villain. Forming a small twister, Mr. Twister spins Superboy around before tossing him straight at Robin. The two young heroes crash into each other rolling across the ground. Superboy. Robin. Gasps Megan. She drops down landing next to the two. Calder runs into the power plant with his water bearers taking the form of dual swords. This is not a villain that I recognize. 
Run along children, I have more important matters to deal with, states Mr. Twister. We are not children, glares Robin, respectively, you are. A yell of rage comes from Superboy, he charges at Mr. Twister. Superboy never even gets close as a small twister sucks him up, spins him around, and tosses him away. Robin tosses down several smoke grenades. A thick black smoke blinds Mr. Twister. Such an attack might have been useful against other villains, but against Mr. Twister it is hardly even a distraction. Mr. Twister blows away the smoke and raises its arm to block a kick from Robin. Robin is struck by a high blast of wind sending him flying into the charging calder. Megan comes flying at Mr. Twister from above, but soon she is sucked into a twister and slammed into the ground. I grow tired of babysitting. Mr. Twister creates a large twister that blasts the young heroes in every direction. I hope now you all know your place, says Mr. Twister. Several shurikens strike Mr. Twister in the back. The supervillain spins around to see a sixth attacker. Naruto has the hoodie up to hide his hair and a black face mask covers the lower portion of his face. So there is another child. You should have stayed hidden, says Mr. Twister. A powerful torrent of spiraling wind heads at Naruto. Naruto moves at high speeds dodging the tornado. He runs around Mr. Twister tossing three kanai. The kanai are easily batted away with a light gust. Your pitiful weapons will not help you. Now be gone. Mr. Twister creates a powerful tornado that starts to rip the entire building to shreds. Superboy grabs Robin and makes a run towards the exit. Megan and Aqualad are right behind Superboy. The building starts to collapse almost burying the team alive. Outside, Wally stands up rubbing his head. A loud crashing sound makes him look ahead. His eyes widen in horror. Oh no, guys. He rushes towards the collapsed building as fast as he can. Mr. Twister floats outside the rubble. I am now turbed, thanks for that. What did you do to my team? yells Wally. Mr. Twister turns to face the speedster. I would think that was obvious. Generating a small tornado, he launches it at Wally. Wally is sucked in and sent flying into the debris. Before the speedster hits it, an invisible force catches him. I got you, Wally, says Megan. I would have thought that you all would have learned your. The ground behind Mr. Twister bursts open. Out of the ground emerges Naruto flashing through hand seals that even Wally can barely keep up with. He finishes the sequence of hand seals and takes a deep breath while lifting his right hand to his mouth. Naruto forms a ring with his right index finger and thumb then exhales. Kaden. Gokaku no Jutsu. A large fireball twice his size is spit from his mouth that heads straight at Mr. Twister. Mr. Twister has no time to dodge from the point blank attack. The fireball consumes Mr. Twister before a large explosion fills the area. Naruto lands on the ground knowing that the battle is over. He poured enough chakra into that jutsu to take out a building. Even if Mr. Twister created a barrier of wind, it would have strengthened the power of the fire jutsu. Wind feeds fire making it more powerful. No, way, gasps Wally. Did he just exhale a giant fireball? mutters Robin. Calder stares in awe as the smoke still fills the area. I have never seen such magic. Amazing, whispers Megan. Superboy remains silent staring into the smoke. The smoke soon clears to reveal a completely destroyed android. Naruto stands among the rubble with an emotionless expression. Mr. Twister's body is scattered all around in thousands of pieces. He glances at the team. All of them are staring in him with disbelief or suspicion. It doesn't matter to him. The mission was accomplished. Threat to Happy Harbor Power Plant was neutralized. Mission complete. Out of the Zeta tube emerges Aqualad. He is dressed in his regular hero gear. Aqualad looks to see Robin, Miss Martian, Superboy, and Naruto already waiting for him. Recognized B03, Kid Flash. Kid Flash comes out behind Aqualad. I am so ready for this mission, smirks Kid. The young speedster falls silent upon seeing Batman not amused with his tardiness. Quickly, Kid joins the others ready to hear the mission with barely contained excitement. Batman begins to speak now that the entire team is assembled. Santa Prisca is the worldwide producer of the illegal steroid Venom. Multiple holographic screens appear behind Batman. Naruto keeps his emotions in check as he stares at the images. The former missing ninja has never seen such advanced technology. 
several images of her the island Santa Prisca from different angles. Lately, all shipping has stopped despite the fact that satellite imaging shows that the factory is still producing the illegal drug. Your assignment will be to infiltrate the island, figure out what is going on and report back to the league. Who is the leader? asks Robin. Batman and Red Tornado share a glance. That will be left up to you all to decide, states the Dark Knight. Robin gains a confident smirk. Red Tornado steps forward placing three cases on the ground. In each case is stealth gear. It is not required to wear, but stealth is a major part of your mission. Being able to blend into the environment is key to a covert operation. Cool, grins Kid Flash. Naruto begins to poke at the holographic screens. The technology of this world is amazing. He wonders what else the technology in this world can do. Man, it is almost like looking at some rare and crazy jutsu. Come on Naruto, smiles Megan. Okay. Bioship Miss Martian sits in the pilot seat with her hands in the two glowing white lights. We are three miles away from Santa Prisca. Aqualad stands up pressing the center of his shirt. His outfit turns completely courtesy of the new stealth tech built into his suit, almost at the first drop point. I am ready. Soon enough the ship hovers over the ocean a half mile out from the island. A hole opens up in the bottom of the ship. Aqualad dives through the hole straight into the ocean. He swims through the water at inhuman speeds. Swimming by a dozen mines, he comes upon a large net. He uses his water bearers to create a sword to slice through the net. In no time at all he shoots out of the water landing on the beach. Running over to the heat and motion sensors, he attaches a device to them. It turns from red to green signaling that it is on. This is Aqualad. Heat and motion sensors are on an endless loop. I am on my way to the rendezvous point, speaks Aqualad. Naruto emerges from the back. Robin glances backwards. The boy wonder raises an eyebrow at Naruto's choice in uniform and armor. The blonde is wearing a green flak vest over a short sleeve skin tied black shirt, fingerless iron clad navy blue gloves, baggy blue shorts, and open toe blue ninja sandals. Decided to not go with the stealth tech? Naruto takes a seat as if never hearing the comment. Dude, he doesn't speak our language, says Kid. Robin gains an annoyed look, how the heck is he supposed to lead this team when one of the members can't even communicate with the rest of the team? No worries, I can communicate with him through telepathy. I can use my telepathy to target the speech center of the brain so he understands everything I am saying, smiles Megan. Robin gives a nod. Okay, I'll leave it to you to convey to him our objective. Got it. Naruto has to admit that it feels good to be going out on a mission. He never knew how much he missed it until this moment. Of course the missions he used to go on were solo missions that usually involved bodyguard or assassination detail. Missing ninja were cheaper to hire than ninja from hidden villages. So criminals like drug lords and syndicates hire out missing ninja. Still, it feels good to be geared up and back in action. The stealth tech gear that Batman supplied is great. The armor and clothes are top notch, but he prefers to wear his own clothes. It feels much more comfortable though he wouldn't mind adding more kanai and shuriken to his weapon pouches. He is running a bit low. When he gets back to Tokyo he will stop off at a store to buy some more. How much does the mission pay? asks Naruto. Batman frowns, there is no payment. Naruto is not happy with that response. Heroes help others to do the right thing not for money. But we are not helping defenseless civilians. This is a mission to infiltrate and gather information for the League. The Dark Knight can't argue with that logic. Be that as it may, there is no payment, states Batman. Naruto continues to speak. I agreed to join this team to help, but if I am spending so much time here and not getting paid for missions then I will have to leave. The cave is stocked with food, my home is in Tokyo not the cave. I don't need the League's charity. Pay me for my services or I will leave after this mission. Batman gains a hard look, we will talk after the mission. A ninja taking on missions for free, he might as well put a slave collar on. Ocean blue eyes drift over to Robin and Kid Flash. Those two don't know the meaning of survival of the fittest. Sure the two have been in many life and death situations, but those were situations that the two willingly entered into. It is completely different from having to fight each day for food and water. Superboy is a ward of the Justice League being the clone of Superman. And Miss Martian is the niece of Martian Manhunter. All of them have others to help them so that money is not an issue. 
Naruto on the other hand relies on his skills to make a living. Only one person in the world helps him and that is Naruto. He doesn't need or want charity from the Justice League. All he wants is to receive payment for his services that is all. He is no different from everyone else in the world that is working a job. The League has enough money to build a cave in a mountain with technology far beyond anything else on the planet. Surely paying him for a mission would not cause a dent in their checkbook. If the League won't agree to pay him then he will leave the team. It is that simple. As much as he enjoys playing the hero, he could do that in Tokyo without the League. We are at the second drop point. She brings the ship to a complete stop over the forest. Kid Flash stands up with a wise smirk. Time to use the new stealth gear. He presses the lightning bolt on his shirt making his own suit turn black. Check me out, smirks kid. Impressive, smiles Megan. Her own clothes begin to morph into a black and a navy blue cape. Naruto is impressed with that skill every time he witnesses it. I am loving this new gear, it is not too late to change. The speedster looks over at Superboy. Superboy folds his arms across his chest. No tights, no capes, no offense. It totally works for you, Megan sighs dreamily. Superboy glances at her. Her cheeks begin to burn red as she realizes that she said that aloud. In that you can totally work in it. Blushing, she tosses up her hood and turns invisible. Grappling hooks come down from the ceiling. Robin and Kid Flash secure the lines to their waists. Holes open up on the floor beneath the team. Robin and Kid lightly land on the ground. Megan hovers down to the ground in a graceful manner. All three quickly move out the way. Superboy smashes down upon the ground. I knew I didn't need a line, smirks Superboy, and yet causing a seismic event might go against the point of being covert, Robin shakes his head at the clone. Superboy shrugs not caring in the least. Where is the rookie? asks Kid, did he get lost jumping down? Robin smirks lifting a finger to point behind Kid. Kid turns around only to jump in surprise. Naruto stands behind him staring off into the distance. When, splutters kid. Be more mindful of your surroundings, laughs Robin. Let's get moving, Robin takes off without bothering to wait for the others. Naruto shrugs following the boy wonder. The rest of the team soon starts to move. Watchtower the doors slide open allowing entrance to the main control room of the watchtower. Diana enters the room. There is no surprise on her face at seeing Batman already there. It is a rare to find a time that Batman is not in the watchtower looking up information on certain criminals. He usually does it in the Batcave where he has complete privacy, but he did call her up here. The Amazon glances at the various screens that are displaying a single video feed from different angles. Stopping behind the Batman, she watches as a child battles against a villain she never seen. This villain is able to control wind currents to form twisters much like Red Tornado. The screen switches to show the villain take out a team of young heroes before that same child bursts out of the ground and spits out a giant fireball destroying the villain in a single shot. He inhaled a large amount of oxygen before using hand gestures to internalize the oxygen into fuel to create the fireball. I am unable to see the exact gestures of each hand but there were three to five in total, says Batman. Wonder Woman gains a pensive expression. There are spells that require hand motions to cast but it is usually followed by an incantation. The tape is rewound. She watches closely. I have never seen a fire spell like that. Batman narrows his eyes. Magic is an essential part of Amazon life. Wonder Woman is an expert on magic. He wanted to keep this between as few as people as possible. But if Wonder Woman doesn't recognize the magic it looks like he will have to expand his circle. The only other member in the Justice League that might know more about magic than Diana is Zatara. Zatara uses magic more frequently than Wonder Woman, but she has over a century's worth more knowledge on it. She is an immortal Amazon that has lived for about a hundred years or more. It is impressive, admits Diana, but he went straight for the killing blow. Did he know that the villain was an android? Yes, but to go to such extremes, Batman stares upon Naruto. The child is trained extensively in stealth and martial arts. He brings up various video footage of Naruto training at the cave. It is a blend of various styles. There are signs of ninjutsu, judo, jujitsu, and several others I am unable to recognize. In his battle against Mr. Twister, he used shuriken and kanai. Weapons like those were used in Japan hundreds of years ago. 
Very few have such skill in weapons. Those that do are mercenaries and assassins. Diana gazes upon the child. He is a warrior. A small smile forms on her face. She remembers when she was that age and trained just as hard. Batman glances at the Amazon. More like a mercenary. I had a conversation with him alone after the mission briefing. The Dark Knight remembers that conversation with perfect clarity. He wanted to be paid for the mission. And he threatened to leave the team if not paid for his services. It is not an unreasonable request. Diana ignores the accusatory glare. Bruce, he is a warrior and possesses a warrior's pride. Though it may seem mercenary, it was the way he was raised. Amazons are raised in the same manner. Are soldiers and police officers not paid for their services? I first joined the Justice League to not just help mankind, but to open communications between my people and the outside world. My motives were not as noble as yours or Superman. Give the child a chance to learn the true meaning of being a hero. A contemplative look is on Batman's face. The Dark Knight has much to think about. Santa Prisca Santa Prisca is a small tropical island with a thick forest. The dense forest doesn't have any trail through it making it a tedious time for the team to navigate. Superboy, Kid Flash, and Miss Martian are having the hardest time moving through the forest while trying to be discreet. Superboy has to resist the urge to not smash every branch and fallen tree in his path. Miss Martian is not used to the environment coming from a planet that doesn't have much vegetation on it. Kid Flash is always eager to rush ahead but is forced to travel at the same speed as the rest of the group. Naruto and Robin on the other hand are having no trouble at all. The two are moving through the terrain with trained experience. Naruto could go even faster if he takes to the branches but doesn't want to reveal too many of his abilities. Robin lifts up his arm. We are almost at the rendezvous point. Superboy picks up a crunching sound. Did you hear that? Hear what? Wait is this a super hearing thing? Asks Kid. Kid, Superboy use infrared vision to scout ahead. Kid puts on his goggles. The infrared picks up five heat signatures. I got five signatures about a quarter mile away. I see six others. The two groups are about to meet, relays Superboy. Circle around them. We can't risk being seen. Naruto glances to the right watching as Robin takes to the treetops. Boy Wonder completely abandons the team. Hey Robin, where did he go? Frowns Kid trying to find his friend. He was here a second ago blinks miss martian great now we have to find him as well gunshots begin to fill the air don't need super hearing for that says kid kid circle around yeah yeah i will but i need to find robin in a burst of speed kid takes off running straight towards the two groups unfortunately the ground is mudding making his super speed turn against him he slips on the mud falling forward before rolling across and straight in between the two groups that are shooting at each other Kid looks up to see everyone looking at him. So much for stealth, gulps the speedster. Break Bane leads his men into a fight with those cobra bastards. He is going to make them pay for taking over his island. Venom is his property. And no one takes what belongs to him and gets away with it. Speaking in Spanish, he orders his mean to kill all the cobra fighters. Take no prisoners. A crash from the east makes the gun fighting stop for a few seconds. All turn to see a boy come rolling into between them. The boy wears an all-black tight-fitting outfit with a symbol of a lightning bolt on the chest. Bane is reminded of Flash's protege. What would a sidekick be doing on his island? Is the Justice League here? Kill him, orders Bane. Kid moves at incredible speeds dodging the bullets. Several bird a rangs come out of the shadows knocking weapons out of Bane's men hands. Robin comes down from above taking out two men in a single spin kick. What are you doing? Why didn't you vanish into the woods? A high-speed punch knocks out a cobra follower. Oh is that what you wanted us to do? We can't read your mind. Two cobra followers are telekinetically tossed into a tree. Kid turns to look at Miss Martian. Well, at least I can't. Hey, you told me I was only allowed to read the bad guy's mind, says Miss Martian. Naruto stays in the shadows not bothering to join in on the fighting. There is no point in it. The others are easily able to handle the men with guns. A ninja never reveals his secrets until absolutely necessary. Beside, this is supposed to be a recon mission. Kid Flash already broke cover by running ahead. Now the enemy knows that they are here. Well, the enemy knows about five members of the team. 
his own presence is hidden so the enemy doesn't know about him. Bane blocks a punch before nailing Superboy in the face. You think you can take down Bane? A second punch comes at Superboy, but this time the clone blocks it. Smirking, Superboy delivers a full-powered uppercut that knocks Bane out cold. Bane hits the ground like a sack of potatoes. One of the Cobra followers tries to run away, but Aqualad lands in front of him. Aqualad places a hand on the Cobra follower's chest. Lightning is channeled through his arm electrocuting the villain. A scream comes from the Cobra follower before he drops to the ground unconscious. I know these outfits, says Robin tying up a couple of the Cobra followers. They're part of the cult of Cobra. I am sure that if Batman knew such extremists were on the island he would have let us know, says Aqualad. Which means that Cobra are the ones that took over the island, says Robin. Great, now we can contact the League. Mission accomplished, says Kid. Robin shakes his head. No way, Cobra isn't selling venom they're hoarding it. We aren't leaving here until I find out why. Until you find out, this team needs a leader, and you think it is you? You're a 13 year old kid who bailed on us. So I guess you are a mature 15, ha, huh? you blew our cover at the first chance. Miss Martian looks at Superboy, don't you want to be leader? Superboy scoffs, no thanks. How about you, I don't think I am ready to be a leader. I am new to all this hero stuff, admits Megan. Her eyes turn to find Naruto. She gasps in surprise to find him standing next to her with his usual nonchalant expression. It is a bit creepy as she didn't even notice him. Do you want me to translate? If you want, replies Naruto. Megan telepathically relays the entire conversation between Kid and Naruto. He regrets declining the offer. Arguing on a mission while in enemy territory is beyond stupid. Kurama would have his head for dealing with a bunch of amateurs. Superboy's hearing picks up the talking between a couple of the men. Senor Bane, why do you not break the ropes and beat these children? Quiet, Bane smirks. I can use them to help me get my factory back. Superboy gains a small smirk. He loves having super hearing and the ability to understand multiple languages. One of the few bonuses of being trained by Cadmus. Do you think you are Batman? I am the closest thing we got. Laughter erupts from Bane drawing the attention of the team. Such clever children, but if you want to find out what is going on I can take you inside. Bane smirks. I know a secret entrance. Aqualad looks over at Miss Martian. She walks over to Bane and concentrates. There is a secret entrance, but he is hiding something. Miss Martian struggles to keep up with all his thoughts, he is reciting football scores in Spanish. It is not my first time dealing with a telepath, smirks Bane. Why are you willing to help us? asks Aqualad. It is not complicated, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Megan continues to translate to Naruto. Naruto gains a slight frown. He watches as the team unties Bane. An enemy is always an enemy no such thing as an enemy being a friend. There are so many other ways to infiltrate the factory that doesn't require following a well-known criminal. No wonder their mentors never let them operate on their own. None of them would have survived in the ninja world. Robin has a pensive expression. If there really is a secret entrance it would allow us to get into the factory undetected. If he tries anything I'll take him down, states Superboy. Aqualad glances at the team. He has to admit that trusting Bane, one of the most dangerous villains in the world is risky. Bane is a villain that managed to beat Batman at one point in the past. Still, a secret entrance into the factory is too good an opportunity to pass up. It is the best plan at the moment. Robin slices the ropes freeing Bane. Lead the way, orders Aqualad. This is a terrible idea, Naruto doesn't like this one bit. One thing he learned being on the run is to never trust anyone especially not an enemy. A ninja never accepts that there is only one option to complete a task. Bane is not needed to find a way to enter into the factory. There are so many other options. Naruto, come on. Naruto frowns as he follows the team. Factory, my lord, he approaches, bows flicker. Cobra stares out over the balcony. Put up a radio jamming net. Nothing must interfere. Break Superboy keeps his eyes trained on Bane. If the villain makes any move to betray them he is going to take out Bane hard. Bane reaches the edge of the cliff pointing down at the factory. The team gathers at the edge of the cliff looking down upon the factory. Robin uses his binoculars to get a closer look. Cobra is moving the product all right. 
it looks like they're getting ready to move. We need to get inside to get a closer look, says Aqualad. Just what I was thinking, agrees Kid. Yeah, you are the thinker all right, laughs Robin. Kid glares at Robin. Sarcasm really? A real leader would focus on getting us down there. Naruto ignores them all keeping his eyes on Bane who walked away towards a large boulder. Bane moves the boulder with little effort revealing a hidden entrance to a cave. Your answers are this way, says Bane. The villain enters the cave. Great, now El Luchador is our leader, scowls Kid. Robin elbows Kid in the ribs. The team follows Bane. Bane leads them through the cave to where a secret door is at. Putting his hand on a fingerprint reader, it beeps before the doors slide open. All of them enter into the factory. Robin, Aqualad turns to find the boy Wonder is gone once again. Don't tell me he was captured already, frowns Bane. No, he just does that, sighs Aqualad. Kid smirks putting on his goggles. I'll go get the information we need before Boy Wonder returns. Aqualad never gets a chance to stop Kid as the speedster takes off at high speeds. Great chain of command, glares Bane. Naruto doesn't know it, but he thought the same thing in his mind. Batman should have assigned a leader to them team to keep certain, idiots in line. Using the term idiot is being nice. Kurama was the one with a more colorful personality and no doubt would have come up with a much better term to define Robin and Kid Flash's actions. Aqualad, Miss Martian, and Superboy all share the same expression. The remaining members of the team and Bane sneak through the factory. Ducking behind a pile of crater, they oversee Cobra moving shipment. It looks like they are moving all the new shipment. None of the old shipment, says Superboy. Maybe freshness counts, suggests Miss Martian. Freshness? repeats Naruto with a raised eyebrow. Miss Martian gains a light blush realizing how silly that sounded. Helicopter, says Superboy. Factory A Cobra follower is sitting at the computer console making sure that there are no security breaches. A bat A rang pierces the console. The Cobra follower has no time to react when gas sprays out. The knockout gas makes the Cobra follower passes out. Robin pushes the knocked out Cobra follower to the floor. Taking a seat, he begins to type rapidly. Find anything? Kid appears behind Robin. I am decoding the system now. Robin continues to type. Kid leans forward pointing his chocolate bar at the screen. That is the original Venom formula. A new blue strand appears next to the purple Venom. And that is, the Blockbuster formula. Cobra found a way to combine Venom and Blockbuster together. Together the new drug is three times more potent and permanent. Kid stares at the screen with wide eyes. How did Cobra get its hands on Blockbuster? Robin's eyes narrow. The buyer must also be the supplier. He reaches up to his ear to activate the communication link. Robin to Red Tornado. We have, static. Kid frowns knowing that the situation took a turn for the worse. Santa Prisca a military-grade helicopter lands on the ground. Cobra stands patiently with his men surrounding the perimeter. Out of the helicopter emerges one of best assassins in the world. Lord Cobra, greets the assassin. His hockey mask hides his facial features. Sportsmaster, greets Cobra. A simple gesture has a lackey run up towards the two. The lackey brings out a suitcase opening it. Inside the suitcase is a single vial. The new formula is ready. Sportsmaster glances behind Cobra to see the large hulking beast, Mammoth. Mammoth is the first test product of the new formula. A literal mountain of muscle. Sportsmaster smirks, finally with this on our side we can go man to man with the league. In the air watching the exchange is Miss Martian. Aqualad, I am sending a mental image of the buyer to you now. Aqualad, Superboy, Naruto, and Bane are standing on a balcony inside the factory. Miss Martian sends Aqualad the mental image of Sportsmaster and Cobra. It is Sportsmaster, he is the buyer says Aqualad in surprise. Naruto is the only one among the four that has no idea who this sportsmaster is. What is the plan? asks Superboy. We need to stop sportsmaster from obtaining that new formula. How do we do that? Bane smirks, like this. The villain leaps over the railing. Bane slams down on the ground between two cobra followers. Screaming the villain takes out the followers quick and in the process blows the cover of the entire team. The window behind the team bursts as Mammoth attacks the team. Aqualad lands on the ground. 
he grabs his water bearers using one to create a small water shield to protect from incoming bullets. Mammoth roars before charging at Superboy. Superboy charges forward in the two lock arms. The two are evenly matched in strength. Mammoth picks Superboy up and slams him back first into the ground creating a small crater. With a yell, Superboy rolls backwards onto his feet and leaps at Mammoth delivering a right hook. I'll take those. Kid moves at high speeds stealing the guns from the Cobra followers. Aqualad takes advantage by shooting small water balls at high speeds at the disarmed Cobra followers. Sportsmaster watches the fight. His eyes narrowed as he sees several Cobra followers being knocked aside by an invisible force. The air above the battle shimmers. Taking a closer look, he spots a distortion in the air. He draws a metal rod that opens up into a javelin. Sportsmaster tosses it with deadly accuracy at the distortion. Miss Martian goes to move out of the way but as it passes by her it explodes blasting her into several crates. Cobra turns his head to see a familiar sidekick. Batman must be getting desperate to send his whelp. What is the matter Cobra? You seem disconcerted, smirks Robin. I am plagued by mosquitoes, frowns Cobra. Aqualad yells over at Miss Martian. Link us up. Everyone online? Yeah, grunts Superboy blocking a punch. I'm here beautiful. Robin? I am busy. Miss Martian tries to find Naruto. Where is Naruto? Everyone we need to retreat. Fall back to the cave, orders Aqualad. Robin dodges a kick from Shimmer. I got this, Robin now. Frowning. Robin tosses a pellet onto the ground. Shimmer coughs as smoke blinds her. Once the smoke is gone, Robin is nowhere in sight. Cobra stares off into the distance. Superboy tosses Mammoth before running into the cave. Aqualad, Miss Martian, and Kid Flash are right behind Superboy. Robin enters the cave last. The five start to run down the tunnel avoiding fire from Cobra followers. Superboy take out the pillars. Superboy begins to punch out the pillars. The cave begins to collapse preventing the team from being followed. Miss Martian looks around frantically. Naruto is not here. I can't sense his mind at all. Robin punches the wall in anger. How could my first mission as leader go wrong? It is true that you have the most experience, but that can also be a weakness. Aqualad walks towards his friend. With Batman your roles are defined and don't need to speak. This team is new inexperienced. The leader needs to be vocal and clearly give orders. So what I have to play babysitter? Robin soon loses his anger. Who I am kidding? Calder you should be leader. You're the only one that can. Please I can run circles. Wally come on. You know it is true. Superboy nods. I could have told you that. Hello Megan. It is so obvious. I'll turn to look at kid. Fine, smirks kid. Aqualad places a hand on Robin's shoulder. Then I will bear the burden for now. Until you are ready. You are destined to lead this team, maybe not now but soon. Robin smirks. The first order of business is to get back into that factory and find Naruto. If he was captured we need to free him. Kid scowls, the rookie probably tried to run off on his own. After we find Naruto we need to stop Sportsmaster from leaving the island with the shipment, finishes Aqualad. I was thinking the same thing, chuckles Robin. The team begins to head out of the cave. Moonlight shines up ahead signaling the exit. As the team rushes ahead, a familiar voice stops them. Outside the cave waits the person that was supposed to be on their side. Stop right there, laughs Bane. Or I will blow up the cave and bury you alive. You? Aqualad's eyes widen in surprise. Why? Mentally, Aqualad orders Kid to take a few steps back to get a running start. Kid discreetly starts to step backwards. Bane smirks holding the detonator in his right hand. The team notices explosive all over the exit. One false step and Bane will ignite the explosives burying them alive. It is simple. The reason I helped you was to get Santa Prisca back. I hoped that my two enemies would take each other out and when the smoke cleared Santa Prisca would be mine again. However, killing you sidekicks will make the Justice League take action. Either way, I get back my island. Smirking, Bane is about to press the button. Goodbye children. In a blur, the detonator is snatched out of Bane's hand. Huh? Bane looks down at his hand. Looking for this. Smirks kid. I'll kill you, Bane charges a kid only to be lifted into the air. The villain's eyes widen. 
Superboy steps forward crouching down. Drop him. Bane falls down straight into Superboy's punch. Now, I have a plan, says Aqualad. The team gathers together. Break Miss Martian flies above the factory in camouflage mode. Aqualad, I am not seeing any activity at all. It is so quiet. Get a closer look. We are almost there, orders Aqualad. Diving down, she goes around the back. Miss Martian's eyes widen. The sight that greets her is one that she never expected. Cobra followers are lying all over the ground unconscious. She flies into the factory to find the rest of the Cobra followers in the same condition. Heading back out, she flies over to the helicopter. Unconscious with multiple bruises are Cobra and Sportsmaster. Both villains are tied up tightly in ninja wire. What the heck happened here? Kid speeds into the area with a stunned expression. He looks at Miss Martian with new respect. It wasn't me, says Miss Martian. Robin swings down from the roof. He lands lightly on his feet. Boy Wonder looks around with the same look of disbelief. Who did this? Superboy uses his X-ray vision. Over there. His eyes lock onto the one responsible. The team watches as someone walks out of the woods towards them. Naruto. Gasps Miss Martian. Naruto walks towards the team dragging an unconscious mammoth behind him. Robin and Kid Flash can't believe it. Superboy hides his surprise well. Aqualad is in the same state of disbelief. Unceremoniously Naruto comes to a stop in front of them team. Mission accomplished, states Naruto to Miss Martian. How? No way the rookie did all this, exclaims Kid. It isn't possible, I mean. Robin tries hard to hide his emotions, but finds it extremely hard. He is the protege of Batman, one of the greatest heroes in the world and leader of the Justice League. It may seem arrogant, but he knows that out of all the sidekicks in the world that he is in the top three. Other sidekicks may have special powers, but he has been trained to take down superpower individuals using his brains. Never has he felt inferior to another protege until this moment. Naruto accomplished the mission on his own without any help from the others. Cobra, Sportsmaster, and a genetically enhanced monster were all defeated by a kid a year older than him. And Naruto doesn't have a single scratch. Robin knows with all his skill this a task that even he couldn't accomplish alone. So how did Naruto do it? Who is Naruto Uzumaki? Red Tornado to Team. I am on my way to the rendezvous point. You called the lead. Dude. Aqualad places a hand on Kid Flash's shoulder. The mission is over. Calling the League was the logical decision. Mount Justice. You are all dismissed. Robin, Aqualad, and Kid Flash head towards the Zeta tubes. Megan and Superboy head in the opposite direction to their rooms. Naruto on the other hand stands in front of Batman not moving from his spot. Robin glances backwards at the two before disappearing through the Zeta tube. Batman stares at Naruto. The League has agreed to grant your request. You will be given a monthly stipend as long as you are on the team. Naruto knows that there is more to the agreement so remains silent, your powers. I am a former ninja that is all I will reveal for the moment, interrupts Naruto. That bit of information is all Batman needs to confirm his suspicions. I will have Canary take you to the bank to set up an account. Your money will be transferred to the account, says Batman. The Dark Knight takes his leave. Naruto heads to the Zeta tubes. Canary is in civilian clothes. Naruto is walking next to her in civilian clothes as well. The two stop outside a bank. Opening the doors, she gestures for him to enter. He enters into the bank. Ocean blue eyes immediately scan the entire area locating the exits, number of guards, and the fastest route to escaping should a fight break out. There is no need to be so tense. This is a simple formality, smiles Canary. Tense. Naruto glances at the woman. Amusement appears in his eyes. He gestures for Canary to lead the way, not saying anything more. Canary realizes how silly she must have sounded. That is like telling Superman to be careful around a gun. As crazy as it may seem, the most dangerous person in the bank at the moment is the child. She heard about the mission to Santa Prisca. Naruto single handedly took down 30 Cobra fanatic followers, Cobra. Sportsmaster, and a genetically enhanced human with incredible super strength and speed. He did this all without taking a single injury. It was a scary thought to think that a child managed to accomplish such a feat on his own. Naruto's abilities have drawn the attention of the entire league. 
It is not just the league, thinks Canary. She walks up to the bank teller. I am here to help my nephew open an account. His name is Uzumaki Naruto. The bank teller smiles. I shall get the paperwork ready. Naruto barely pays attention choosing to go over various mental simulations in his head. There are a couple new jutsu that he has been wanting to work on. While waiting for the paperwork Canary returns to her original thoughts. Cobra may be a fanatical that believes himself to be a god, but the man is extremely dangerous. A day after being captured and placed in Arkham Asylum there was a huge bounty placed on the person responsible for the capture of Cobra. Naruto's identity is unknown to Cobra but the bounty on his head is for $5 million. Batman is working overtime to make sure that Naruto's identity remains a secret. However, Canary knows that Naruto's identity will come out eventually. He has no codename and doesn't wear a mask. Worse yet, Naruto carries no fear at all about his identity being revealed. She already knows that he is the type of person that will walk around in broad daylight even with a bounty on his head. Is there something you wish to tell me? No, I have a lot on my mind is all. Naruto speaks in a calm manner. Batman told you already about my profession. Canary nods. Then you should know that lying to me is pointless. Even half-truths will not work. Ocean blue eyes stare deep into her own light blue. I grew up in a world filled with deception. If you want to lie that is fine, but do a better job at it. A small smile forms on her face. I'll work on it, smirks Canary. Perhaps there is hope for him after all. Mount Justice. Recognized B06, Uzumaki Naruto. In a flash of light Naruto appears in the cave. That was faster than he thought. Canary had helped him set up a bank account and the league transferred $700 into the account. Well, 83,320, 53 yen which equates to 700 US dollars. 83,320 yen and 53 sen will be transferred to his bank account each month with 59,000 yen extra for every mission he completes. A bit on small side compared to the money he used to make as a missing ninja, but it is a start. He used half the money to purchase a new set of kanai and shuriken before returning to base. There is this great blacksmith store that he found a month ago, it makes top quality weapons. Real weapons not ones for show. When he had enough money he planned to buy a sword. He almost feels naked without a sword. A sword's is very useful weapon that he learned to use on his own. Gives him extra reach and provides him with a quick way to deal fatal blows to his enemies. Aqualad and Robin use weapons so him using a sword shouldn't be a problem. Naruto. Megan flies towards him with a smile, how are you? I am well, greets Naruto. How are you? She lands on the ground. A bit boring. Superboy went out to help with an accident on the Metropolis Bridge. So I have been pretty much alone. Megan shifts nervously. Do you want to do something? Naruto tilts his head. Sure, what did you have in mind? Megan smiles brightly. Just as she is about to voice her idea, the Zeta tube flares to life. Recognize B02, Aqualad. In a flash of light, Calder enters the cavern. Calder. Beams Megan. What are you doing here? Calder smiles at Megan. I was hoping to hang out with my friends. He walks over to Naruto offering his hand. It is good to see you. Naruto stares at the offered hand before extending his own. Recognized B03, Kid Flash. Hey Megalicious, did you miss me? Kid enters the room dressed in his usual hero gear. In a burst of speed, he speeds over to Megan placing an elbow on her shoulder. Want to spend some alone time together. Megan gives a friendly smile, it is nice to see you too. Naruto admires the girl for enduring Wally's lame attempts at flirting, she is even nicer than he thought. Recognized B01, Robin. Yo, waves Robin, I am ready for a mission. Tell me about it. Kid starts to munch on a chocolate bar. I am getting bored with all this nothing. I am sure we will get a mission soon, reassures Megan. Recognized B04, Superboy. Superboy enters into the room. How did everything go? Megan's question is never answered. The clone brushes past the entire team. A new voice speaks out stopping Superboy from leaving the room. Time for training. The entire team turns around to see two adults walking towards them. Martian Manhunter and Black Canary walk towards the team. Naruto's eyes lock onto Canary's right shoulder. It is bandaged up. That was not there two hours ago when he last saw her. 
Uncle Jean. Megan runs over to her uncle giving him a hug. What are you doing here? A large smile is on her face. I was in the neighborhood and decided to drop by to see how you were doing, smiles the Martian Manhunter. Megan smiles, I hit a few bumps but I am learning. That is all I can ask. Superboy sends a jealous glance at Megan and Martian Manhunter. Scowling, he turns to leave. Stick around, says Canary. Training is in session. Canary walks to the middle of the room activating the simulation. I want you to know that I consider it an honor to teach you. She goes to remove her jacket. I will throw everything at you. Everything that I learned from my own mentors and as well, she winces in pain, and my own bruises. What happened? Asks Megan concerned. The job, smirks Canary. Combat is all about putting the battle on your terms. You should always be acting and not reacting. I need a sparring partner. Oh me. Kid walks forward with a wise smirk. Taking one last bite from his banana he tosses it into the nearby garbage bin. Once this is over, I'll show you my moves. Canary clears her throat drawing Kid's attention. Are you ready? Kid turns back around gaining that flirtatious smile. She crouches into a fighting stance. Moving quickly, she throws a straight right punch. Kid easily blocks the punch, but she already predicted that he would induct down into a leg sweep that swept Kid's legs out from under him. The speedster hit the ground back first. The words fail appears next to him. Hurt so good, groans Kid. Robin burst out laughing. Canary helps Kid up. Good block, but did you know what you did wrong? Robin raises his hand. He hit on teacher and got served. Dude, he allowed me to dictate the terms of battle, starts Canary. Please. She turns around to face Superboy. With my powers the battle is always on my terms. I am a living weapon and this is a waste of my time, scowls Superboy. Canary smirks. Prove it. Superboy's eyes narrow. He steps forward crouching into a fighting stance. Canary gets into her own stance. A silent signal goes off. Superboy throws a punch only to find Canary grab his arm and toss him over her shoulders. Bad move thinks Naruto. Superboy is a powerhouse with incredible strength. Instead of throwing punches he should be looking to turn this into a grappling match. Laughter comes from Robin. Calder nudges his friend. Robin throws up his hands over his mouth to muffle his laughter. Superboy charges angrily at Canary, but is once again knocked to the ground. Good, you are angry. Channel that anger, says Canary. Growling, Superboy leaps at Canary only to have his legs swept out from under him. For the third time he is on his back with the words fail next to his body. Enough. Superboy stands up. I am done. Training is mandatory, states Canary. A screen pops open. Batman to the cave. The team gathers around to listen. Five hours ago, Green Arrow called in the League to help deal with an android threat. It turned out to be disastrous. Another screen pops open to show an alien looking android fighting various members of the Justice League and winning. The android possessed the ability to copy the powers of anyone it came in contact with. In the end, it took eight League members four hours to defeat the android. Robin's eyes widen. A machine with the powers of the entire Justice League. Who made it? Tio Maro. Good guess, but Red Tornado doesn't think so. Martian Manhunter addresses the team. It bears the signature of Professor Evo. Evo? But he is dead, says Aqualad. So we thought and hoped, replies Canary. Naruto's eyes narrow upon the android. A machine that possessed the powers of the Sharingan. That is a scary thought. He had no idea that technology could do that. The technology of this world is far more dangerous than he thought. Looks like he will need to be a bit more careful with his techniques. Until this threat is permanently neutralized. We are sending two trucks carrying the parts to two separate star labs in Boston and New York. You all will split up into two separate teams to safeguard the two real trucks, continues Batman. So now we take out your garbage? Batman stares at Superboy not liking the attitude. You had something better to do? The image disappears. Aqualad double checks the coordinates. Coordinates received. Time to move out. The team begins to head out. A hand reaches out grabbing Superboy's arm. Superboy turns to look at Canary. When you are ready, I will be here, says Canary. Highway Batman and several other League members are overseeing the loading of the android. Among them is Captain Adam, Superman, Hawkman, and Green Lantern. 
Naruto stares curiously at the members of the Justice League. He must admit that these League members sure do look strong. Honestly, he is curious to how he measures up to them. Not to sound arrogant, but he knows that he can take Black Canary. If her only power is being an expert in martial arts then she won't prove much of a match for him, it makes him wonder the abilities of the rest of the League members. Aqualad glances at Naruto and Superboy. Superboy is staring straight in the direction of Superman while Naruto is observing all the members of the Justice League. This is the second mission that the team was given. Teamwork is the key to success. Naruto proved on the first mission that he is able to handle his own even when the numbers are stacked against him. While the rest of the team argued and fought, Naruto single-handedly brought down Cobra and Sportsmaster. Two of the most dangerous criminals in the world were taken out by a single person. Aqualad knows that the most qualified person to lead this team is not him nor Robin, it is Naruto. According to Robin, Batman learned that Naruto is formerly a ninja. Ninjas are experts in stealth and espionage. Robin may have been trained by Batman, but Naruto was raised in the world of shadows making him the ideal candidate to lead a covert team. The problem is that Naruto lacks the communication skills to give out commands to the team. Megan is constantly relaying conversations to Naruto via telepathy. The second problem is that no one except Megan knows Naruto's personality since she is the only one that he talks to. Until the team learns a bit more about his personality no one can really trust him. Using this knowledge, Aqualad has placed Naruto on his team along with Miss Martian. Robin, Kid Flash, and Superboy make up the second team. Batman gives the signal. The team splits into two groups following the trucks. One by one the members of the Justice League leave the scene. Superman is about to take off, but is stopped by Batman. I told you that we needed to talk. On the road, Team A is following the truck to Boston. Team A consists of Aqualad, Miss Martian, and Naruto. Each member of the team is riding on a brand new motorcycle. Naruto revs the engines shooting ahead of the others. This is the type of technology that he enjoys. Do we get to keep these? asks Naruto. Aqualad's eyes widen. I can understand you. I am using my telepathy to tap into the speech pattern of Naruto's brain. This is how I am able to communicate with him, explains Miss Martian. I see. Aqualad rides next to Naruto. These are for mission purposes so they will be available to us during missions. I doubt Batman will let us use them for other purposes. I will have to look into buying one. A smirk appears on Aqualad's face. Perhaps his worries were unjustified. A strange sound hits Naruto's ears. He turns his head making Miss Martian and Aqualad do the same. All three stare at green and silver monkeys that are flying through the air right towards them. Flying monkeys that is new. Aqualad opens up communication with Team B. Robin come in, we are under attack. Kind of figured, it is the same over here. Naruto hits several buttons. The seat shifts up and the back part of the bike comes apart. He starts to ride on the front wheel. Miss Martian abandoned her bike choosing to fly. She uses her telekinetic powers to smash the monkeys into each other. The two monkeys explode in a shower of debris. Aqualad keeps one hand on the handles while using the other to swing his a whip of water that cuts through several of the robotic monkeys. In a single leap, Naruto lands on the roof of the truck. He channels chakra to his fists to add extra strength to his punches. Each punch destroys the monkey. The monkey's eyes begin to glow green. Green laser beams are fired at the young heroes. Naruto reaches back tossing a half dozen shuriken that take out the several of the monkeys. Miss Martian slams a monkey into the street with her telekinetic powers. Turning, her eyes widen in surprise. Naruto is standing on the side of the truck as if upright. He is fighting them as if standing on solid ground. How is he doing that? Several monkeys land on the back of the truck. Using the laser, they cut through the armored truck opening up a large hole. There are too many, yells Aqualad. Get in front of the truck, orders Naruto. Miss Martian and Aqualad look at him curiously. Naruto's hands come together and he begins to flash through hand seals. Miss Martian move. Aqualad speeds in front of the truck. Miss Martian flies ahead. Naruto finishes the hand seals and claps his hands together. Wind style. Great wind breakthrough. Gale force winds erupt outward from Naruto's body. Miss Martian is almost caught up in the fierce winds. 
Aqualad watches in awe as Naruto created a wind strong enough to rival Red Tornado and Mr. Twister. Two dozen of the monkeys hit the street causing multiple explosions. The winds keep up until all the robotic monkeys are destroyed. How did he do that? Wonders Miss Martian. It is similar to way the magic is used except he is using hand seals instead of incantations, answers Aqualad. I have never seen anything like it. Naruto falls to a knee breathing heavily. That jutsu is a C-rank jutsu, but with the amount of chakra he poured into it made it into an A-rank jutsu. Usually that wouldn't take a hit to his chakra reserves or at least it didn't when he had a demon inside of him. The demon replenished his reserves at a high rate making him able to use multiple high-rank jutsu at a time without tiring. Since losing the demon his chakra reserves were cut in half. He no longer has the stamina to pour so much chakra into a jutsu. This is Robin to Aqualad. We lost our cargo and a teammate. Superboy is pretty much gone. Yeah, the guy went ballistic. Aqualad radios Superboy. Superboy give us your position so we can back you up. I don't need help. Don't want it, Superboy, Superboy. I think he ditched his transmitter. Great, now how do we get back the parts? Well, there is one way to track the parts. How is that? Asks Aqualad. The ninja points in the distance. There are a dozen more monkeys flying towards them. If we let them take the parts and follow them, suggests Naruto. Miss Martian relays the plan to Robin over the radio. That actually isn't a bad plan, says Robin. We could capture whoever is after the parts and that could lead us to who built the robot. The League would be impressed if we can capture Professor Evo. Aqualad gains a pensive expression. Not much time to decide, says Miss Martian. Let them have the parts, says Aqualad. Naruto leaps from the truck landing on the back of Aqualad's bike. Aqualad is shocked to see Naruto stand there without any trouble at all. The three watch as the robotic monkey steal the Amazo parts. Brake Superboy slams down upon the train car. He spent the last five hours chasing those monkeys. There were several points that he almost lost them, but he managed to use his enhanced vision to find them again. It led him to this train car. He punching a hole in the roof, he jumps down into the car. Laughter fills the air. Robotic monkeys are sitting on the crates. Well what do we have here? A small man that barely comes up to five feet tall steps out of the darkness. He wears a sweater vest over a long sleeve white shirt and black dress pants. You are Professor Evo? Superboy looks down upon the man. Consider me turbed. I didn't know that the big blue had a brat, he doesn't. Professor Evo looks at the clone before waving dismissively. If you say so. The professor smiles as his monkeys start to hover behind him. How did you like my mobile optimal neural quotient infiltrators? Laughter comes from the robotic monkeys before attacking Superboy. A couple punches destroy the first two monkeys before he grabs the third and fourth. He smashes the two monkeys together. Hmm, if Ivo's magnificent MONQIs don't float you maybe my amazing Amazo will better suit you. Superboy has no time to react when a punch slams into his face sending him flying into the crates behind him, or better slay you. Superboy looks up to see a six and a half foot tall android. It is the same android that was in the footage of fighting against the Justice League. Accessing Superman, says Amazo. Narrowing his eyes, Superboy lunges at Amazo. Amazo catches the punch and slams a knee into Superboy's gut. An uppercut launches Superboy through the roof and high into the air. The clone is sent flying over half a mile before crashing through the roof of a school building. He crashes straight through several floors landing in a large basketball gym. Superboy goes to stand, but a force from above smashes him back into the floor creating a small crater. The clone is lifted up before a punch sends him flying. Blood sprays from Superboy's mouth. A whip of water heads at Amazo's back. Accessing Martian Manhunter. Amazo becomes into intangible. The whip of water passes through Amazo harmlessly. Amazo turns around to face its new opponents. Accessing Captain Atom. Aqualad dives out of the way to avoid nuclear energy. Superboy goes to attack Amazo. But the android turns around firing a second blast of energy that strikes the clone in the chest. Pain fills the clone. The android never gets a chance to finish Superboy. Amazo is picked up into the air by an invisible hand and tossed into the bleachers. Now that was interesting. Professor Evo is carried into the gym by his robotic monkeys. He takes a seat on the bleachers. 
His eyes land upon the green-skinned girl hovering the air. I didn't know there was another Martian. Guess the big blue wasn't the only one hiding a kid, smirks Evo. Analyzing. Information downloaded. Amazo stands up. A wave of the hand sends Miss Martian flying into the wall. Accessing Miss Martian. A chuckle comes from the professor. It looks like you are not as weak as the others, smirks Evo. Aqualad forms a pair of whips with his water bearers. We need to dissemble the android before it absorbs more powers. Good luck with that. Evo leans back on the bleachers. Amazo kill them, priority alpha. Accessing flash. In a burst of speed too fast to follow, Amazo dodges the water whips and appears in front of Aqualad. Fifteen punches strike Aqualad all over his body. A right hook sends Aqualad flying into the far wall. Accessing Martian Manhunter. Amazo becomes intangible letting a kick pass through him harmlessly. Naruto lands on the ground spinning around to face his opponent. Accessing Superman. Amazo's eyes begin to glow red. The ninja takes off running with a pair of heat beams on his trail. Amazo pauses to analyze Naruto. Analyzing, analyzing, unable to upload. Ivo's eyes widen. What? Impossible. The professor's eyes narrow upon Naruto. Why can't my amazing Amazo analyze your powers? Naruto doesn't respond as his attention is fully on the android. Amazo appears behind Naruto. Naruto ducks under a high speed punch before sliding backwards to avoid a follow up punch. Accessing Miss Martian. A telekinetic blast sends Naruto flying. Miss Martian uses her powers to catch Naruto. Are you? No time to focus on me. Miss Martian has no time to react when Amazo is flying in the air next to her. Accessing Superman. Amazo slams a fist into Miss Martian's gut. Her eyes roll up into her head. She falls towards the ground face first. Miss Martian. Yells Superboy. His eyes fill with rage. Superboy leaps into the air. Amazo spins around catching the fist and twirls Superboy around before tossing him straight down into the floor. Accessing Captain Adam. A stream of nuclear energy plows into Superboy. Superboy screams in pain. His shirt is burned away and the skin on his chest begins to melt. Leave him alone. Amazo becomes intangible to avoid a mace made of water. Accessing Martian Manhunter. Amazo turns to face Aqualad. Accessing Superman. Flying straight at Aqualad, Amazo pounds Aqualad into the ground. An explosion fills the gym. Evo clicks his tongue. Oh well, looks like the show is over. The dust clears to reveal Amazo standing in a crater with Aqualad knocked out cold. Amazo turns his head to look up in the bleachers across from Professor Evo. Naruto is standing on the bleachers with a hard expression. Oh right, the one that managed to avoid my amazing Amazo's analysis. Amazo, capture him priority alpha. I want to dissect him to find out why you were unable to copy his abilities, smirks Evo. Accessing Flash. In a burst of speed Amazo appears behind Naruto. Amazo wraps his arms around Naruto. Accessing Superman. Naruto grits his teeth as Amazo begins to squeeze him. The bones in his body start to crack under the intense pressure. Professor Evo smirks in glee. A grin starts to form on Naruto's face. Bunshin Debakuha. Professor Ivo's eyes widen as Naruto suddenly explodes. The bleachers crumble under the explosion. Out of the smoke emerges Amazo with severe damage to its chest. Sparks begin to fly from the android making it move a bit sluggish. Amazo uses its X-ray vision to locate Naruto hiding in the shadows. Naruto leaves the shadows barely able to avoid a high-speed punch. Shit, creating that shadow clone severely damaged my reserves. I only have enough chakra for two more jutsu, thinks Naruto. Amazo moves at speeds that rival Superman. Naruto dodges the first punch, but a second and third collide sending him flying. Never in his life was he hit so hard. It takes all his willpower to stay conscious. It is only the fact that the android was ordered to capture him that the punches didn't kill him. Twisting around in midair, he begins to flash through hand seals. Accessing flash. Doden. Doryu Taiga. Naruto slams a hand upon the ground. The gym floor under Amazo turns into a river of mud. Accessing Martian Manhunter. Naruto grins having got the one that he wanted. Amazo becomes intangible floating out of the river of mud. Accessing Captain Adam, 
channeling chakra to his legs. Naruto increases his speed threefold running at Junin level speeds and leaps into the air to deliver a kick. Amazo hardens with Naruto's foot in its chest. An explosion fills the air. Flipping out of the smoke, Naruto lands on the ground and falls to a knee. Burns and blood covers his right leg. Amazo falls to the ground in multiple pieces. Shit, I am out, of, chakra, Naruto falls forward as the world of darkness consumes him. Mount Justice ocean blue eyes snap awake. Naruto stares at an unfamiliar ceiling. Sitting up, he winces in pain. He looks down to see his chest heavily bandaged. Memories of the battle with the android come back to him. That android almost killed them all. It had the amazing ability to copy the powers of any meta-human that it laid eyes upon. Fortunately, Amazo was unable to analyze his powers or copy them. That is because his powers come from the ability to manipulate and control chakra. Chakra is the mixture of physical and spiritual energy that only a living organism possesses. An android is a machine and a machine can never have access to chakra. Though given the advanced technology that this world possesses it wouldn't surprise him if a machine could replicate his chakra abilities. Naruto wouldn't have had such a hard time fighting the android if he had could have used his Sharingan. The problem is that the Sharingan wouldn't have worked against Amazo. Like Amazo couldn't copy his abilities, the Sharingan can't read the attacks of a machine. Sharingan pierces the inner eye of an opponent to read emotions. The problem is that Amazo is a not a living being therefore the Sharingan would pierce the inner eye and find nothing. There is no brain activity to read. In the end it didn't matter as he found a way to defeat Amazo before succumbing to chakra exhaustion. He really needs to focus on building his chakra reserves back up. Losing Kurama hit him worse than he thought. On the plus side his chakra control is much better so he is able to use high level jutsu back to back in almost the same manner. The doors to the room slide open. He turns his head to see Canary enter into the room. A smile is on the woman's face. Good to see you awake. Canary takes a seat next to him. You have been out for the past two days. We are not sure what happened. Chakra exhaustion. Canary remains silent. Naruto knows that she is waiting for a more in-depth explanation. Chakra is the mixture of spiritual and physical energy. It is how I am able to use my jutsu. When I use too much chakra it puts my body in a state of shock and in extreme cases I could die. Canary gains a hard look. She has heard about chakra in her martial art studies. Kai and chakra energy sources that were believed to have empowered warriors in ancient Asia. A few of her masters talked about using Kai to strengthen one's body, but it is something she never had an aptitude at. You fought like a true hero. Ready to sacrifice your life to take down an enemy. I am proud of you, praises Canary. Naruto raises an eyebrow. Give my life? I have no intention of dying. My mission was to collect the android parts and I accomplished that, nothing more. You almost died. No, I passed out for a couple days, I was fine. The woman rolls her eyes, and he is supposed to be cold and detached. Canary stands up with a smirk. She reaches over and ruffles his hair. Naruto gives her an irritated look. Laughing, she leaves the room knowing that Naruto is finally acting his age. There is still hope for him. Robin is sitting at the supercomputer in Mount Justice accessing information from the Justice League database to study a certain individual. Like his mentor, he is obsessed with gaining as much information as possible on individuals of interest. It just so happens that the individual he is interested in is the same one that his mentor is investigating. He is so engrossed with going over the mission details that he never hears a person coming up behind him. Is there a reason you are looking up information on Naruto? Robin hides his surprise well. He turns his head to see Calder come up beside him. Calder keeps his emotions schooled. I want to learn more about him. How is it that someone so strong was able to stay hidden? A video is pulled up of Naruto fighting Amazo. Justice League hacked the cameras at Gotham University to steal the video footage. I mean he was able to take down an opponent that had the powers of multiple League members. An opponent that nearly killed you, Miss Martian, and Superboy. Aren't you the least bit curious about him? Calder places a hand on Robin's shoulder. I would be lying if I said I wasn't curious, but Naruto is a friend and teammate. When he is ready, he will let us in. Come on Calder, I know he saved your life, all of our lives, corrects Calder. Multiple times. Robin frowns. Sometimes you need to ignore all that paranoia and have faith. 
Robin stares at the screen. August 5th, 12.05 p.m. Superboy is slammed down upon the ground. Groaning, he stares up at a ceiling that is rapidly becoming a close friend to him. You are getting better, smiles Canary. She extends her hand which he takes. He is helped to his feet. Don't throw all your weight into your punches because it leaves you wide open to a counter. Right, Superboy dusts off his pants, I am ready to go again. Naruto enters into the room. A thud makes him look up. He notices Superboy getting beat up by Canary. When it comes to fighting Superboy is pretty useless. Mr. Twister, Mammoth, and Amazo all beat the crap out of the clone. What type of weapon constantly gets beat up? Cadmus didn't do a very good job at creating a weapon. If Superboy wasn't invulnerable to most things the clone would have been killed a long time ago. Do you want to join us? Superboy understood every word of that. It looks like Cadmus made it so that he could understand Japanese. I have my own style, replies Naruto. Canary sends a challenging smirk. Do you think your style is better than anything I have to offer? No, but I like my style and have no desire to learn a new style. How about a spar? A shrug comes from the ninja. Canary spreads her legs getting into her stance. Naruto stands calmly not getting into a stance. Superboy takes a step back. The clone is looking forward to this. A fist sails towards Naruto's face. He leans back to avoid it. She twists around going for a leg sweep that he leaps over. Smirking, she goes to strike him in the air knowing that he can't avoid, or so she believed. Naruto twists around so that he is upside down and plants his hand on her extended arm. A kick comes down from above striking Canary between the shoulder and neck. Pain fills the woman dropping her to her knees. He flips backwards landing on his feet. He was able to put that much power into a kick even from that position, winces Canary. So he can beat Canary as well, thinks Superboy. It isn't that surprising. Naruto is the one that defeated Amazo. An android that took on several members of the Justice League along with copying their powers. As much as Superboy hates to admit it, even silently, Naruto is the strongest member on the team. Apparently even strong enough to take on a member from the Justice League. You are fast, but lack any true technique. Against an opponent of equal speed you will not have such an advantage, states Canary. I can teach you a few moves. Naruto shrugs, alright, there is no harm in learning a few moves. Break, take a short break, the others will be arriving soon for team training. Naruto and Superboy stand down. Canary tosses each of them a water bottle. She knows that the two boys are far from tired. Superboy is a carbon copy of Superman except without all the powers of the Man of Steel. One of the many things that he did inherent from the cloning process is Superman's incredible stamina and endurance. Even after three straight hours of training, Superboy didn't even break a sweat and show no signs of fatigue. Naruto's stamina was almost on the same level which is impressive. He is sweating and showed small signs of exhaustion after the second hour, but he would recover quickly to keep up with Superboy. At this rate the two would have the basics mastered in no time. Superboy prefers the grappling and throwing techniques to take down his opponents. He is learning to control his strength by channeling his anger. Of course, it is hard to see his true growth as Naruto's superior speed allows him to evade all of Superboy's attacks and counters. Then again, Naruto faces the same problem because all of his physical attacks are useless against Superboy's steel-like body. Naruto prefers joint locks and throws, but Superboy's superior strength allows him to quickly break free of joint locks and the throws do no damage to the clone. The two make for perfect sparring partners as it comes down to a battle of stamina to determine a winner. And a stamina battle between those two can last hours as she witnessed. Am I late? Megan flies over to Superboy and Naruto. Superboy sniffs the air looking at Megan curiously. A blush heats her cheeks. I was trying out a couple new recipes. Yo, I am ready to learn teacher. Wally speeds into the room stopping in front of Canary. He gives the older woman a wink. Your number one student is here. Yeah right, smirks Robin. Calder greets his teammates, it is good to see you all again. Now that everyone is here we can begin team training. Canary types into the console. Suddenly the room changes into an exact image of Star City. Large holographic buildings, cars, and other objects fill the room placing them in the middle of the city. Naruto stares at a car next to him with a critical eye. 
There is something about this makes it seem like it is more than a hologram. Reaching out, he touches the car to find it quite solid. Robin smirks, it is the latest in light bending technology. The objects are made solid. It is like creating something from nothing. No jutsu I know can do that, thinks Naruto in awe. Canary hits a couple more buttons and the streets fill with holographic people. The point of this team is to perform covert operations. As successful as your missions have been, you have failed to maintain cover on both missions. Naruto raises an eyebrow. Well, almost all of you have failed to be covert. It is a moot point because you succeed and fail as a team not as individuals, states Canary. He decides to hold his tongue not needing to point out that the missions succeeded due to him. The point of this exercise will be to retrieve several items while avoiding being spotted by civilians. With each item you retrieve the difficulty will rise. August 3rd, 7 p.m., good work, praises Canary. The team looks a little beat up, but had managed to pass the final team training test. She checks the time to see it is late. Okay, that will be enough for today. I will come back in two days and we will continue team training. A groan comes from Wally. I am taking a long shower. Wally pulls out his last chocolate bar and begins to munch on it. Hey Megan, want to go out tomorrow? I have some new recipes I want to try tomorrow. You are welcome to help out, offers Megan. On second thought, I have to get ready for school, it starts next week. Megan gains a jealous expression. You are so lucky. I wish I could go to school. Robin and Wally look at her as if she grew a second head. Naruto turns away from the group. He is planning to get a snack before heading for some nighttime training. There are a couple jutsu he wants to work on. Naruto, if you don't mind, I have a question on your powers. Calder walks over to the younger boy. The ninja pauses before turning to face Calder. A nod is given to let Calder know he can ask. Calder sends Megan a grateful look for establishing a mental link between the two. You are able to manipulate fire, wind, and earth. Are you able to manipulate any other elements? All elements, answers Naruto. Even water? Yes. Calder gains a pensive expression. I would like to test my own abilities against yours one day. My home, Atlantis, is known for its sorcery abilities using water. Though I did end my training prematurely when I became Aquaman's apprentice. I have never heard of Atlantis. It is an underwater kingdom, smiles Aqualad. A kingdom that is underwater, Naruto would like to see that. Show me this Atlantis one day and I will show you my skills in water jutsu, says Naruto. Aqualad smiles in amusement. It is a deal. Naruto throws up a wave before heading to the Zeta tubes. It is time to head home. August 7th Megan watches as Naruto and Superboy spar with each other. At first, she was worried that the two were going to take it out of hand. There was a good reason for that. Superboy entered the kitchen to find Naruto sitting on the couch eating a bowl of rice. Naruto is watching the news as usual. Let's go to the training room. I am bored, says Superboy. Naruto calmly takes a bite from his rice. He came to the cave to train and eat lunch with Megan. She asked him to try a couple of her new recipes. The former missing ninja is not one to turn down a free meal. Okay, nods the ninja. Naruto is getting better at understanding the English language, but still has trouble speaking it. Can't we just sit down and eat? Megan's voice trails off as the two boys left the room. Using her telekinetic powers to turn the oven and stove off, she flies after the two hoping to end the fight before it starts. Naruto and Superboy ignored her the entire way to the training room. Once the two reached the simulator, Superboy activated the basic sparring program where a point would be awarded for each takedown. An hour later the two were still fighting. Megan sighs as she continues to watch the two. Her worries disappeared after the first ten minutes. Despite the rather brutal way the two were fighting, she can sense that there is no real anger between the two. Okay so she may have used her telepathy to scan their surface thoughts just to be sure. A loud thud hits the ground. Superboy stars at the ceiling in anger before rising to his feet. The clone stares at the score to see it is 22 to 0 in Naruto's favor. He knows that it is a spar and the two are not using the true extent of their abilities, but he hates losing especially in a fight. Megan speaks up, are you two getting tired? The two look at each other. No, they reply. How about we go to the beach and relax, I'll contact the others. Megan flies over to the console to send a message to Calder, Wally, and Robin. 
Superboy and Naruto share a glance. Reluctantly, the two stand down knowing that Megan is not going to let the matter drop. Okay I sent them all a message. I am sure that they will come. Now we need to get on our swimsuits. Megan closes her eyes. Her clothes begin to vanish forming into a yellow bikini top with matching shorts. How do I look? She strikes a pose with her hands on her hips. Nice. Pretty. A blush burns Megan's cheeks at Naruto's comment. Superboy raises an eyebrow at Naruto's comment. Naruto stands there not feeling any shame in telling the truth. He knows that Superboy is thinking the same thing. It is obvious to see Superboy checking her out as much as the ninja. Ocean blue eyes discreetly run up Megan's long green legs, flat stomach, and cleavage. It makes the ninja wonder though if that is Megan's true body or just a form she shape shifted into. She is 15 years old. Not many 15 years old have such well-defined curves meaning that in order to be more appealing she could have fixed any small flaws so to speak. Honestly though, he could care less. Thanks, blushes Megan. Recognized Robin, B01. Recognized Aqualad, B02. In dual beams of light, Robin and Aqualad appear. Yo, waves Robin in civilian clothes. Hello, Wally won't be able to make it, says Calder. Laughter erupts from Robin. School started for him today, chuckles Robin. He is going to be so bummed out when he finds out we went to the beach without him. Well, since we are all here let's get going, beams Megan. Superboy folds his arms across his chest. I don't have a swimsuit. Calder smile, I have that covered. Beach, it is such a beautiful day, smiles Megan. Robin raises his hand. Wait a moment. Let's take a second to remember our fallen comrade. He lowers his head in dramatic fashion. Megan nods in agreement. Poor Wally. Naruto does have to admit that it is a beautiful day out. Perhaps Megan had the right idea. It is a good time to relax and enjoy a short break. Even the strongest of ninja need a break from missions and training to recharge. He walks away from the group finding a nice spot in the sand to lay down. Closing his eyes, he enjoys the moment. Megan goes to call out to Naruto, but Calder places a hand on her shoulder. Leave him, he is enjoying the beach in his own way, reassures Calder. Megan gains a look of understanding. Time to go hit the waves, cheers Robin, August 7th, 8pm. Naruto walks towards the meeting area with Superboy. The two have both changed into mission clothes, or in Superboy's case, his regular outfit. A feminine scent that Naruto doesn't recognize hits his nostrils. He keeps a calm expression trying to recall the scent but nothing comes to mind. Entering the main room, the others are all waiting. Miss Martian, Robin, and Aqualad are facing a new girl that is standing next to Green Arrow. She is a pretty girl with long blonde hair, olive tan skin, and dark gray eyes. Her long blonde hair is tied back in a ponytail. The girl's uniform is a midriff-bearing costume that highlighted her build. It is colored in various shades of green and consisted of a mask extending from the hairline to the cheekbones, a sleeveless top with a stylized arrow tip on the front, fingerless gloves, pants with black knee pads, and black combat boots. She has a black utility belt and pouch strapped on her left leg that were likely filled with assorted tools. Naruto, Superboy, come meet the newest member of the team. It is Green Arrow's newest sidekick. Artemis, smiles Miss Martian. Superboy glances at Naruto. Ever met her? Naruto shrugs, nope. Adding another member of the team doesn't sit well with him. There are six members on the team already. The larger the team the harder it is to move in the shadows. At this rate the team is going to have too many members on it to perform any type of covert mission. Aqualad watches the body language between Superboy and Naruto. It makes him smile knowing that Naruto and Superboy are getting along so well that the two can have a conversation non-verbally and without a mental link. Recognized B03, Kid Flash, in a flash of light Wally enters the base. The wall man is here. Wally slips falling face forward dropping the beach ball. It bounces past an unamused Batman. Wally looks up to see everyone looking at him. Wallman huh? Great name, smirks Artemis. Wally stands up and looks at Robin. Who is this? Artemis, your new teammate. She is my new protege, says Green Arrow placing a hand on her shoulder. What happened to your old one? Recognized Speedy, B04. Entering into the base is the former sidekick of Green Arrow. 
For one he no longer goes by the name Speedy. A handsome boy dressed in a red and black uniform walks forward. Green Arrow is surprised. It has been a month since he last saw his protege, Speedy you look. Replaceable. And the name is Red Arrow, Glare's Red. Does she even know how to use that thing? Yes, she does, Glare's Artemis. We still want you on the team. We have no quota on archers, says Aqualand. And if we did, you know who we would pick, smirks Wally. Artemis rolls her eyes, whatever Baywatch, I am here to stay. Aqualad decides to change the subject, you came to us for a reason. Dr. Sterling Roquette, answers Red Arrow. Robin quickly types up the name bringing up multiple information on the woman. She is one of the leading researchers in nanotech, went missing two weeks ago. Kidnapped by the League of Shadows two weeks ago. Wally's eyes light up. You want us to rescue her from the shadows? Score, Robin and Wally bump fists. Red Arrow reaches into his pouch pulling out a small device. I already rescued her, but not before she was forced to create a device for them. A new image appears. It is a robotic looking bug. It is known as the fog. Thousands of nanobugs that can destroy everything in sight. The real power behind the nanobugs is their ability to store data. They infiltrate computer files stealing all the data giving the shadows information. That can be used for extortion, money laundry, blackmail. Yeah it sounds like the shadows, says Artemis. Like you know anything about the shadows, scoffs Wally. Artemis sends him a wise smirk, who are you? Right now she is stored at a local high school where she is safe. Green Arrow steps forward, then let us keep her that way. Us? What about your new protege? glares red arrow batman places a hand on green arrow's shoulder green arrow gets the silent message you brought this to the team so it is her mission now too fine then i am done red arrow heads towards the exit recognized speedy the computer is interrupted update red arrow b04 those are his last words before the zeta beams teleport him away you have your mission head out orders batman Aqualad confirms the coordinates. Coordinates received, move out team. Happy Harbor 11.59 p.m. Miss Martian link us up. We don't want the shadows intercepting our communications, orders Aqualad. Miss Martian concentrates on every single member of the team. It takes about two seconds to connect everyone's mind. Done, everyone is connected. Great, on top of having to work on a prehistoric computer now I have team think in my head grumbles a very annoyed Dr. Sterling Roquette. She is a pretty woman with shoulder-length blonde hair and baby blue eyes. Dr. Roquette wears a white coat over an emerald green shirt and black capris. Kid takes a bite of his chocolate bar. Lady do you always complain to those that are trying to protect you? Artemis is sitting on the desk next to Dr. Roquette. She glances between Kid and Dr. Roquette. Pot, kettle, have you two met? I don't want to hear any lip from the one that drove Red Arrow from the team, glares kid. That is so not my fault. Dr. Roquette grits her teeth before gesturing at the computer. Fate of the world at stake. Naruto is sitting on the roof with a bored expression. Fate of the world. That is an over-exaggeration. This woman thinks too much of her technology. He doesn't worry about his thoughts being heard by the others as he knows how to block the mental link. Years with Kurama taught him multiple ways to block mental intrusions. Sometimes he wanted to have a private conversation without Kurama voicing his two yen so he learned to block out the demon that resided within him. Using that same skill he blocks Miss Martian's powers from relaying everything that goes on in his head. How about I help Miss Martian and Superboy on the perimeter? Artemis stands up leaving out of the room. Good idea, agrees Aqualad. He walks over towards the doctor. The virus won't be much help to us if we can't locate the weapon. Do you have a way to track it? It is not a weapon it is science, brilliant science. She smiles proud of her creation. And of course I can track it, but I would have to go online. Might as well put a sign ASSSASSINATEME in neon lights above my head. Aqualad places a hand on her shoulder. Dr. Roquette looks up at him. The young man gives the doctor a reassuring smile. We will protect you. Nodding, she goes online tracking the fog. Outside the school, Miss Martian is at the front gates with Artemis. A light thud makes the two girls turn around. Superboy walks past them. Im, that boy, smirks Artemis. 
Superboy turns his head to look at Artemis. The archer stars at him not ashamed that he heard her thoughts. He can hear you, we can all hear you, frowns Miss Martian. Oh, I know, smirks Artemis. Miss Martian we are tracking the fog. I need you to reconfigure the bio ship so that Robin, Superboy, and Kid can fly it, orders Aqualad. On it. The bio ship breaks camouflage landing in front of the school. Kid is first one to arrive giving Megan a flirtatious wink. Later Megalicious don't miss me too much. The speedster sends a glare at Artemis before running aboard the ship. Superboy and Robin soon board the ship. Flying off, the bio ship soon disappears into the night. Megan waits until the mental link with Superboy vanishes before turning to face Artemis. You embarrassed Superboy back there. I didn't hear him complain. Must you challenge everyone? Where I am from that is how you survive, responds Artemis. Megan frowns at the girl. The two girls are too busy arguing with each other that neither notices a figure leap over the fence. That figure heads straight towards the school. Break Cheshire hides in the bushes. Happy Harbor is a place she never heard of until this night. It is such a stupid name, but that doesn't matter at the moment. She received orders to kill Dr. Sterling Roquette who is currently tracking the fog from somewhere inside this local high school. A strange place to hide considering that the school is so large, there are over a dozen ways to sneak inside. The school was a poor choice to defend the doctor. Her eyes land upon a green skilled girl, a blonde, and a handsome young man walking the perimeter. That explains the poor decision to use the school as a base. Children are protecting the woman. This job will be easier than she originally thought. A sound makes her tense. Cheshire looks into the sky to see an alien ship appear out of thin air. It lands in front of the school. Her eyes narrow upon a fast moving blur that turns out to be Flash's sidekick, Kid Flash. Kid Flash runs aboard the ship, followed by the handsome boy from before and Batman's sidekick Robin. The ship soon takes off into the distance. Now they are making it much too easy, smirks Cheshire. The green skinned girl and blonde begin to argue, leaving a wide opening for Cheshire. Running towards the fence, she displays amazing acrobatic abilities by leaping to the top of the fence and landing on it with grace before leaping to the ground. Cheshire is about to enter the school when shadows from above make her slide backwards. The shadow turns out to be shuriken that embed in the ground where she had been standing. Danger fills her sense and she spins around with arms raised. A punch slams into her arms. The power behind it sends her flying through the air. She twists around landing on her feet and skidding backwards several more feet. Cheshire's eyes narrow upon her opponent. A boy several years younger than her stands across from her with a blank expression. She has to admit that he is very handsome. Not as muscular as the other boy, but definitely better looking. He has a handsome face with bright ocean blue eyes and spiky golden blonde hair. The boy wore a green flak vest over a long sleeve black shirt, fingerless iron clad blue gloves, white pants that were wrapped up at the shins, and open toe black ninja sandals. I am impressed you managed to see me, smirks Cheshire. I was sure you were on the other side of the roof before I made my move. English, not first, language, replies Naruto. Pity, I do enjoy a bit of banter. Cheshire launches a barrage of shuriken. In a movement almost too fast for her to follow, he draws a kanai and deflects the shuriken with ease. The shuriken served their purpose in distracting him. She comes in on his right side with Sei poised to plunge into his skin. He catches her left wrist before blocking the right side with his kanai. Fast, thinks Cheshire. A kick hits her in the stomach launching her backwards. She twists around once again landing on her feet. Strong too. Over here. Artemis comes around the corner notching an arrow. I got her. Change of plans. Cheshire drops a pellet on the ground. Black smoke erupts as Artemis shoots her arrow. She got away, curses Artemis. Naruto turns around preparing to head back to his post. Our location is compromised. We should head to a new location, he reports over the mental link. Agreed. Everyone prepare to move out. Aqualad pauses an incoming transmission comes in from Robin. Robin to Aqualad. We are in Philadelphia and at Star Labs. It is completely destroyed. Star Labs is cutting edge technology and now it is in the hands of the enemy. What is our next move? Aqualad gains a hard look. We rescan for the fog. Break Dr. Roquette sits at the computer typing away. Her eyes drift over to the person that is standing guard. 
The youngest member of the team that stayed behind to protect her is the one standing guard. He is leaning against the wall staring up at the ceiling. Out of all the members on the team he is the one that acts as if he wants nothing to do with protecting her. Aqualad promised to protect her, but she is not so sure that the kid with her will risk his life to keep that promise. Naruto has a bored expression on his face. Bodyguard missions used to be his bread and butter back in the elemental nations. He has more experience than the rest of the team can imagine. Of course, he didn't succeed in all his missions. He tried his best but he did lose two clients. In his defense the clients were killed by junin level ninjas that Naruto couldn't beat at the time. Had it happened later on after he developed the Sharingan the result might have turned out differently. No guarantee, but he is confident that with the Sharingan he is on the same level as any junin. He did manage to kill several members of the Akatsuki, ninja that were borderline cage level. The difference is that I had Kurama too. A ninja never overestimates his ability. The truth is that he never would have defeated those Akatsuki ninja without Kurama. And without the demon he lost the ability to spam high level jutsu. His chakra has been cut down from cage to chunin level. On the plus side his chunin level chakra control is at junin level. Even in the negative there is some positive. He has to focus on the positive in order to grow. The virus is complete. I am uploading it now, smirks Dr. Roquette. Naruto. One of the assassins managed to escape and is heading towards your location. Naruto reaches out catching a shuriken before tossing it back at the source. Out of the shadows emerges Cheshire. You are no fun at all. Cheshire rushes at Naruto. He draws a pair of kanai easily parrying her say. Gritting her teeth, she pulls out all her moves to break his defense. A swift movement knocks both Sai away before a knee buries into her gut. She falls to her knees coughing up blood. Good thing I didn't come alone, smirks Cheshire. A figure bursts out of the shadows behind Dr. Roquette. It never gets close to her when a kick drills into the person's stomach sending them through the building wall. Naruto stares at the newcomer. Clearly female though human is up for debate. She possesses short white spiky hair, putrid green eyes that are slits instead of pupils, and scale-like skin. On skin tight green outfit that reveals her curvaceous form along with gauntlets with metal claws that are dripping with poison. Take him down Copperhead, I'll handle the doctor, orders Cheshire. Futon. Daitopa. Naruto claps his hands together. Fierce gale force winds erupt from his body blasting Cheshire and Copperhead out of the building. The ninja calmly walks through the hole in the wall. Dr. Roquette kneels behind a computer watching in awe. I am going to enjoy drinking his blood, smirks Copperhead. She darts forward at surprising speeds. Naruto draws a kanai blocking her incoming slashes. He is impressed with her speed. This is the fastest opponent he has faced so far. Still, it is not fast enough. Spinning around he kicks Copperhead away before tossing a kanai at Cheshire who tried to sneak past him. Cheshire scowls leaping backwards to avoid the kanai. Copperhead darts forward moving like a snake to attack from various angles. Naruto is unable to keep up with her movements. She gets behind him and sinks her fangs into his throat. Him. Your blood is. Copperhead's eyes widen as mud fills her mouth. Naruto turns into mud. Cheshire gasps as a hand bursts out of the ground grabbing her ankle. She is pulled straight down into the ground up to her neck. Naruto bursts out the ground behind the buried Cheshire. He stares at Copperhead. Surrender, you should, he speaks in broken English. Copperhead flicks her tongue ready to keep on fighting. She freezes up as she picks up on several new scents heading towards them. Another time hero. Next time we meet I will drain you dry, smirks the woman. She takes off running disappearing into the night. Naruto looks down at the struggling Cheshire. A kick to the head knocks her out cold. Copperhead, she had skill. He almost had to use his Sharingan to keep up with her. Good thing that he created that mud clone earlier. It allowed him to make a switch before Copperhead was able to poison him with her fangs. The way she fought was unlike any he ever encountered. Almost like wrestling with a snake. Next time he will be better prepared. You saved me, says Dr. Roquette. English, not my language, replies Naruto. Roquette flushes in embarrassment. This whole time she thought he was cold and uncaring but the truth was that he didn't speak to her because he didn't speak English well. Naruto. Megan flies over to him landing on the ground. Are you okay? Naruto raises an eyebrow. 
Megan looks over to see the assassin from earlier buried in the ground. A smile appears on her face. I guess I worried for no reason at all. You managed to capture her, good work, praises Aquilad. He turns to face Dr. Roquette. Robin managed to upload the virus destroying the fog. Artemis walks over to the unconscious Cheshire. She reaches down removing the mask. Her eyes widen in horror. Jade? Naruto catches the look Artemis gives upon seeing Cheshire's true identity. He files it away for later. Could you tell him I said thank you? asks Dr. Roquette. Megan smiles, I already did. Naruto looks at Dr. Roquette. You, welcome. He is still working on his English, explains Miss Martian. Red Tornado contacted the local authorities. They are going to take care of the assassins. We will take Dr. Roquette back to the cave where she can use the Zeta tube to head back home, says Aqualad. Artemis you did good work today. Welcome to the team. Artemis looks away trying not to stare at the unconscious Jade. Miss Martian approaches Artemis. It is great to finally have another girl on the team. A small smile forms on Artemis's face. Mount Justice. Took down the League of Shadows, smirks kid. Robin smirks and the two friends bump fists. Naruto ignores the two. He glances at Aqualad. Ocean blue eyes harden. Megan, please link me with Aqualad. Megan looks at Naruto curiously. She nods doing as he asked. Link established, says Megan. Calder looks at Megan in confusion upon hearing her voice in his head. Naruto walks over to Aqualad. Aqualad, I did not approve of the team assignments on this mission. Superboy speaks up. Are you two having a mental conversation? The clone frowns not liking that one bit. Megan looks at Naruto in worry. The ninja gives a nod to the Martian girl. She smiles gratefully before connecting everyone's mind. As I was saying, I did not approve of the team assignments on this mission, starts Naruto. Wally speaks up with an annoyed look. Calder is the team. Silence Wally, orders Calder. Naruto has the right to voice his opinion like everyone else on the team. Please continue. Naruto gains a bit more respect for Aqualad. Superboy should have stayed behind to protect Dr. Roquette and Artemis should have been sent on the team to hunt down the fog. Superboy and Artemis look at Naruto not understanding why their placement upset him. Superboy's invulnerability makes him ideal for taking blows that would kill a normal person. It makes him the ideal shield. Artemis has long-range capabilities that would have allowed her to take out the person controlling the fog from a distance possibly preventing damage to Wayne Tech. She could have even used her explosive arrows to possibly destroy the fog if the virus failed. A silence fills the room. He does have a point, agrees Robin. Superboy is the perfect shield. None of the assassins you all fought had the power to harm him. But there is no way Calder could have known what assassins were coming, argues Kid. Which is even more of a reason that I should have had Superboy stay behind to act as a shield. If someone with super strength and invulnerability had been sent Superboy would have been the ideal person to take them on while we fell back to protect the doctor, admits Calder. And I was worried about Artemis being a rookie that I kept her close instead of putting her where she could have been utilized most. Calder lowers his head. Naruto is right. I made a poor call on the team assignments. Superboy frowns. Why bring this up now? The mission is over and we completed it. I wasn't going to start an argument during a mission, and I didn't bring this up to try to oust Aqualad as leader. Naruto stares straight at Aqualad. I brought this up in order to help future missions. He turns heading towards the Zeta tubes. In a flash of light Naruto is gone. That guy really gets under my skin, huffs Wally. Calder gains a small smile. He is looking out for us in his own way. If he truly didn't care then he wouldn't have said anything at all. Megan smiles, do you think he will ever see us as more than a team? In time, I have no doubts. Once again our plans have been thwarted by the young heroes, says L1. L2 speaks up activating a video screen that depicts one of the young heroes. It seems the one responsible for the majority of thwarting our plans is this one. According to our inside source his name is Naruto Uzumaki. He has no code name. The screen zooms in on Naruto. Another screen portrays Naruto's battle with Amazo. Such skill and abilities, he fights like an assassin, speaks L4. Do we know anything else on him? Other than he has the ability to manipulate the elements we know nothing about him, says L3. That is not entirely true, says L2. 
I believe that this young hero is the recent hero that popped up in Tokyo several months ago. He does fit the description minus a few details. L1 gains an interested tone. That would mean he has no mentor to guide him. Perhaps the light can offer him a better career path. August 16th A ringing sound causes Higurashi to look up from the counter. The 50-year-old man watches as a kid enters into his shop. It is a kid that he recognizes from previous visits. Higurashi raises an eyebrow before speaking a gruff manner. Come back for more kanai and shuriken? No, I have come searching for a katana. Higurashi would usually scowl and go back to reading if any other customer said that to him. Most people these days come into his store looking for something cool. Tourists come in all the time not knowing the history or value of the weapons he sells. No appreciation for the blood and sweat that he pours into making each weapon. He grew so tired of seeing his weapons fall into the hands of fools that he stopped putting out most of true weapons. Almost all of the weapons on display and for sale are imitations he created to act as decorations. The fools that buy them especially those wannabe Yakuza brats have no idea that the weapons they purchase are mere rip-offs. He doesn't feel the least bit guilty selling such weapons. The true crime would be allowing his masterpieces to gather dust or be used improperly. Better they stay with him than in the hands of those that can't appreciate true works of art. This child is no tourist or fool. No, this kid has an eye. First time the brat entered the store he looked around before approaching the counter. Higurashi was shocked that the kid asked him if he sold any true weapons. Naruto stares at Higurashi. I am looking for real weapons, do you sell any? Got a problem with my store brat? These decorations are useless to me. I wish to purchase true steel not cheap imitations, replies Naruto. A child with a true appreciation for the art of weapon making. It almost made him cry in joy that there is hope for the future generations. Over here. Higurashi walks over to the wall at the right side of the store. Dozens of swords of various sizes are mounted on the wall. Under these swords is a sign that reads displays, not real swords. It is humorous to see people glance at the sign and walk away from the swords without even inspecting them. I recommend a smaller sized katana due to your size, states the blacksmith. Hum, Naruto examines the weapons. I don't have the money to buy one at the moment. We can work out a payment plan. Just choose the one you like, smirks Higurashi. A nod comes from Naruto. Naruto reaches out grabbing a katana with a black hilt and a teardrop shaped guard. The blade is 42 inches long with a wavy design that gleams in the light. Testing the weight and balance first, he makes sure that he enjoys the feel of the blade. Once he is acquainted with the weight and balance he takes a few steps back before placing a second hand on the hilt. In a smooth motion he swings the sword in a downward slash then twists his hands making a thrust. Naruto releases the hilt with his left hand reaching up to catch a black sheath. A good choice. The sword costs 100,000 yen. Make payments of 2,000 yen a month and it is yours. Placing the sheath on his waist, Naruto expertly sheathes the sword with a light click. He reaches into his pouch and pulls out 5,000 yen. I will be back next month to make another payment, says Naruto. Higurashi smirks, I'll have some more kanai and shuriken ready for you by then. Thank you. A chuckle comes from the clerk. The brat has good taste, smirks Higurashi. August 18th, 7.06 pm, initiate combat training, Calder and Superboy begin to circle each other. Superboy smirks ready to test out a few new moves. Begin in 3, 2, 1, start. The two charge at each other. Calder throws a couple punches that Superboy dodges. Megan, Artemis, and Wally are watching the two spar. Wally is barely paying attention as he munches on a banana with barely any decency. Artemis and Megan both have their eyes locked onto the shirtless Superboy. Both girls enjoy the view of his muscles. Calder is nice. You and him would make a great couple, suggests Artemis. Calder? He is like an older brother. Megan smiles as she glances at Wally. I think you and Wally would make the cutest couple. You are so vibrant and full of life and Wally is so full. Of it, smirks Artemis. Laughter comes from the two girls. A new voice makes both girls jump in surprise. Who, next? Naruto stands on Artemis's left watching the spar. Artemis is shocked. She never noticed him until he spoke. When did he get there? How long was he there for? Naruto. When did you get here? asks Megan. 
Five minutes ago. Megan is stunned by that answer. How did she not notice him for five minutes? It really does scare her that he is able to sneak up on her like that. No one is next. Superboy and Calder are sparring since we haven't had a mission in a while, answers Megan. Do you two always have to speak telepathically? frowns Artemis in annoyance. Sorry, Megan opens a link with Artemis. Naruto still has trouble talking in English. He can understand it, but it is hard for him to string words together. Canary has been so busy with the league she hasn't had much time to teach him lately. Artemis does feel a bit bad for getting upset. It is not his fault that English isn't his first language. Still, telepathy is not her favorite way to communicate. She doesn't realize that Naruto and Megan hear her thoughts. Megan changes it so that Artemis can think without portraying her thoughts over the mental link. Did you want to spar next? I am thinking about it, replies Naruto. Megan cuts the link as Naruto walks around the training area to go check out the computer. Is it just me or are you too close? asks Artemis with a slight gleam. A blush starts to heat Megan's cheeks. It isn't like that, she waves her arms frantically. I am just the first person that Naruto could communicate with. I am his link to the others so it is only natural we are close. Artemis smirks, if you say so. She takes a good look at Naruto. I have to admit that he is pretty cute. I do like the blonde hair. Megan takes a good look at Naruto. It is true that he is handsome. Superboy has a more rugged handsome and Naruto has a more preppy handsome look. I guess he is pretty handsome, admits Megan. Calder is slammed to the ground interrupting the rest of the conversation. I learned that one from Canary, smirks Superboy. Superboy extends his hand helping Calder up. Training simulation over. Red tornado flies down from above. The robot lands on the ground planning to go about its own business. Hey, Wally runs in front of Red Tornado. Do you happen to have a mission for us? Mission details are Batman's area. True, but the Batman is out with the Robin doing the dynamic duo. So we thought you could help us out. If you are not busy, smirks Wally. Calder steps forward speaking in a more respectful tone, if we can be of help. Red Tornado begins to type opening up a large screen. On that screen it portrays an old man in a suit with a cane. This is Kent Nelson, he is 106 years old. Wally nudges Artemis, doesn't look a day over 90. He chuckles at his own joke. Artemis ignores the speedster. Kent Nelson was a charter member of the Justice Society a precursor to your mentor's Justice League, explains Red Tornado. The image changes to reveal a man in blue and gold tights with matching cape and helmet. Calder recognizes that image immediately. Of course, Nelson was Earth's Sorcerer Supreme. He was Dr. Fate. A snort comes from Wally. He leans over to Artemis. More like Dr. Fake. Guy knows a little advanced science and Dumbledore it up to magic, says Wally. Kent could be on one of his walkabouts but he is the holder of the Helmet of Fate. It is unwise to leave such power unguarded, says Red Tornado. He is like the great priests and priestess of Mars. I would be honored to help him, says Megan. Me too. Magic totally rocks, smirks Wally. Artemis rolls her eyes. The speedster walks over to Megan with a flirtatious smile. What are the chances we are both so into the mystic arts? Red Tornado hands Calder a golden key. Take this, use it to unlock the Tower of Fate. You will need to take a leap of faith. Magic. Naruto gains a curious expression. What is magic? He never heard of that word. Perhaps it is a source of power like chakra. He decides to join the team on this mission. He wants to learn more about this magic. Bioship Artemis glances over at Wally. So Wally, when did you start believing in magic? Wally leans back in his seat with a wise smirk. I have always been into the mystic arts. He glances over at Megan as he continues to lie out of his ass. Before coming Kid Flash, I seriously considered a career in magic, lies Wally. Naruto barely understands the speedster, but he is able to detect that everything that Wally is saying is a complete lie. Then again, most of the time Wally talks it is a lie or made up story. Wally spends so much time trying to impress Megan that it is a miracle that the speedster survived any of the missions. A clown like that would have died on a D rank mission in the ninja world. We are here, says Megan. The bio ship stays in camouflage mode as it lands in the middle of a park. Immediately the team spreads out to find the Tower of Fate. Naruto can sense a strange power in the atmosphere. 
He walks around the park at a leisurely pace trying to find the source of the power. Upon reaching the center of the park he pauses. Confusion fills him. There is something here but he can't see it at all. You will need to take a leap of faith, says Red Tornado. The ninja gains a pensive expression. Suddenly, an idea comes to him. How does one hide a tower in plain sight? Genjutsu. Chakra begins to flow to his eyes. Ocean blue eyes bleed red. The world becomes much clearer. Sharingan spins around piercing through the air. Slowly an image forms in front of Naruto. In front of him is the Tower of Fate or at least an outline of the tower. Whatever power is hiding the tower is very strong. Even his fully matured Sharingan can't fully pierce the illusion. Wally frowns, I don't see anything. What do you think? Highly advanced microelectric phase shifting technology, suggest Artemis. A surprised expression appears on Wally's face. He never expected Artemis to know so much when it came to advanced science. It impresses him. Totally, Megan comes walking up behind him. Not, clearly it is mystic powers at work, finishes Wally. Artemis scowls. It is here. Megan turns to look at Naruto. Naruto found it. She flies over to him. The rest of the team gathers around Naruto. Um, where is it? asks Wally. It is hidden under a strong illusion, says Naruto to Megan. Naruto says that it is under an illusion. Wally scoffs, come on. The guy is clearly not right in the head. Calder steps forward offering Naruto the key. Can you see the door? Naruto takes the key and turns around. The ninja thrusts the key forward into an invisible hole. A turn to the right and an unlocking sound fills the air. Suddenly, the Tower of Fate materializes in front of the team. Behind the team, the air shimmers to reveal a tied-up Kent Nelson with two other individuals. The boy holding the cat looks at the man with the wand. Hey Abracadabra, aren't you using adaptive microelectric phase shifting technology? Abra grumbles, yes, the team enters into the Tower of Fate. Upon entering the tower the door behind them vanishes. Hey where did the door go? Frowns Superboy. A holographic image of Kent Nelson appears in front of the team. You have entered with a key, but the tower doesn't recognize you. Please state your reason for visiting, says Nelson. Wally steps forward desperately trying to impress Megan. We are true believers come here to seek out Dr. Fate. Nelson smirks before his image vanishes. Suddenly, the ground underneath team breaks away making them all fall down a huge hole. At the bottom of the drop is a pool of magma waiting to melt them alive. Megan grabs onto Wally. Artemis draws a crossbow firing it at the cavern wall. The arrow embeds into the wall and she swings around catching Calder. Superboy plummets straight downward before reaching out digging his fingers into the wall. He slides down until his feet dip into the magma burning away his shoes in a second. Ah! Screams Superboy. Superboy pulls and looks down at his feet. Those were my favorite boots. This Nelson guy better be worth it. Where is Naruto? exclaims Aqualad. The team looks around trying to find him. Naruto! yells Megan telepathically. The team winces at the volume. A calm voice replies making everyone relax. I am here. The team looks around trying to find the ninja but are unable to locate him. Above you. All of them look up to see Naruto standing on the side of the cavern as if it were solid ground. Naruto calmly walks down the wall with a bored expression. Okay seriously, how are you doing that? asks Artemis, it is the question on everyone's mind. Naruto leaps off the wall falling down past Megan and Wally before sticking back to the wall. He reaches out grabbing the Martian girl. With ease he pulls her to his body while tossing Wally over towards Artemis. Kanai sail through the air pinning Wally to the cavern wall next to Artemis and Aqualad. Dude, shouts Wally gulping. She couldn't hold you much longer. Extreme heat seems to weaken Megan, says Naruto. Climb on my back. The heat doesn't affect me. Megan gives a grateful nod before hovering up into the air and gently lowering down onto his back. Sweat pours down her face. You are changing the subject. How are you walking on the wall? demands Artemis. Calder interrupts, we can save that question for later. Megan and I physiology is susceptible to extreme heat. If we don't find a way out we won't be able to last much longer. Hello Megan. Megan pants, we never truly answered the question. Naruto looks at her curiously, she starts speaking aloud. 
We have come here on a mission from Red Tornado, to find Kent Nelson and the Helmet of Fate. A platform forms over the magma. Superboy lands on the platform followed by Naruto. He crouches down allowing Megan to climb off his back. Artemis and Calder are the last two to land. Calder touches the platform. This platform should be hot, but it is cool to the touch. Wally walks over towards Megan. Great thinking Megalicious. Enough. Artemis places a hand on Wally's chest and slams him up against the cavern wall. This impress Megan at all costs needs to stop. What I do is none of your business, it is when you almost get us all fried, lying about being a true believer. Megan frowns, Wally you don't believe? The speedster pushes off against the wall. Fine, I don't believe. But magic is the true lie. It is all a bunch of smoke and glass. Everything can be explained through science, states Wally. Wally, I studied for two years at the conservatory for sorcery in Atlantis. Magic is what powers my water bearers, says Calder. Ever heard of bioelectricity? In some primitive cultures fire used to be considered magic, Wally waves his hands. All that can be explained through science. Artemis scowls, you are pretty close-minded for a guy who can break the sound barrier in his sneakers. That is science. I recreated Flash's laboratory experiment and Viola here I am, retorts Wally. Let us test that theory. Calder goes to open the panel. Wait, the backdraft from the lava will roast us alive shouts wally the panel is lifted up and instead of a backdraft of heat a cold breeze followed by snow hits the team it is snow smiles megan do you ever get tired of being wrong smirks artemis one by one the team leaps through the whole landing in a brand new place that is covered in snow there are mountains of snow as far as the eye can see artemis wise smirk at wally wally scowls before explaining the situation ever heard of string theory this is a pocket dimension. Artemis rolls her eyes. Naruto watches as the hole between the two places closes up leaving them trapped in this new world. He has never encountered anything like this magic. This is not an illusion. Somehow all of them were taken from one area and instantly taken to a new location. It reminds him of those space-time jutsu that Kurama told him about. Or a summoning jutsu. He wanted to learn about this magic and possibly recreate the abilities of magic through jutsu. What is that? Megan points ahead. Up ahead is a black cane with a golden handle. Ooh, maybe it is Nelson's wand, says Wally sarcastically. Artemis walks forward and reaches out to grab the cane. Wally speeds forward. The two grab the cane at the same time. I got it, says Artemis, Wally. I can't let go. The cane lifts the two into the air. In a burst of magic, the two vanish along with the cane. Grabbing an object that has its own power source. Idiots, thinks Naruto. Superboy doesn't know it, but he has the same thoughts as Naruto. Megan shakes her head. Do you think Wally will believe in magic after that? Wally uses science to understand things that are out of his control. To admit that magic exists would be to let go of that control. Give him time, I am sure he will come around eventually, explains Calder. I see, says Megan. Naruto points ahead. On top of one of the snowbanks is a doorway. The team heads towards the doorway. A gasp escapes the team as the doorway drops them into a new area. Calder and Superboy slam face first into the ground. Naruto twists around landing with grace. Megan hovers down touching lightly on her feet. The team is now in a giant labyrinth that has stairs that lead upside, sideways, and downward. These friends of yours? Says an older voice. Naruto turns to see Kent Nelson a short distance away with Artemis and Wally. Get them. Everyone turns to see Clarion the Witch Boy and Abra Kadabra. Kadabra lifts up his wand, launching several bolts of lightning at the team. Naruto dodges to the side. Calder screams out in pain as a bolt strikes him and forms a barrier that electrocutes him every time he moves. Friends of yours? Wally uses his speed to dodge several bolts. Kent flies into the air heading straight towards the bell. Landing next to the bell, Kent taps it with his cane making a large gong fill the area. The old wizard steps through the bell. Clarion follows flying straight into the bell. Wally go after Nelson, shouts Artemis. Wally speeds straight into the bell vanishing like Nelson and Clarion. A bolt of lightning strikes Artemis trapping her like Calder. Megan lifts Kadabra into the air with her telekinetic powers. 
Kadabra vanishes into thin air shocking the Martian girl. Behind you, Superboy leaps at Kadabra who reappears behind Megan. The villain points his wand at Superboy striking him with a bolt of lightning. A scream of pain comes from Superboy as he is electrocuted and trapped like Artemis and Calder. Superboy. Her moment of distraction allows Kadabra to strike her with a bolt of lightning. She is soon on the ground trapped in a cage of lightning like the others. Pathetic, smirks Kadabra. A kanai sails through the air slicing through Kadabra's wand. What? The wand clatters to the ground in two pieces. Naruto lands in front of the shocked wizard. Jumping up to deliver a spin kick, Kadabra hits the ground knocked out cold. The lightning cages trapping his team disappear with the destruction of the wand. Thanks, says Calder, we need to help Wally and Nelson. The ninja places a palm on the bell, it is solid as a rock. Naruto wishes he knew more about magic. Magic seems to be even more versatile than his own jutsu. How do we get to the idiot? says Artemis tapping on the bell. I can't open a link to his mind, frowns Megan. Calder dusts off his pants, we will have to leave it to Wally then. Tokyo. 1 p.m. in a flash of light Naruto appears in an alley, going from midnight to day is a huge change that might throw of the sleep schedule of most individuals. Naruto is not a normal person by any stretch. He moves with incredible speed going straight up a building. Touching down on the roof, he begins to leap from building to building. The mission to find Kent Nelson and the Helmet of Fate was a success. Wally retrieved the Helmet of Fate before Clarion the Witch Boy could steal it. In the process though Kent Nelson passed away. Naruto didn't focus on that part. Nelson was 106 years old meaning he lived longer than most people. As a missing ninja he encountered death all the time so he was used to it. Speaking of death, he landed on the roof and swung his arm tossing several shuriken. Gunshots fill the air as the shuriken are shot out of the air. I guess the rumors about you were true. A tall slender man with long white hair tied back in a ponytail steps out of the shadows. His armor is primarily black and gray, with goldenrod greaves and gauntlets. He wears a matching goldenrod mask with a black area that obscures the right half of his face, including his missing eye. He wears a utility belt with pouches, and sheaths for a sword and staff on his back. Naruto stands there not making a comment. Oh right, I forgot that you don't speak English. Can you understand me now? You may call me Deathstroke, asks the armored assassin. I understood you fine, I am choosing not to speak. The man chuckles in amusement. Cold-blooded, I like that. There is a high price on your head. Killing you would make me rich, the man points a gun at Naruto. Naruto stands calmly not in the least bit intimidated. Lucky for you I have come with a message. Powerful people have taken an interest in your abilities. They are offering you a chance to work for them. Do so and you will be rewarded with anything that you desire. And should I decline? I will have to carry out my second message. Naruto stares at the assassin. I decline, gunshots fill the air. Deathstroke's eyes narrow as Naruto moves so fast. Spinning around Deathstroke draws a second gun opening fire at Naruto who continues to run circles around the assassin. Shuriken come at Deathstroke from all angles. The guns are knocked out of his hands. In a swift movement Deathstroke draws his sword locking blades with Naruto's kanai. You are good, but not good enough, Deathstroke aims a low kick at Naruto. Naruto slides backwards doing just as Deathstroke wanted. The assassin darts forward ready to make the killing blow. Flipping backwards Naruto kicks the sword upward with his right foot before striking Deathstroke in the chest with his left foot. As he comes back up, he tosses shuriken at Deathstroke. Deathstroke prepares to use his sword to deflect the shuriken. Futon. Repusho. Naruto thrusts his hand forward creating a gale force wind that increases the speed and power of the shuriken. Pain fills Deathstroke as the shuriken slice through his armor cutting up his body. Naruto is about to continue the assault, but a strange sound makes him look down. Three small black devices glow red before exploding. Deathstroke runs toward the edge of the roof. This isn't over. The assassin leaps off the roof activating his jetpack flying off into the distance. The smoke clears to reveal Naruto unharmed. That assassin was good. Definitely not a normal human. Naruto turns around. He continues to leap through Tokyo. Naruto wakes up with an annoyed expression. Kurama would be having his head for being so careless. It is a good thing that the demon isn't here to scold him. 
He sits up glancing around to see hills of sand in every direction. Asai escapes the ninja. Fighting in the sand is so annoying. The stupid stuff gets everywhere and he has to be careful to not get any in his eyes. Afterward it takes him days to get all the sand out of his clothes. Rolling his neck, he stands up and begins to stretch out his limbs. Judging from the position of the sun he has been out for the past seven hours. The mission had started off simple enough, a simple recon mission. The team was sent to Bialia to investigate a strange energy signal that popped up a few days ago. It was a large energy source that the watchtower detected it but was unable to identify. Batman assigned them a mission to locate the energy source and find out as much information on it as possible. Putting the bio ship in camouflage mode, it was too easy to sneak into the isolated country. Absolute radio silence was ordered so upon landing in the county Miss Martian sent up a mental link. This allowed everyone to communicate with each other via telepathy. It was that telepathy that was used against the team. Miss Martian was sent on ahead to infiltrate the enemy's camp. Next thing Naruto knows a foreign mental presence hacks the mental connection. If not for growing up with Kurama he would have never been able to sense the foreign presence. The moment he sensed the foreign presence he used his chakra to send a shock to his brain breaking the mental connection. Unfortunately, it backfired on him causing his body to go into shock and shut down. A good thing he didn't fall into a coma and wake up months later. The ninja double checks all his gear. Naruto unsheathes his sword. This is the first time he will be using the weapon on the mission. He pulls up a mask in order to prevent sand from blowing into his mouth. Nothing worse than sand on the tongue. It is one of the reasons he stayed away from the land of wind. Sand is nice when on a beach, but annoying during a mission. Complete the mission or hunt for my teammates, wonders Naruto. Chances are that the entire team is in danger. Naruto doesn't know what the foreign presence wanted, but chances are it wasn't anything good. Not to brag he is sure that he was the only one that escaped the mental attack. That being said, if the team was captured then it was up to him to complete the mission. Everyone on the team knows the risk of being on the team. These missions are not kid games. Death is a possibility on every mission. If one is not prepared to die then one doesn't need to be coming on the missions. A ninja knows this from day one. You think too much brat. Get on with it already before I die from boredom. A smirks is hidden behind the mask. It has been a long time since he thought about Kurama. The demon always hated when he wasted time overthinking matters. Kurama was a more fight now ask questions later. He misses the demon. I will complete the mission. I'll make my way to the camp, decides Naruto. Channeling chakra to his feet, he runs across the sand not leaving a single footprint. Baila kid slides to a stop. I can't go any further. Artemis climbs out of his arms. Thanks, she says. It looks like he was telling the truth about being Kid Flash despite the change in uniform. Only Kid Flash could move at such speeds. She has to admit that the black uniform looks much better than a bright yellow and red one that he always wears. No problem, smirks Kid. Kid lifts up his arm popping open his secret stash. His eyes widen upon seeing it is empty. It must be over 24 hours or my stash wouldn't be empty. Stash may be empty but at least he is with a hot girl. The blonde girl may have a green arrow fixation, but she is hot. An object comes down from above breaking the two apart. A roar comes from the object revealing itself to be a young man screaming anger. Who is? Kid is grabbed by the arm and spun around a few times before tossed into the side of the hill. Feral Superboy spins around charging at Artemis. Artemis shoots three explosive arrows in a row that do nothing to slow down Superboy. She dives out of the way to avoid being grabbed. What the heck is he? shouts Artemis. Superboy is about to continue the assault when a tank shell strikes him. Roaring in pain, he turns to face the two incoming tanks. He leaps at the new threats. Artemis and Kid watch as their unknown attacker starts to rip apart the tanks. Whose side is he on? Kid picks up Artemis. I don't want to stick around to find out. In a burst of speed he runs in the opposite direction. Baila, I chose the wrong trail to follow. Naruto cleans the blood from his katana before sheathing it. All around him are unconscious or badly injured Baila soldiers. Three jeeps are burning releasing black smoke high into the air. He begins to tie up the soldiers as he thinks about his next move. The original campsite was abandoned, but he was able to pick up various scents. 
The problem was that those scents led in several different directions. So he picked a scent and tracked it. It led him to a small battalion of Baila soldiers. He took them out with little difficult using a fire jutsu to take out the jeeps and heavy artillery before taking on the soldiers. The soldiers are fortunate that heroes don't kill or all of them would be dead. Not killing is a concept he doesn't understand, but as long as he works for the Justice League he will abide by their strange traditions. There would be far less villains in the world if the Justice League permanently silenced their enemies. A familiar scent hits Naruto's nostrils. Tying up the last soldier, he begins to track the scent. It takes him five minutes to find the source. Lying on the ground behind a large rock is Aqualad. Naruto places a hand on Aqualad's neck. Aqualad is barely alive. Another scent hits his nostrils followed by a dozen others. Superboy, sniffs Naruto. Soldiers, at least a dozen of them are with Superboy. He picks up Aqualad and heads in the direction of Superboy. Sounds of fighting soon fill the air. Naruto crouches down watching as Superboy is captured by the Baila soldiers. The soldiers are using strong steel cables to bind Superboy's arms, but the clone is fighting back. A large wave of negative emotions hits Naruto's senses. He turns his head to look as a man wearing a hood steps forward. The man lowers his hood to reveal nasty pale white skin. His brain is visible though a clear dome over it, with some strips of skin over the dome. Three red lines are seen on each cheek. Naruto watches as the man gives a simple command and Superboy stops struggling. Superboy falls face first unconscious. A mental attack. He must have been the one to attack us, thinks Naruto. As much as he desires to complete the mission, he can't let a comrade die. Aqualad is a good leader that treats him fairly. Naruto needs to find the others they will know how to help Aqualad. In a cloud of smoke Naruto and Aqualad vanish. Nighttime Robin ducks under a dune of sand. The GPS marker he planted led him straight to this location. He spots a large machine. That explains why I placed a GPS marker here, thinks Robin. Looking around he notices that the place is deserted. He leaps down landing next to the machine. The moment he touches down on the sand several soldiers burst out of the sand weapons poised at him. The queen wants him alive. A smirk appears on Robin's face as he drops a couple of smoke pellets. Black smoke fills the area blinding the soldiers. Robin expertly moves around in the smoke taking out two soldiers. Spinning around he tosses a couple of bird a rangs knocking the gun out of another soldier. The smoke begins to clear as Robin delivers a spin kick taking out a third solder. Forget this. Open fire. Boy Wonder flips backward to avoid a barrage of bullets. I'll take those. A high speed blur rips the guns out of the seven soldiers' hands. Kid comes to a stop dropping the weapons. Robin smirks upon seeing a familiar face. The two work together in perfect tandem to take down five of the soldiers. Robin is about to attack two more when a telekinetic force sends the two soldiers slamming into each other. That is new. Who is she? wonders Robin looking at Miss Martian. One of the soldier tries to make a run for it. An arrow sails through the air bursting open to shoot a net out capturing the soldier. KF good to see a familiar face, smirks Robin. Hey Robs, smirks kid. The two slap hands. Memory loss? Six months, let's hogtie these guys and compare notes, says Robin. It takes a few minutes to tie up all the soldiers, so anyone know what is going on, asks Robin. She seems to have the answers, kid gestures at Miss Martian. Miss Martian smiles at the team. Well, I don't know exactly what happened to make us lose our memories, but I do know that we are a team. I remember Batman telling me to keep radio silence. He must be our leader, smirks Robin. How do you know it is not my mentor? Kid taps his chest. The moment he touches his uniform it changes to his usual yellow and red. Whoa. The other members of the team begin to tap their chests but nothing happens. Kid keeps tapping his chest. Will you stop touching yourself? Glares Artemis. Kid ignores her outburst. How do we get our memories back? I can connect our minds together and use our memories to piece together everything. The world around them begins to change. It takes them into Miss Martian's mindscape where the team is surrounded by various images. I will have to go into each person's mind. Robin smirks to get information from each perspective right, just do it. Artemis gains a nervous look, you are going to look through all our memories? No, 
just the ones pertaining to the mission in the last six months. Kid comes up beside Artemis taking her hand. Artemis glances at him and he gives her a reassuring smile. Fine, but only the last six months and only what you need, says the archer. Miss Martian nods. The team begins to remember Batman giving them a mission to Baila. It continues on showing them landing in Baila. Superboy placing the marker. Naruto going on ahead to check the perimeter. Aqualad giving out orders and then the world goes black. The team is soon back in the real world with surprised looks. Calder, Naruto, gasps Robin. Forget Naruto, we need to find Calder. Being out in a desert can't be good for a guy with gills, says Kid. We can search for the ninja after we find Calder. Here. All of them spin around to see Naruto carrying Aqualad over his shoulder. Gently, Naruto lowers Aqualad down on the sand. Robin and Kid rush over to Aqualad. He is suffering from extreme dehydration, says Robin. Miss M call the bio ship. It is too far out of range, says Miss Martian. Can you telekinetically fly him to the ship? Suggests Kid, if he doesn't get medical attention soon. Miss Martian shakes her head. I can't, I have to find Superboy. Six months ago he wasn't even alive, he is running on base instincts. Superboy is invulnerable, Calder. A scream comes from Megan as she senses Superboy in pain. Superboy. Miss Martian is about to fly off, but a blow to the back of the head knocks her out cold. She falls forward onto the sand. Robin, Kid, and Artemis look at Naruto in shock. Naruto points at himself. Carry leader, find ship. Robin nods. He begins to track the ship. It is a mile from our current location due east. Naruto picks up Miss Martian before walking over and picking up Aqualad. Lead, orders Naruto. Robin takes off running in that direction. Naruto easily matches the speed even carrying two people. That guy really creeps me out, says Kid. Artemis scowls chasing after the two. Kid shrugs following the team. Bioship Robin stares down at Calder. He is lying on a bed hooked up to an IV. Calder's vital signs are beginning to stabilize. Relaxing, he heads to the pit where Naruto, Kid, and Artemis are waiting. Calder will be fine, says Robin. Great, so now what? Artemis folds her arms across her chest. Do we complete the mission, rescue Superboy, or call in the league? Naruto types rapidly on the console. A screen appears in front of him. He begins to speak in Japanese and his words are instantly translated into English. The enemy have a person that can use psychic powers. He hacked the mental link using it to wipe out the team's memories, explains the ninja. Why do you still have your memories? asks Robin. I sensed the foreign presence and broke the connection. I was unable to alert the team as the mental backlash from forcefully breaking the connection shut down my brain for seven to eight hours, answers Naruto. Kid munches on a chocolate bar, so where does that leave us? Naruto hits a few more buttons bringing up a map of Baila. A red dot blinks on the map. That is the enemy location. Superboy is currently imprisoned by the enemy. We can't leave him in enemy hands or the psychic might steal vital information from his mind. Robin gains a hard look, if they haven't done so already. Okay if we are going to rescue Superboy shouldn't we wake up Miss Martian? I mean she has telepathy powers to battle the psychic, says Kid. She was willing to let Aqualad die in order to save Superboy. Her emotions make her a liability. I do not believe she will help in the mission, states Naruto. Artemis glances at the unconscious Miss Martian. A part of her wants to stand up for the alien girl, but the rational part agrees with Naruto. She blew up at Wally for almost getting them killed while hunting for Kent Nelson and Miss Martian almost did the same thing to Aqualad. He is right. She acted no better than you when we were at the Tower of Fate, says Artemis. Kid gains an affronted look. Yeah but she is, Naruto and Artemis are right. Miss M was about to rush ahead without knowing anything about the enemy. She had her mind wiped once and it could have happened again, says Robin coldly. We will do this without her. What is the plan? We need to take out the psychic, states Naruto. I will cause a distraction forcing the psychic out. Robin will sneak inside to find out the location and status of Superboy. Kid, once I am engaged with the psychic you will be responsible for disarming and taking out the soldiers with your speed. Artemis narrows her eyes, what do I do? Naruto stares straight at Artemis. I won't be able to fight a psychic for long, 
If this psychic is powerful enough to wipe out six months of memory's chances or he will be able to break through any mental defense I am able to create. While Kid is keeping the soldiers off me, you will act as a long-range specialist. I believe I can prove a big enough threat to hold the psychic's full attention. I want you to use an explosive arrow to disable the psychic. That's insane. If you are caught in the blast that will take you out too, exclaims Artemis. Artemis, none of us can fight a psychic attack. At least not in our current condition, says Robin. You need to take the shot. Even if it means Naruto getting caught in the blast. Kid glances at Naruto gain a bit more respect for the ninja. Artemis stares deep into Naruto's eyes. She gains a hard look. All right, but you better not die. Naruto nods. There is one more thing, says Naruto. If Superboy is still in his feral state, you can't free him. Kid groans. Great so we have to rescue Superboy without rescuing him? Robin frowns. If we do free him that will just give us another enemy to fight. You heard Miss M. Superboy is running off animal instincts. So how do we subdue an invulnerable tank without being crushed? The team looks at Naruto. Naruto has an idea but knows that the team isn't going to like it. Enemy camp Superboy screams in pain. The scientists up the charge electrocuting the clone. Simone stands off to the side watching in amusement. He expected so much more from the clone of Superman. Guess the copies are never as good as the original. The light will reward him greatly for capturing the Superboy weapon. Explosions from outside interrupt the villain's thoughts. Simone frowns. Using his telepathy, he scans the minds of the soldiers outside the tent to see fireballs raining down from the sky. The fireball target the jeeps and tanks setting all the heavy weapons ablaze. Looks like Superboy's friends have decided to show up, smirks Simone. Outside the tent, soldiers scramble to grab their weapons. A black blur moves around stealing weapons from the soldiers much to their confusion. You won't be needing these, smirks kid. Running up a hill a good distance away, he drops the weapons before speeding back down into the enemy camp to steal more weapons. Robin uses the confusion to sneak into the shadows. A smirk is on Boy Wonder's face as the plan is going off without a hitch. He sneaks up behind a couple soldiers taking them out with dual blows to the back of the head. Tying them up, he explores the nearest tent to find it empty. He keeps on moving knowing that he needs to find Superboy. Naruto lands in the middle of the enemy. In a quick motion he draws his sword taking out three soldiers in a single swipe. Gunshots ring out, but he uses the sword to deflect the bullets. He moves at high speeds that are a blur to the soldiers. Another six soldiers fall. Naruto heads straight towards the tent where he smells the scent of the psychic. Drawing several shuriken, he tosses them straight at the tent. The shuriken sail true slicing through the tent. A telekinetic force erupts blasting the shuriken away. Naruto pauses outside of the tent. Strange, I don't remember sensing your mind with the others. Simon exits the tent with a smirk. Oh well, in the end everyone does as Simon says. As Simon was talking Naruto began to flash through hand seals. Your powers are useless, Simon says stop. Naruto's entire body freezes up. Simone walks over towards the frozen Naruto. Now it is time for you two, an arrow embeds in the sand next to the two. Simon's eyes widen as it beeps two times. The arrow explodes engulfing them both in the blast. Shit, Artemis slides down the sand hill. She notches two arrows taking out two soldiers. Come on, be alive you idiot. A black blur runs past her towards the smoke. Kid spins around at high speeds creating a tornado that blows away the smoke. It reveals a badly burned Simone with his left arm bent at an awkward angle. Where is he? Here. Artemis and Kid spin around to see Naruto walking towards them. His shirt is burned on the right side and pants are a little torn, but otherwise he is absolutely fine. Artemis sighs in relief. Dude, how did you escape the explosion? You should be burned worse than that, exclaims Kid. Naruto understood what Kid said but had no intention of reveal his secret. The truth was that the jutsu he was planning to use was the replacement jutsu. Simon's mental powers froze him the moment he reached the last seal. Correction, he stopped intentionally on the last seal letting Simon capture him. Artemis shot the arrow at the right moment. Simon lost concentration on his mental command for a second upon seeing the arrow and that second gave Naruto the opportunity to cast the jutsu. 
He was still burned a bit by the explosion but the burns were minor. Most damage was to his clothes. Robin pokes his head out of the tent. Hey guys, talk later and help me with Superboy. Naruto runs past Artemis and Kid into the tent. Inside the tent all the scientists and soldiers are out cold. Naruto's eyes land upon a large metal sphere being contained in a cage. I had to shock him pretty bad to knock him out. I have no idea how long it is going to last, says Robin. Superboy is chained to a table and stood up as if being crucified. Great that means if we free him and he wakes up before we reach the ship he is going to go crash and squash us, complains Kid. Move fast, says Naruto. Not the best plan but only one we got, Robin hits the button releasing Superboy's shackles. Naruto catches Superboy. That sphere thing has a living presence by the way. Naruto walks over to the sphere placing a hand on it. A strange series of sounds come from the sphere. Kid whispers to Artemis. What is he doing? Artemis nudges Kid in annoyance. Release, take, says Naruto. Robin releases the restraints on the sphere. Move, out. The team moves swiftly with the sphere following. Mount Justice Naruto, Kid, Robin, Artemis, and Miss Martian stand in front of Batman. Batman stands directly in front of Miss Martian. You allowed your emotions to cloud your judgment which could have led to a death of a teammate in your capture. Personal feelings towards each other are to be dealt with on your own time, but when you are on a mission you work as a team not on personal desires. Miss Martian lowers her head with tears brimming her eyes. The Dark Knight walks away from the girl. He takes a few steps back before looking at the other four members of the team. Being able to regroup and come out with a plan even when the deck is stacked against you is something few are able to accomplish. The mission may have been a failure, but you gained a new level of trust and teamwork. That is a success on its own, states Batman. Kid and Robin bump fists, dismissed. Artemis rushes over to Naruto. Wait, Naruto turns to look at her curiously. A screen is next to her translating her words. Why did you choose me? I mean Robin could have used one of his explosive weapons to take out that Simone. How come you choose me? When it comes to long-range capabilities you are the most skilled on the team. A smile appears on Artemis's fact. Canary and Green Arrow look at Batman in surprise. Are you sure about this? asks Arrow. The government has given us permission to send one representative. He has the abilities to accomplish the mission, says Batman. No one is arguing his skills. The problem is that he doesn't have a way to communicate with others at the summit. That could be a liability, argues Canary. Batman turns away from the monitor to face Canary and Arrow. The lack of communication didn't stop him from taking command of the mission in Baila. He was able to pull the team together to rescue Superboy and retrieve stolen alien technology. As a former mercenary he has revealed that most of his missions focused on bodyguard detail. The Dark Knight turns back around typing at the monitor. Any member of the League that is sent will stand out too much. Aqualad and Robin are the next clear choices, but Naruto is more likely to stay hidden. Only acting when necessary. Canary comes up beside Batman. Those are excellent points, but what is the true reason? Is this a test to see if he is ready for the League? A tap of the button brings up an image of Japan's Prime Minister. The computer translate the speech into English so that Canary and Arrow can understand. These past few months an unknown hero has been helping to save lives all over Japan. An honorable hero that doesn't seek glory and fame. Our country possesses a noble hero that fights each day to protect us. Whoever this hero may be, I declare him a citizen of Japan, he shall forever be welcome in our country. Arrow whistles, the kid is getting some major recognition. Three days ago, he saved the prime minister's son from an assassination attempt. There are money offers from every news station for pictures of Japan's hero. Batman closes the screen. This will be a good opportunity to give him a chance to reveal his identity as more than a shadow. The League is already generating enough suspicion and press since most of our members are from a single country or aliens. Understanding appears in Canary's eyes. So you want to use him to show that heroes from other countries are aligned with the League as well, realizes Canary. I still think sending a 14 year old isn't going to look all that great, says Arrow. I agree, but Batman does have a point. Naruto is the best option out of the rest on the team. Arrow shrugs, not having much interaction with the team. Batman sends a transmission for Naruto meet at the cave. Mount Justice. September 7th, 
recognized Uzumaki Naruto, B06. Naruto appears in the cave. He has on a black flak vest over a long sleeve dark orange shirt, fingerless ironclad black gloves, black pants that are wrapped up at the shins, and open toe black ninja sandals. Tied around his waist is an orange sash with a katana sheath behind his back. The ninja walks towards Batman who is waiting. There is a peace summit in Taipei between the leaders of North and South Relasia. Both sides are currently at an impasse and in a couple hours will be bringing in a neutral arbitrator to meditate between the two sides. Naruto remains silent waiting to hear the complete details of the mission before asking questions. Your responsibility is to protect the leaders of the North and South Relasia, Sing Man Li and Sang. Two individuals appear on the screen. In an instant Naruto memorizes each individual. The arbitrator? Is currently unknown and not your responsibility, states Batman. Understood. This is one of the things that Batman likes most about Naruto. The kid doesn't waste a round with pointless small talk. Straight to the point. Get the details and get on with the mission. When you arrive stick to the shadows and don't reveal your presence unless absolutely necessary. The Zeta tubes are programmed to transport you a half mile away from the Peace Summit building. Head out once you have the coordinates, orders Batman. Naruto receives a beep from his watching letting him know that the coordinates have been received and downloaded. He heads over to the Zeta tubes. In a flash of light the ninja is gone. Cave Megan is in the kitchen staring at a recipe. The ingredients are all around her, but she hasn't made a move to start cooking. All she has been doing the past two days is eating microwavable food. Batman's words still haunted her. Going to miss the big day. Dinah enters into the kitchen. Megan doesn't even look up from the book. Megan? Megan? The girl's head snaps up. Canary? When did you get here? That isn't important. Dinah places a hand on Megan's shoulder. Today is supposed to be your first day of school. You have been talking about it for the past couple weeks. Why aren't you dressed or excited? Today was supposed to be the day that she started school with Superboy, but she really wasn't feeling up to it. Her mind kept going back to the last mission. I guess I am not really in the mood, lies Megan. Dinah takes a seat on a stool at the other side of the counter. Still upset about the mission? Megan refuses to meet Canary's eyes. Guilt fills her emerald eyes. No one holds it against you. It was an honest mistake. We have all been there at one point where we let our emotions overrun our sense of rational and reason, says Dinah knowingly. Calder could have died because of me. Dinah falls silent at the outburst. I comma I wanted to get to Superboy so bad. Calder was right there on the brink of death and, and, I abandoned him. Tears begin to stream down Megan's face. A new voice speaks to her. I forgive you. Megan's head snaps to the side. Calder walks towards her in civilian clothes. There is a friendly smile on his face. I know what you did was not intentional. It was the heat of the moment. Canary is right, it was a mistake that is all. Everyone is entitled to make a couple mistakes, says Calder. Fresh tears start to stream down Megan's face. These are ones of happiness. She lunges forward hugging Calder. Calder smiles hugging the girl. I'm so sorry, she cries. He holds her reassuring her that everything was fine. Dinah watched the scene with a warm smile. Taipei Cat Grant gives a smile as she begins to speak into the mic. This is Cat Grant speaking from the Peace Summit in Taipei. The talks of peace between the leaders of North and South Relasia have broken down. In order to help get the process back on a track an unknown peace arbitrator has been called in. No one knows who it will be but speculation is all over the place with some even claiming that it is Superman. An amused smile is on her face as she cracks a small joke. Though I suspect the Man of Steel will not be coming as I heard the arbitrator will be arriving by limo not flying. Roy hides behind a pillar. He lifts up his arm opening communication with an old friend. Red arrow to Aqualad, can you read me? This is Aqualad, I need you to give me Cheshire's height. One second, Cheshire is 1.76 meters tall. Roy hesitates not able to convert that to feet and inches. Amusement is in Aqualad's voice as he converts it. She is 5 foot 6 inches and extremely dangerous. Do you acquire any assistance? A scowl forms on Roy's face like I would need help from the Junior Justice League. No, just our computers. Good luck my friend. Roy activates the sensors in his glasses. Immediately the glasses begin to scan the height of every woman within his peripheral vision. 
It locks onto a beautiful young woman acting as a merchant. She is of Asian descent and matches the Justice League database on Cheshire's civilian identity. He presses a button on his suitcase making it slide apart revealing a compact bow. Cheshire changes quickly climbing on top of the stand. A limo pulls up in front of the peace summit, she crouches down picking up a rocket launcher. Taking aim, she prepares to squeeze the trigger when an arrow hits the rocket knocking it upward at the exact moment she takes her shot. The rocket sails harmlessly into the air. Get back! shouts Roy charging forward. He quickly notches another arrow firing a quick shot. Cheshire leaps over the air with grace and dexterity before drawing her say. Another arrow is shot at her and it explodes releasing a net that she easily slices through. Roy tackles her in midair, but she twists them around. Hitting the ground, she straddles his waist aiming a sigh at his throat. Soldiers and security personnel surround the two with weapons aimed at them both. Surrender. Put down the weapons. I surrender, smirks Cheshire. Her eyes dart to the side. Roy follows her line of sight. His eyes widen noticing a shadow darting straight towards the limo. The peace arbitrator. Copperhead. Shouts Roy pointing behind the men. A scantily dressed woman that moves like a snake darts straight at the limo. Copperhead never gets the chance to hit her mark as her animal senses scream at her to move. She is unable to dodge in time as a kick strikes her across the face. Twisting around in midair, she glares at the one that dared to attack her. You, hisses Copperhead. Bad move. I told you next time we meet I would drink your blood. Naruto stands calmly not in the least bit intimidated. Copperhead is about to strike when guns are pointed at them as well. A scowl forms on her face. She stands down glaring at Naruto. The peace arbitrator is stepping out of the limo. It is, Lex Luthor. Lex Luthor steps out of the limo with a wise smirk. He waves to the shocked crowd. The man turns around to see several individuals being arrested. I see my arrival has drawn some attention, smirks Luthor. You look familiar. Roy's eyes narrow. What are you doing here? Please release him. This is Green Arrow's sidekick. Former sidekick, corrects Roy. A soldier frowns, but he is a foreigner. Lex Luthor vouches for him, smiles Luthor. The soldier salutes before releasing Roy. The last thing I want is to be helped by you. A simple thank you will suffice. Luthor turns to see the other young hero being released after revealing an identification card. The billionaire walks over to the unknown young hero. I take it you are the representative sent by the Justice League to watch over the peace summit. Roy frowns narrowing his eyes upon the blonde. He recognizes the younger boy immediately. Uzumaki Naruto a member of the Junior Justice League. I don't believe we have been introduced. Lex Luthor, a pleasure to meet you, smiles Luthor extending his hand. Naruto doesn't even acknowledge Luthor's existence. He forms a hand seal and in a cloud of smoke vanishes into thin air. Not very talkative, says Luthor. Roy walks up to Luthor. Stop trying to play the hero. I have information linking you to supplying both north and south with weapons. You are profiting from this war. True, but the profits from forming a united Relasia is far greater than two separate factions, smiles Luther. I don't pretend to be an angel. It just so happens that I am on the side of the angels. Roy scowls, not believing a word. Still, there is a matter of the assassination on my life. How about I hire you to investigate the matter? Your money has blood on it, I want no part of it. Luther chuckles in amusement. So you will do it for free? I do so love heroes. Fixing his tuxedo, he walks towards the leaders. Gentlemen, gentlemen, let's put on some smiles for the camera. Taipei. Jail Cheshire flows from one kata to the next. Cells are so boring. A girl has to find some way to have fun. She stretches out her leg lifting it into the air and reaching out to touch her toes. An annoyed hiss comes from the other side of the cell. I am going to kill that boy next time I see him, hisses Copperhead. If you say so, taunts Cheshire. Copperhead narrows her eyes, she would rip out Cheshire's throat but her hands are cuffed. In her current state Cheshire would take her out without much trouble. Even an animal as dangerous as Snake knows when it is cornered. The doors open up and Red Arrow enters the cell in his gear. Oh look, if it isn't my favorite little sidekick, smirks Cheshire. Come to pay me a visit? That is so sweet. Keep this up and I might even let you take me out properly. Red Arrow ignores her comments. Who hired you? Shadows. 
What did they want? Was your mission to kill Luther or disrupt the peace summit? Cheshire makes a gun pointing it at Red Arrow. One stone, two birds. A new voice speaks up. No point in questions. Red Arrow, Cheshire, and Copperhead turn to see Naruto sitting on the bench eating a piece of Pocky. He is staring at the ceiling with a nonchalant expression. None of the highly trained three individuals even sensed or noticed Naruto's presence. Red glares at Naruto. What do you mean? You didn't stop her, she let you, answers Naruto. Copperhead bursts out laughing. Cheshire smirks with an amused expression. Red clenches his hand into a fist. The former sidekick can tell from the reactions of both women that Naruto was deduced the truth. Copperhead was the true assassin, question her. Copperhead flicks her tongue with a smirk that reveals her fangs. Go ahead hotshot. Come in here and question me if you got the guts. Cheshire looks over at Naruto. You are pretty good ever think about becoming an assassin? I am sure I can find you some good work. Already offered, no thanks. Roy raises an eyebrow, what does that mean? It means that the shadows already approached the kid to join, answers Copperhead. I am glad you turned it down. Your head is mine. Naruto glances at Copperhead. He looks away not in the least bit concerned. Copperhead hisses in anger at the dismissal. Cheshire makes a hidden signal with her hand. Immediately, Cheshire grabs the bars ducking down. Roy is confused but soon realizes. Oh no, the wall at the back of the cell explodes. Once the smoke clears it reveals a large hole. Copperhead stands up the cuffs falling from her wrists. She picked her way out. Her eyes narrow upon Naruto who stands outside the cell. Remember your head belongs to me, hisses Copperhead. Let's go ladies. Cheshire scowls turning around to see Sportsmaster. No, not you. Beggars can't be chooses, states Sportsmaster climbing up the rope. Cheshire leaps through hole with Copperhead behind her. They're getting away, shouts Red Arrow heading for the roof. Naruto doesn't make a move to chase. Following them is not part of the mission. In a swirl of leaves he vanishes into thin air. Mount Justice Canary spots Calder at the computer watching the Peace Summit at Taipei. Curiosity fills the woman at seeing his interest in the Peace Summit. She walks over to Aquaman's sidekick. Keeping track of Naruto? Asks Canary knowingly. Calder glances at Canary. Yes. Canary stands silently. There is no denying that Naruto is the strongest member on the team. I am not concerned on whether or not he can handle the danger. He has proved that countless times on every mission. Naruto has a wide variety of skills that make him adept at any given situation. What is the concern then? Typing into the computer, it brings up an image of Luther trying to be friendly with Naruto. Naruto doesn't even acknowledge Luther and vanishes in a cloud of smoke. I am concerned that all this is a job to him. A chore to cure boredom. Calder stares at Naruto. What happens when he gets bored of the job? Will he change sides? Canary has to admit that the thought has crossed her mind several times. When she first brought him to the cave he was cold and detached. As the weeks went on she watched him starting to open up. He started to interact with Megan, showing up to eat her home-cooked meals and spending hours listening to the girl through mental conversation. Naruto never knew it, but his openness to Megan's telepathy made her feel more relaxed and comfortable. Unlike the others that were uncomfortable with a voice in their heads, Naruto was the first to accept Megan's culture. Then Naruto started to train with Superboy. The two grew closer to the point that Superboy could communicate with Naruto through body language instead of words. Naruto started to give suggestions to Calder in order to increase the effectiveness of mission assignments. Artemis was next to fall to Naruto's silent charm, mostly cause Naruto accepted Artemis right off the bat. He respected her abilities as an archer and didn't care about her past. Canary remembers Naruto telling her that he is able to tell when a person is lying due to being able to sense negative emotions. That means Naruto knew Batman and Arrow were lying about Artemis's identity but still trusted her. The past couple days since Baila, Naruto has reverted to a cold, detached personality. Megan admitted that she was afraid she lost Naruto as a friend because he missed lunch the past two days and hadn't spoken to her since the mission in Baila. Naruto didn't even show up to training yesterday. Canary knew that Superboy was upset to lose his sparring partner. The mission didn't go that badly so why did Naruto revert to his old personality? 
All we can do is believe that he will see this team as more than a job, and see the individual members as friends, smiles Canary. Naruto is a friend, says Calder, Canary smirks, Taipei. Naruto hides in the shadows, no one even knows that he is in the room. The room is empty at the moment, but guards keep checking on the room to make sure it will be ready for the peace summit. He waits patiently knowing that in a few minutes it will begin to fill up. As he is thinking, camera crews escorted by security personnel and soldiers start to enter into the room. Red Arrow soon enters the room still in his gear meaning that he failed to take down Cheshire and Copperhead. Naruto is not surprised by that. Cheshire and Copperhead are weak compared to the former ninja, but far above Red's league. The surprising part is that Red wasn't killed trying to take the two out. Moving. Naruto makes sure to stay out of Red's line of sight. Red's glasses have the ability to pick up heat signatures and Naruto doesn't want his cover blown. Red Arrow is a well-trained individual. In terms of long-range capabilities Red Arrow is more skilled than Artemis. However, in the short time that Naruto observed Red Arrow's close-range combat it was lacking so to speak. Cheshire could have killed Red Arrow. Instead she chose to surrender letting Red Arrow think he foiled their plans. An assassin would never reveal themselves in such a manner. Naruto didn't even pay her any attention focusing on a secondary attack, which turned out to be Copperhead. The mission was to protect the peace summit specifically the leaders of North and South Relasia. He had no obligation to protect the peace arbitrator, Lex Luthor. But he had intervened anyway trusting H's instincts. His instincts told him there was something wrong about Copperhead's assault. Too straightforward, and it lacked intent. A staged assassination? Thinking too much brat, just fight and leave the thinking to others. Karama's voice rings in his head. That was what the fox would say in a situation like this. Naruto gains a small smile. That is right, he is not here to think. Protect the summit and beat up anyone that tries to attack. An hour later, everything is set up for the summit. Lex Luthor is mediating between the two groups. Our countries will never agree with each other, glares sang. Luther gives a reassuring smile, we may not agree on much, but I know you both enjoy the ancient Relasia tea ceremony. A beautiful geisha in a red and gold decorated kimono. She is pushing a tray towards the head table. Kanai sail down from above piercing the ground. Naruto lands between the cart and the summit. Red immediately draws his bow notching an arrow. Luther watches with a calm expression. Plan will fail, should surrender, says Naruto. Cheshire smirks, getting a little better at speaking. Hitting a button, she shoves the cart forward, it doesn't move an inch much to her surprise. Naruto's hand is on the other side holding it still. With a powerful shove he sends the cart slamming into Cheshire's chest. She quickly disables the bomb to avoid being killed. Arrows sail at her forcing her to flip backwards. As she touches down she has a sigh in each hand. You are really starting to get on my nerves. The wall behind her explodes. A helicopter hovers in the air outside the hole. Copperhead and Sportsmaster land inside the building followed by a group of assassins from the League of Shadows. Naruto reaches into his pouch and tosses a barrage of shuriken. Copperhead and Sportsmaster easily dodge the shuriken. Need to work on that aim kid, smirks Sportsmaster drawing a javelin. An explosion from behind causes Sportsmaster to turn around. His eyes widen upon seeing the helicopter plummet towards the ground. Eyes burn with anger. The kid was never aiming for them, he was aiming for the helicopter to prevent any escape. He's mine. Copperhead darts forward. Naruto avoids several slashes before getting behind Copperhead. Grabbing her arm, he tosses her at Sportsmaster who tried to sneak up behind him. Sportsmaster avoids Copperhead tossing his javelin at Naruto. I got a score to settle with the kid. Naruto catches the javelin tossing it at several shadow assassins. The javelin explodes taking out three assassins. Sportsmaster draws a mace swinging it at Naruto, but Naruto cuts through it with his katana before moving at speed Sportsmaster is unable to follow. A knee to the stomach followed by a spin kick sends Sportsmaster flying. Naruto ducks lower under a slash before spinning around with a leg sweep knocking down Copperhead. He spins around tossing two kanai that pierce the legs of two more assassins that tried to go for the Relasia leaders. Red Arrow is battling it out with Cheshire. How does it make you feel knowing that the one doing the most work to protect the Peace Summit is part of the Junior Justice League, smirks Cheshire. 
he responds by shooting several more arrows at her. Laughing, she dodges the arrow engaging him in close range. Copperhead and Sportsmaster continue their dual assault on Naruto. Punches, kicks, claws, and teeth all try to land a blow on the ninja, but not a single one lands. Naruto stands on his hands spinning around to deliver a kick to Copperhead and Sportsmaster's chest. Both assassins are sent flying into pillars in opposite directions. My speed is getting better, thinks Naruto. I am almost back to my former speed. I will work on my strength next. I will kill you, Copperhead spits out blood, in anger she charges at Naruto. Her attacks are becoming wild and sloppy. He easily dodges a couple swipes before burying his fist in her gut. Grabbing the back of her head, he brings it down into his rising knee. A crunching sound fills the air as her nose is broken. Blood from the break splashes into her eyes. He spins around slamming her face first into the cement floor. Naruto stands up leaving the unconscious copperhead on the floor. The ninja turns to face Sportsmaster. Next, asks Naruto. Sportsmaster takes a step back. Getting better with each little mission your team does huh? Santa Prisca, Baila, what next? Naruto walks towards Sportsmaster. Another time boy. Sportsmaster turns tail and runs leaping from the hole in the wall. Naruto watches as Sportsmaster spreads his arms revealing a strange garb that allows him to glide through the air. The ninja turns around flicking his wrist. Six shurikens sail through the air striking the remaining shadow assassin in the knees disabling them and allowing security to take them out. Red Arrow takes a kick to the face knocking him into the wall. Cheshire spins around tossing her sigh at the leaders of North and South Relasia. A pair of kanai sail through the air knocking the weapons off target. That is my cue to leave, Cheshire follows Sportsmaster's example. She leaps through the hole in the wall and disappears into the night. This, isn't over, wheezes Copperhead. Naruto walks away from the female assassin. Cameras starts to zoom in on him. Multiple flashes fill the air. Forming a hand seal, he vanishes in a swirl of leaves. Cave. Recognized B06, Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto enters into the cave. Batman and Canary are waiting for him. He walks towards the two with a blank expression. Mission accomplished, reports Naruto. Well done, praises Canary. A bit on the brutal side when dealing with Copperhead. Naruto looks at her curiously. She gives him a knowing look. Batman stares down at Naruto. You did well. The Peace Summit was a success even if most of the credit is going to Lex Luthor. Naruto gives a nod. He turns around heading not to the Zeta tubes, but deeper into the cave. Canary shouts out to him, Where are you going, hungry? Unknown location Lex Luthor sits across from Raj Al Ghul. It would seem that child is far more skilled than we ever imagined. None of your assassins came close to matching him. Such skill would still be a great help to our plans, for now we let him live, states Raj Al Ghul. I agree. He may have thwarted our original plans, but I was still able to sway the leaders to join together, Luther smirks as he takes a sip from his wine. A car sailed through the air smashing down in the middle of the street a hundred feet away. People scream and run in terror at the resulting explosion. Gunshots fill the air as the Tokyo police try to put down the monster responsible. Bullets bounce harmlessly off the monster's skin. He picks up another car tossing it at the police causing them to scatter like roaches when the light is turned on. Another explosion fills the street. Grundy not like being shot at. Grundy destroy everything. Roars the undead monster. Naruto lands a nearby roof watching the scene unfold. The attack started five minutes ago. Grundy randomly showed up and started to attack everything in sight like a mindless beast. Naruto doesn't know much about the supervillain, but something tells him that this Grundy was sent here for other reasons than to cause random destruction. It looks like someone or a group of people are interested in learning more about his abilities. Ever since the peace summit in Taipei when the world learned of a young hero with no identity, the crime rate that had been dropping in Tokyo had risen by at least 10%. Bank robberies and Yakuza attacks on random civilians have been rising. He has been working overtime for the past two weeks helping out the local police in trying to stop the crime. Naruto isn't an idiot, already he deduced that the League of Shadows must have a hand in this. No doubt the wannabe Ninja League was upset that he turned down their offer and humiliated their assassins at the peace summit. This is some form of revenge, 
And now that the small fries have failed the big guns so to speak are stepping up to bat. On the plus side he hasn't had a dull moment in a couple weeks. All this crime has given him plenty of time to train and increase his skills. Experience is experience even if the battle only lasts a couple seconds. There is also the fact that the people of Tokyo are more grateful than ever about his presence even if he is indirectly the cause of some of this new crime wave. Super strength, invulnerability, all too familiar, thinks Naruto. Grundy is a hulking giant at 10 feet tall with pale white decaying skin, bloodshot red eyes, and a body that puts bodybuilders to shame. The supervillain is a walking mountain of muscle. Still, Naruto has experience dealing with super-powered individuals. His hands are already flashing through seals as he leaps from the roof. Wind release. Drilling air bullet, Naruto sucks in a deep breath making his stomach expand four times its size. Taking aim, he punches his stomach spitting out a ball of concentrated wind about half his size. It flies at high speeds towards the giant. The ball of wind slams into Grundy's back drilling straight into the monster's dense skin. A roar of pain comes from Grundy as he smashes face first into the street. The ball of wind continues to drill Grundy into the street causing a large crater as it explodes. Naruto lands on top of car. He waits patiently. Grundy not like pain. Grundy kill you. Out of the crater emerges Grundy. Grundy's entire back has been ripped to shreds. Slowly the skin is starting to knit back together. High level of regeneration that complicates matters. Grundy spins around to glare at Naruto. The supper villain leaps at Naruto. Naruto easily dodges the attack and is reminded of his battle with Mammoth. Mammoth was the super-powered individual that Cobra enhanced with a combination of Venom and Blockbuster formula. He had used the Sharingan to take down the monster in order to avoid a long battle that would tear up the island. Sharingan has the ability to hypnotize those that it makes direct eye contact with. A simple-minded beast like Mammoth that is all brain and no muscle was easy prey for the Sharingan. Naruto ducks under a thrown car. Unfortunately, too many people are watching making it near impossible to find a moment to use the Sharingan. He wants to keep that ability a secret for as long as possible. Poisoned Kanai and Shuriken, Grundy throws a punch that strikes air. Naruto reappears behind Grundy with a shake of the head. With such a high level of regeneration poison will slow Grundy down, but only for a few seconds. Slowing down a tank doesn't make the metal any less strong. No he needs to find a way to harm the beast that will take it out. Grundy not like you moving. Clone no jutsu. Six Naruto pop into existence surrounding Grundy. Grundy pauses looking around in confusion. The real Naruto hides in the shadows as the clones dodge and evade Grundy's attack. Earth and fire jutsu are not going to work. Well, he does know a few fire jutsu that might work but the Justice League will be on him if he kills Grundy. Stupid heroes and their no-killing philosophy. Water jutsu might work, but he needs a water source. He is not Kisame and can't produce an entire lake. At least not yet. Wind was effective but he would have to literally barrage Grundy with wind jutsu to take the monster down. That would kill his chakra reserves and leave him vulnerable. Being vulnerable when others might be watching is not an option he wants to risk. So that leaves him with one style of jutsu. Grundy grabs the last Naruto, but this one disappears in a cloud of smoke as well. Grundy kill all you. Naruto appears behind Grundy flashing through hand seals. Lightning begins to spark around his body. Out of all the elements lightning style jutsu are the hardest for him to control. It is the element he has the least amount experience in. Lightning style. False darkness. Opening his mouth, he fires a bolt of lightning that takes the shape of a spear. It shoots forward at Junin level speeds. Grundy spins around in time to be struck in the stomach. Pain fills Grundy as the lightning surrounds his body electrocuting him. The police and various citizens watch the light show in awe. Ending the jutsu, Naruto takes a moment to recover his senses. I definitely need to practice my lightning jutsu, thinks Naruto. He winces as a bit of the lightning burned his tongue and mouth. It is going to take some time for that to heal. Grundy drops to his knees before falling face forward. Grundy, take nap, the former ninja walks over to Grundy and kneels down. Naruto is impressed. A normal person or a ninja would have been killed by such an attack. Even with Kurama healing him that attack would have killed Naruto. Grundy has some crazy regenerative powers to survive that. 
or maybe it is the monster's natural invulnerability. Either way, the former ninja was impressed. Imagine if he had a brain to go with that power, thinks Naruto. That is a scary thought. Noticing people taking pictures, Naruto forms a hand seal and disappears in a cloud of smoke. Mount Justice. September 18th Megan hums a tune as she makes lunch, it has been a great week, not only is she a cheerleader at school, but now she is dating Superboy. Sure she almost died on the mission two days ago at Belle Reve but that doesn't matter since Connor saved and then kissed her. Best mission ever. Megan pauses to see a third lunch. Sadness is in her eyes. That lunch was made for Naruto. Naruto has not shown up to eat lunch or dinner with them ever since the mission to Baila. What happened? Where is Superboy? Megan snaps awake. She looks over to see the team looking at her. In the bed over lies Superboy strapped down tightly. Aqualad is on a third bed with IV attached to his body. Superboy. Naruto steps forward. The mission over, take us to cave. Those were the last words that he spoke to her. She remembers a very quiet trip back to the cave. Upon arriving at the cave, Batman was already waiting for them having received a full report of the mission from Naruto and Robin via transmission. Superboy and Aqualad were taken to the infirmary to be treated. Her uncle is the one that restored Superboy's memories. Megan never felt so bad in her life when Batman pointed out that she left a teammate, no a friend to die. It was a couple days later that Canary and Calder spoke to her. The two comforted her. They reassured her that it was a mistake. Both knew that Megan was caught up in the moment was all. Calder forgave her. After school that day, Megan had called in the team to have a meeting. All of them showed up except Naruto. She apologized to the entire team. Robin gives a smirk, no need to worry, we all make mistakes. Yeah, I can't stay mad at you babe, winks Wally. It happens, shrugs Artemis. Megan smiles warmly at her friends. Thank you all so much. She wipes her eyes to prevent tears from falling. Her eyes glance around noticing that Naruto is not among the team. Calder notices the look and places a hand on her shoulder. Out of everyone on the team, Naruto was her first friend. He allowed her to connect to his mind. The others were scared and feared her telepathic abilities. Superboy even yelled at her angrily. Naruto on the other hand was accepting. Even told her that she could continue to speak to him mentally if it made her more comfortable. He is the most stoic member of the team and at the same time the most accepting of her. Megan smiles realizing for the first time why it hurt so much that he was rejecting her. It hurt so much because Naruto is her best friend. She wanted her best friend back. Hey Naruto, want to help me cook? Giggling, Megan flies over to him. Come on, it will be fun. Naruto stares at her blankly. Fine, how about I cook and you eat? Naruto shrugs taking a seat at the counter. Perfect, I am going to try a new recipe. He would sit there listening to her talk not once complaining. Megan gains a nervous look. Sorry, I didn't mean to talk so much. Why are you apologizing? Asks Naruto. Megan looks at him in surprise. I never said it bothered me. If it did, I would let you know. Blushing. Megan smiles brightly. Megan gains a determined look. I am going to find a way to make it up to him, starting today she is going to get her best friend back. Watchtower. It is not magic. Whatever power that the child uses it is similar to magic, but it is not magic, says Zatara. Batman, Zatara, and Wonder Woman are watching the news footage of Naruto fighting Grundy. Grundy is a dangerous villain with strength almost on par with Superman. Naruto used superior speed in his strange jutsu to defeat Grundy with relative ease. The former ninja revealed the ability to spit use lightning-based powers. Altogether that means Naruto can use fire, wind, earth, and lightning. Not only that, but Naruto was able to cast illusions to fool Grundy. With each battle Naruto displays more powers that were previous unknown. Batman wonders what the extent of Naruto's powers truly are. Wonder Woman smiles with an impressed look. The child is a trained warrior. I am curious to test his strength for myself. Highly doubtful he would fight you at full strength. Wonder Woman and Zatara turn around to see Canary walking towards them. I have sparred with him several times. He only ever shows a portion of his skill needed to take down an opponent. Are you saying he would be able to defeat me holding back? Says Wonder Woman a bit miffed at the implication. She has never faced an opponent she could not beat. 
Amazons are born warriors. It takes a great warrior to defeat an Amazon. Impressive as the child is, she is confident she can beat him. Canary realizes her words may have offended the prideful Amazon. I didn't mean that. Batman interrupts the conversation. There has been a large increase in criminal activity in Tokyo. We are not the only ones interested in Naruto's abilities. Canary, Zatara, and Wonder Woman immediately tense up realizing what Batman is getting at. He reported to me a month ago that an assassin called Deathstroke contacted to him about joining an organization. I believe that it was the League of Shadows. Raj Gull is always looking for people with talents in espionage to join his cause. You think it is someone else now? asks Zatara. Possibly, all I know is that Naruto is being targeted. We will have to keep a closer eye on him to make sure that whoever or whatever it is that wants him doesn't get the opportunity, states Batman. Mount Justice Water and Steel clash against each other. Naruto takes a step back with both hands on the hilt of his sword. Calder takes a moment to catch his breath. Both begin to circle each other. Twirling around his water swords, Calder rushes in with a feint before attacking from the left. Naruto doesn't fall for the feint blocking the strike from the left and lashing out with a kick striking Calder in the side. Spinning around, Naruto sweeps out Calder's legs. Artemis shakes her head. First we can't beat him in a straight up fist fight and now he is unstoppable with a sword. I could so take him, smirks Wally. Prove it, smirks Artemis. Wally gulps before walking forward with a confident grin. The speedster charges at Naruto only to have his arm grabbed, spun around, and slammed to the ground. Groaning, Wally lies on the ground. Artemis bursts out laughing having enjoyed that so much. Oh yeah, you totally took him down. Megan flies into the room. She lands next to Connor. Her eyes watch as Naruto and Calder go back to sparring. Calder forms his water bearers into various weapons, but none are a match for Naruto's skill and expertise with the katana. It is a very one-sided match. Is it me or is Naruto getting better? Asks Megan. Red Tornado speaks up from his position on the other side of Connor. No, I have been recording his movements since his first spar until now. His speed, strength, and reflexes have increased. Of course, each of you has grown stronger as well. The training that Black Canary is putting you all through is helping to improve your combat effectiveness. What's his record now? asks Connor. Naruto jumps up kicking Calder across the face. As of this victory, Naruto's undefeated streak is up to 63 wins and zero losses. Megan's eyes widen in surprise. That is over the span of several months. Smiling. It shouldn't surprise her that much. Naruto did defeat Mr. Twister and complete the Santa Prisca mission on his own. And that was when the team was raw, untrained. If he has grown stronger then he is even more amazing than he was then. A determined look appears on her face. Flying into the air, she lands in the sparring arena. Can I have next? asks Megan. Connor, Wally, and Artemis turn to look at Megan in surprise. Megan, what are you doing? Connor steps forward, but Megan ignores his comment. Naruto? She looks straight at him. Calder puts away his weapons. He turns to look at Naruto. Naruto sheathes his katana. No, says the former ninja. But, Calder and Superboy have the strength to take the hits, says Naruto. He is speaking in near fluent English. What about Robin and Wally? Points out Calder, dude. Naruto answers without hesitation. I refuse to fight them as well. Ocean blue eyes glance at Wally who is still nursing his back. He turns around preparing to leave. Sensing negative intent, he ducks under a punch. Megan touches down in front of him and aims a kick. His arm comes up blocking the kick. You said that training was meant to help one get stronger, and even offered to spar with me back then. Well I want to become stronger. Megan continues her furious assault. A blow to the stomach doubles her over. Connor takes a step forward gritting his teeth. Calder raises his arm. Wait, she is trying to get through to him. Artemis raises an eyebrow. By getting beat up, the archer shakes her head. She learned after the first time she sparred with Naruto. Her ribs still ache in memory of the spar. He doesn't show mercy or hold back. In many ways he reminds her of her father. The main difference is that Naruto doesn't try to kill or have her kill others. Oh, not to mention that Naruto is ten times faster and stronger than her father. You have to understand, Naruto was the first person to accept Megan. 
called her glances at Connor with a knowing look. Remember when she first used telepathy? How we all rejected her powers, but Naruto was fine with her telepathy. Those two would spend hours talking to each other telepathically. Calder watches as Megan stands up attacking Naruto again. So what, she is trying to get him to be her friend again through fighting, says Wally confused, Calder nods. A leg sweep knocks Megan down. Why are you doing this? asks Naruto curiously. Megan stands up wincing in pain. I just want to train is all. Naruto tilts his head dodging her punch. I can sense negative emotions. It is impossible to lie to me. Wait, he can tell when people are lying. Dude, since when did he have that power? exclaims Wally. Artemis gets a nervous look. Does that mean he knew when Green Arrow was lying about her being his niece? Superboy frowns. How many powers does he have? Megan pants heavily. I, she shifts nervously. I wanted us to be friends again. Friends? Naruto hides his surprise well. He never considered anyone on the team to be a friend. There is only one person that he ever acknowledged as a friend and that was Kurama. A missing ninja and a Jinchuriki didn't have the luxury of making normal friends. Kurama was not a normal friend. The friendship revolved around Kurama making snide remarks and criticizing his every move. Granted, he had inherited Kurama's power to sense negative emotions so he knew that despite all the comments Kurama never truly meant them. Well maybe at the beginning, but the two became close. The ninja thinks on the matter. Megan cooks him meals and talks to him on a near constant basis. Kurama never cooked him meals, but did talk all the time. And he must admit that the conversations with Megan are much more enjoyable. Naruto smiles inwardly. It is nice to have another friend. Then as a friend, please stop this. I have no desire to harm you, says Naruto. Megan's eyes widen. So we are friends again? I am confused, but when did we stop being friends? asks Naruto. What do you mean? Ever since the mission to Baila you stopped talking to me and even stopped showing up for meals, exclaims Megan. Naruto walks over to the computer. Multiple screens pop up revealing the increase of crime rate in Tokyo and other cities in Japan. There has been a high increase in crime in Japan as a whole though most of it is centered in Tokyo. Most of it involves Yakuza and local criminals, but there have been a few instances where I ran into villains with superpowers and assassins. A screen with Solomon Grundy and Deathstroke appear. The assassin on the right is known as Deathstroke. He confronted me about a month ago offering me a position in his organization. I assumed it is the League of Shadows, but there are other organizations that work in darkness so I can't confirm it is the Shadows. Calder gains a hard look at hearing this information, why didn't you tell us? More importantly, what was your answer? demands Wally. I turned them down and proceeded to fight with Deathstroke. He escaped before I could subdue him, but I am sure he received my answer. Naruto turns to face Calder. I was not aware I had to tell you everything about my personal life. Superboy steps forward. We have the right to know when assassins are targeting us. Not you, me. Why tell us now? asks Megan curiously. Artemis nods in agreement. You wanted to know why I missed the meals. I have been busy is all. I apologize, says Naruto. Megan blushes as a smile lights up her face. So he wasn't ignoring her. She jumped to conclusions. This whole time she was worried for no reason. As for the not talking. I prefer to listen. Hello Megan, I forgot you don't like to talk much, exclaims Megan. He did tell her in the past that he liked listening to her talk and preferred to remain silent. She was such an idiot to think he would hold a grudge. Naruto is not that type of person. Naruto, starts Calder. We are a team, no we are all friends. If you have a problem we are here to help. Naruto gains a hint of amusement. I don't have any problems, and I don't require any help with them. He closes the images and walks past the team. See you later, Megan. Megan waves. Bye Naruto. Come by tomorrow for dinner. A nod comes from the ninja. The Zeta tubes activate teleporting Naruto back to Tokyo. Wally scowls. How can we trust that guy? He is being recruited by the League of Shadows. He turned it down, defends Artemis. Yeah, Naruto is our friend, argues Megan. Some friend not trusting us with his information. Wally folds his arms across his chest. I have always had a bad feeling about that guy. Megan and Artemis glare at Wally. 
Superboy shrugs, as long as he is on our side then it doesn't matter to me. Calder looks at Wally. A scowl comes from the speedster. Brake Connor watches as his girlfriend packs a bagged lunch. What are you doing? It is Saturday there is no school. This isn't for me silly, it is for Naruto, giggles Megan. Connor raises an eyebrow. She decides to elaborate. I thought it would be nice if we visited him this time instead of him always coming here to eat. Pass. Megan's eyes widen in surprise. Connor walks away. I am going to train for a bit. There is jealousy in Connor's eyes but Megan is unable to see it. Tokyo. September 22nd a revving sounds makes Naruto turn his head. Sphere comes rolling next to him. Naruto pats Sphere. He goes back to staring out over the city, it is a quiet day in Tokyo. A rare occurrence but one that he is enjoying to the utmost. Being a hero has been getting boring lately, there hasn't been any criminals or villains to give him a true challenge. He has yet to face an opponent that makes him use his true strength, it seems all the true fighters are in the Justice League. Superman, Captain Marvel, Red Tornado to name a few. Naruto is not sure whether he can beat them or not, but he would love the opportunity to test his skills against them. A chance to fight an opponent that he can go all out against without holding back, he would love that opportunity. Naruto? Naruto tilts his head. Megan? Hey, I came to bring you lunch? The ninja looks into the sky. A speck starts to move towards him. That speck soon transforms into Miss Martian. Megan waves happily to him before landing next to him. She takes a seat on the edge of the roof holding a bag. I made this lunch for you. Naruto looks at her curiously. A light blush heats Megan's face. I thought it would be nice for a change if we had lunch at your home instead of you always coming to the cave. He takes the lunch with a hint of surprise. Thank you, says Naruto. Megan beams. This is the nicest thing that anyone ever did for him. This is my first time to Tokyo. It is such a busy city, says Megan. It takes some time to get used to, but no different from many of the cities in the world. Naruto reaches into the bag pulling out a ham, turkey sandwich with lettuce, tomato, and mayonnaise. He begins to eat the sandwich enjoying it. Megan is an excellent cook. A sandwich doesn't take much skill, but it is a testament to her skill that something as simple as a sandwich can taste so good. Do you think you can show me around? Megan's green skin begins to turn white allowing her to pose as a human girl. I would love to see the city. I don't mind, shrugs Naruto, I will need to change. Great. Tokyo 6pm Naruto and Megan are walking down the sidewalk. Both are in street clothes. Megan runs over to a window of a clothing store. I love that dress. Oh and that skirt. Naruto watches her in amusement. He never understood the female's obsession with clothes. Then again. He has seen many males in the city just as obsessed with appearance. He wouldn't think that a shape shifter would care so much about clothes. Sorry, I guess I got a little. I told you, no need to apologize. If I was bothered I would tell you, interrupts Naruto. We're here to sightsee so enjoy. Megan smiles loving that Naruto is so understanding. What do you do for fun? Naruto looks at her curiously. When you are not being a hero, she clarifies. He shrugs as he continues to walk with Megan at his side. Train. Isn't that more work? I mean like, do you watch any movies or play a sport? The former ninja shakes his head. No, replies Naruto. Megan frowns. I spent most of my life on the run or fighting. Never had time to enjoy a movie or play games. Naruto. A shrug comes from the ninja. I like to train and create new jutsu. Naruto pauses as the light changes. Also. I love to fight and battle against strong opponents. It is one of the reasons that I choose to be a hero. Amusement appears in Megan's eyes. Most people become heroes in order to help others, smiles the Martian girl. Did you join for that reason? asks Naruto. Megan bites her lip, I thought so. I like to help people, but you are right. I originally joined the team to find acceptance and gain friends, admits Megan. Naruto knows that she is telling the truth. Why did you join the team? That is a good question. The light changes and he crosses the street with Megan at his side. He takes a moment to ponder that answer. Why did he join the team? It was a nice answer to say he joined to one day become part of the Justice League, but that was not the truth. And it was another thing to say that he joined to fight against strong opponents. Once again, not the entire truth. 
Naruto frowns because he doesn't know the true reason that he joined the team. I don't have an answer to that, he admits. Megan gives a reassuring smile. I am sure you will find it out in time. An idea strikes her. Hello Megan. Let's go see a movie. She grabs his hand dragging him away. Naruto offers no resistance as he lets her pull him in a random direction. Break. That was great. It was my first time watching a movie at a theater on Earth. Megan begins to ramble. Naruto walks over to the girl eating a piece of Pocky. Pocky is a flavored stick of candy that is popular in Japan. He enjoys the candy and tends to carry around at least one pack on him at all times. The movie was a dramatic action movie that had lots of fighting centered on various martial arts. There was a love story in it as well. The movie was good, admitted Naruto. A bit on the overdramatic side and the fight scenes were a bit showy, but the movie as a whole was good. He might come see another in the future. A couple of teens around the age of Naruto and Megan come out the theater. I am telling you that Shinobi would have beat those guys easy. Shinobi can spit lightning from his mouth. Exclaims one of the teens. Who is Shinobi? Asks Megan. Naruto raises a finger pointing at himself. Stop calling him Shinobi, it is a stupid name. The dude is Ninja Man. No way, it is Shinobi. Megan looks at Naruto in confusion. I don't have a code name, so everyone argues on what to call me, explains Naruto. Shinobi, Ninja Man, Shadow are among the most popular. I had no idea you were so popular, smiles Megan. Naruto shrugs, I am one of the few heroes of Japanese descent. Plus, it is a source of pride for the country. Ninja and samurai have a deep history in Japan. Me being a ninja is a pretty big deal. Understanding appears in her eyes. You should come up with a code name beams megan that smile disappears at the blank expression he gives her or not the two walk outside to see it is completely dark outside a yawn comes from the girl it is pretty late well here it is late you should go back home and get some rest there might be a mission tomorrow says naruto megan nods i will have to stay up in order so my sleep schedule doesn't get all messed up a nod comes from the ninja she is not like him he is able to operate at full power with only four hours of sleep. A missing ninja is always being hunted by its village leaving little time to rest and relax. Naruto. Thank you for showing me around. I had a great time today. Naruto turns to face Megan. I had a good time as well. Feel free to visit again. Megan beams. She really did miss spending time with Naruto. It reaffirms that he is truly her best friend. The one person that understands her the most. Nighttime, apartment Naruto lies in bed staring up at the ceiling. Today was, fun. He had never spent a day just relaxing and enjoying the same thing as regular people. For the first time he understood the reason that members of the Justice League create a secret identity. It is nice to walk around the people without having to worry about being mobbed by fans or attacked by criminals. Maybe he will do it again without Megan next time. Closing his eyes, he falls into a light sleep. September 22nd Aqualad glances down at Megan, she is unconscious. Sweat is dripping down her face. He lifts up his arm wiping away the sweat that threatened to blind him. Panting, he knows that if he doesn't find a way to escape from this prison of fire then Megan would die and shortly afterwards he would as well. It didn't make any sense. How were they able to enter the cave undetected? The security measures should have alerted the team to any and all intruders. Instead the team was completely blinded sided by the attack. Calder, how is Megan? shouts Superboy. She is breathing, but I do not long how much longer she, we can handle this, admits Aqualad. He turns his head to see Robin and Artemis in a similar prison of fire. Artemis is covered in bruises with parts of her uniform burned away to reveal tantalizing views of her skin. She is glaring at the ones responsible. Robin on the other hand is unconscious and hasn't moved for the past five minutes. Artemis notices the glances. I think he blacked out. I can feel a pulse. This is not good, gulps kid. Like Superboy, he is trapped in melted metal keeping him trapped. It is times like these he wished that he could vibrate as fast as Flash to get out of this. How do we get out of this now? Megan whispers a name, Naruto. Tokyo Naruto pauses as he is about to make some breakfast. Strange, he felt as if someone tried to call out to him, it felt like Megan. One thing he never doubts in his instincts. Abandoning the breakfast, he forms a hand seal disappearing in a cloud of smoke. 
He reappears on the roof. At speeds that would make even Kid a bit envious, he leaps from roof to roof until reaching the designated alley. He enters in the phone booth and activates the Zeta tube. In a flash of light he disappears. A split second later, he appears in the cave, recognizes B06, Uzumaki Naruto. Naruto doesn't get a chance to search for the others when a fireball heads straight at him. He moves swiftly in the opposite direction of his attack. Several more fireballs are thrown at him, but he avoids them running down the hallway towards the kitchen. It takes less than a second for him to disappear into the shadows. The former missing ninja hides in the shadows as footsteps fill the air. Soon enough his attacker enters into the kitchen. His eyes narrow upon the enemy. It is an android that looks almost identical to Red Tornado except female in appearance. Drawing a kanai, he prepares to attack. The android turns to look straight at him. It lifts her arms launching a stream of fire. Naruto quickly leaps out of the way tossing the kanai at the android. A swat of the arm knocks the kanai out of the way. Fire powers, thinks Naruto. Red Inferno is the name he dubs her. His hands come together flashing through hand seals. The jutsu he planned to use was never completed when water erupted out of the sink taking the form of a spear and headed straight at him. Naruto dives out of the way tossing several shuriken at Red Inferno as a distraction. Channeling chakra to his legs, he darts out of the kitchen before getting a good look at his second enemy. Naruto has the cave completely memorized. He heads straight to the hangar. It is a large open area that will give him the best opportunity to fight his opponents. Red Inferno controls fire and judging from the water attack the second opponent controls and manipulates water. Possibly another android though he is not about to jump to conclusions. Assuming leads to under or overestimating and that leads to death. The ninja enters the hangar and leaps down next to the motorcycles. Behind him is a portion of the lake that is within the cave. The water behind him starts to rise up into a large wave. The tidal waves crashes down upon Naruto. He channels chakra to his feet to stick to the floor and avoid being swept away. Naruto reaches into his pouch slapping a paper bomb onto the floor before swimming away. Forming a hand seal, he activates the paper bomb. The explosion blows a large chunk of the floor away draining the water. A second red android emerges from the water. It hovers in the air using the water as a platform to do so. Naruto glances backwards to see the first female android. Red Inferno and Red Torpedo stare down upon Naruto. Fire and water jutsu are unusable. Biometric scanners will be able to detect me even when I am hiding in the shadows, analyzes Naruto. Fire and water come crashing down at Naruto. Both elements crash upon Naruto creating steam. When the steam clears it reveals a hole in the ground instead of a defeated ninja. Break a groan escapes Robin. Good to see you are finally awake. Robin sits up to see Artemis. He looks around to see that both of them are trapped in a prison of fire. His hands shoots to his utility belt only to find it was gone. They took that off you and burned it to ashes along with my bow, scowls Artemis. Robin looks over to see Calder nursing a near-death Megan. Why haven't they killed us? What are they waiting for? Dude, let's not rush to our death, says Kid struggling to get free. Superboy is valiantly trying to break free. His eyes are locked onto Megan. He can barely hear her breathing. Even her heart rate is beginning to slow down. Megan, I will save you. Red Inferno flies down between the two fire prisons. Red Torpedo emerges from the water landing next to its sister. A robotic voice fills the cavern speaking in Red Tornado's voice. Naruto Uzumaki, you have ten minutes to surrender or your teammates will die. Kid groans in annoyance. Water starts to rise up from the ground. It starts to swallow up Kid Flash and Superboy. Great, 10 minutes to live. You happy to have your answer now Robs? We need to find a way out, Robin examines the fire prison, there has to be a way. Artemis glances at Megan and Calder. Come on Naruto, you are supposed to be the best, help us out. Break, 6 minutes remain. Naruto double checks his gear. He calmly walks down the hallway where he smells the rest of the team. There is no point in hiding. His enemies are not searching for him. Red Inferno and Red Torpedo know that he will come to them in order to save the team. That is not the entire truth. It is not his mission to save the team. He has no obligations to save them. The reason he is fighting is because the enemy knows the location of the base. 
If the enemy can find the team here it means that the enemy might be able to find him in Tokyo. Is that the true reason? Wonders Naruto. He thinks back on Megan's question on why he decided to join the team. Back then he didn't have an answer to the question. And he still doesn't have an answer, but he knows that the reason he is trying to save the team is not to hide his identity or keep Tokyo safe from an attack. Megan pops into his mind. She is his friend. A person that he enjoys talking to and spending time with. If he doesn't save her then he will never get to hear her voice or see her again. The mere idea of her death fills him with anger. It is like the first time he fought Akatsuki and learned that they wanted to take Kurama from him. He was so angry that he lost control. Megan had become to mean as much to him as Kurama. We are all teammates, friends. You can trust us, says Calder. Aqualad, Calder even called him a friend. Artemis stood up for him when Kid tried to call him out as a traitor. Superboy has becoming a good sparring partner. At least for increasing his taijutsu skills. There are people on this team that mean something to Naruto. As much as he may try to deny it, he has come to enjoy spending time with the team. Kurama would be calling him soft right now. Naruto strikes a button opening the doors to the main reactor room. The doors slide open to reveal Red Inferno and Red Torpedo. On either side of each android is a prison made of fire with two members of his team in it. Robin and Artemis are trapped in the fire prison to the left. A barely conscious Calder and a near-death Megan are trapped in the fire prison to the right. Naruto's eyes lock onto Megan. Anger fills him at the sight. Red Inferno launches a fireball at Naruto. Naruto draws his katana slashing through the fireball. He moves at high speed slashing at Red Inferno, but water rises up protecting the female android. Spinning around, Naruto tosses two pellets at Calder before leaping high into the air. Calder catches the pellets hiding them behind his back. Give to Megan to consume, orders Naruto twisting in the air to avoid a fireball. A stream of water wraps around him and slams him into the ceiling. Calder opens Megan's mouth forcing her to chew and swallow the black pellets. A couple seconds later, her eyes slowly open up. Megan, are you okay? Weak, whispers Megan. She looks at the fire. What, happening? Naruto watch out, shouts Artemis. A fireball heads straight at the pinned Naruto. Naruto channels chakra to his feet to stick to the wall and push off breaking free from the water. The fireball scorches the location he was just in. He tosses a barrage of kanai and shuriken at the androids. Both androids easily dodge the weapons. Once he falls into the water he is done, says Kid. Naruto splashes down on the water shocking the team. No way, says Artemis. How is he doing that? Whispers Robin. Dude, are you related to Jesus? Asks Kid. Aqualad stares at Naruto who is standing on top of the water. What is the extent of your powers? What other elements can you manipulate? asks Aqualad. All. Even water. All elements. So it is true, he can manipulate all the elements, thinks Aqualad. Red Inferno raises both arms launching a stream of water at Naruto. Naruto's hands flash through a series of hand seals at high speeds. Sweden. Swiriudan no jutsu. The water behind the ninja rises up taking the form of giant water dragon. Every member of the team watches in awe as the water dragon roars before charging head first into the flames. It overcomes the flames and continues towards Red Inferno engulfing the fire manipulating android. Naruto prepares to finish the android. He never notices the water rising behind him taking the shape of Red Torpedo. Dude! Look out! Megan's eyes widen in terror as Red Torpedo creates a blade of water and stabs Naruto straight through the back. The water blade pops out the front of his chest. Naruto. No, whispers Aqualad. Naruto stands frozen with his eyes wide. He looks down before turning his head to look at Red Torpedo. Shocking everyone including the android, Naruto bursts into water. A steel blade bursts out the front of Red Torpedo's chest. Red Torpedo looks down at the blade before turning to look at its attacker. Naruto stands behind the android unharmed. Viciously he yanks out his katana before swinging it upward decapitating the android. Red torpedo's head and body splash into the water. Kid blinks. Um okay what just happened? I thought we watched him get killed. The water starts to recede until leaving Naruto standing on the cold hard floor. Several fireballs rain down upon Naruto. Naruto moves swiftly avoiding the fireballs. 
He wishes that his opponent wasn't an android so he would be able to use his Sharingan. Reaching back, he tosses a half dozen shuriken at Red Inferno. His hands start to flash through hand seals. Shuriken Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. The six shuriken multiple into twenty shuriken. Red Inferno is unable to burn away all the shuriken and several pierce its metal body. Sparks begin to occur over Red Inferno. Naruto reveals invisible ninja wire in his hand that is attached to several of the shuriken embedded in Red Inferno's body. A hard yank pulls Red Inferno straight towards him. At the same time Naruto channels chakra to his legs enhancing his speed to a point that he becomes a blur to even Kid and Superboy. Naruto reappears behind Red Inferno with sword drawn. Red Inferno splits in half diagonally from a clean cut. The android explodes in a shower of debris. The fire trapping Artemis, Robin, Megan, and Aqualad dissipates. Megan, shouts Superboy. I am, okay, says Megan. Aqualad carries her down the steps. She looks over at Naruto. Thanks Naruto, you saved me, us. Superboy looks away with guilty eyes. Jealousy soon starts to fill him. Artemis walks over to Naruto. So how did you do that walking on water? Secret, replies Naruto. Artemis huffs in annoyance. Great we are all saved, now can you get us out of here? Bemoans kid. Artemis smirks, I don't know, I like you better like this. Zeta tubes are back online. I am sending a communication to the league, reports Robin. Perhaps I can be of assistance, says Red Tornado. The team turns to see Red Tornado fly into the room. Where have you been? Your brother and sister tried to kill us, exclaims Artemis. Red Tornado lands on the ground. The robot superhero stares at the destroyed robots that share many similarities to him. Zeta tubes and communication were down. I decided to investigate so I teleported to Providence and flew from there. Red Tornado walks over to the head of Red Torpedo. I was not aware that I had any family. He kneels down touching the head of Red Torpedo. A small spark is transmitted and Red Tornado's eyes glow red. Suddenly, Red Tornado hovers in the air. Red Tornado creates twin vortexes with its arms sucking up all the air. Aqualad and Megan are the first to succumb to the lack of oxygen. Kid Flash is next followed by Superboy and Robin. Artemis falls to her knees not believing that Red Tornado turned against them. She soon collapses. Naruto falls to a knee as his vision begins to darken. Closing his eyes, he channels chakra to his heart slowing it down to appear passed out. A minute later, Naruto's eyes shoot open to reveal Red Tornado and along with the head of Red Torpedo gone. He stands up checking on others. All of them are alive though unconscious. Naruto takes a seat on the ground needing to recharge. Break Artemis wakes up to find Superman standing over her. Superman? Superman gives a friendly smile reaching out with his hand. She takes his hand allowing him to help her up. What is going on? Her eyes widen. Where is Red Tornado? Robin turns from talking with Batman. Gone, so are the bodies of the other two androids. Artemis looks to see Flash and Captain Atom working to cut Kid Flash and Superboy free. I can't believe Red Tornado attacked us, says Megan in disbelief. Soon enough, Superboy and Kid have been cut free. Kid, Robin, Artemis, and Aqualad are sitting at a table not saying a word. Green Arrow walks over to the table placing down a bowl of pretzels for the team to snack on. Thanks, but no thanks, says Kid. Yeah, what we want are answers about Red Tornado and his siblings, says Robin. Yeah. Green Arrow picks up the bowl and prepares to leave. Leave the bowl, says Kid. The young speedster grabs the bowl and begins to munch down. Superboy looks over to the side to see Batman and Naruto speaking privately. He uses his super hearing to listen in on the conversation. Batman has a pensive expression. You reported that during your mission to protect Taipei, Sportsmaster revealed information on the team's involvement in Baiyala. Such knowledge leads there to believe a possible inside source on the team's actions. Possibly, agrees Naruto. Red Tornado's actions and the attack on the cave confirm that our location and identity is not as secret as believed. In an instant, Naruto spins around grabbing an offending arm and tossing his attacker straight into the cavern wall. The loud noise draws everyone's attention. Connor. Gasps Megan. What are you doing? Superboy grits his teeth getting out of the small hole. He knew. 
he knew there was a mole on the team and didn't say anything. What? Are you serious? Glares kid. How could you not tell us? Frowns Robin. Kid scowls. Just like he didn't tell us about Deathstroke offering him a position in the League of Shadows. Naruto, is this true? asks Megan. Naruto turns to face the team, it was not of any importance. Megan was almost killed. Superboy walks threateningly towards Naruto. We all almost died, how is that not important? argues Artemis. Batman speaks up in a tone that ends all argument. Enough. The team turns around to face Batman no one daring to speak out against the Dark Knight. Since Red Tornado's disappearance the team will be monitored by a rotating staff of Justice League members. Captain Marvel has agreed to take the first shift. A tall muscular hero in red and gold steps forward. We are going to have a great time, smirks Captain Marvel. Superboy turns to glare at Naruto. When I have dismantled Red Tornado I will deal. Red Tornado is Justice League. Batman stands before Connor. You will leave him to us. Superboy grits his teeth keeping silent. I have another mission for you all. A screen pops up revealing a newspaper clip. Kid frowns upon reading the front. Gorilla Gorilla attack? Batman please tell me you are not serious about this joke of a mission, scowls Robin. Batman's eyes narrow upon his protege. I never joke about the mission. Robin looks away refusing to meet Batman's eyes. I have studied the patterns and investigated the sources. Aqualad, you and your team will depart for India and check this out. Kid glances over at Naruto. I don't know how comfortable I am teaming up with someone that doesn't trust us. I see, says Naruto. In that case I will put in my resignation to the team. Naruto, starts Aqualad. Superboy glares at Naruto. Let him go. He almost got us all killed. Megan wants to say something, but doesn't know what to say. Artemis is too angry at the situation and silently agrees with the others. Naruto glances at Aqualad before heading towards the Zeta tubes. In a flash of light he disappears. A punch sends a thug flying through the air, he slams into a building wall. Blood sprays from his mouth before he hits the ground unconscious. Naruto glances around to find all the Yakuza members knocked out cold. A few pictures are taken before he vanishes in a swirl of leaves. The ninja reappears on the roof of a building, it has been seven hours since he left the team. A mixture of emotions filled him that were driving him to be a bit rougher than normal with the criminals he came across. The first emotion that he felt was anger. Anger at the team for not trusting him. After everything he had done for the team, he saved them from certain death at the hands of Red Inferno and Red Torpedo. If he had not shown up the entire team would be dead. How many times does he have to save them during a mission to prove that he is trustworthy? The second emotion that filled him was sadness. For the first time in his life, he had found a place where he belonged. A place where people were not calling him names or trying to kill him. He leaps to the next roof. Perhaps that is the true reason he joined the team. Always being alone is more painful than most people can imagine. No one to rely on, no one to talk to, and more importantly no one to care about his well-being. Loneliness can inflict terrible pain on a person. When Canary offered him the chance to join a team where he would work with others his age it was a chance to drive away the loneliness. That was the real reason that he agreed to join the team, and it worked. Though the team didn't know a thing about espionage, it was nice being able to do missions with others. More importantly, he even managed to make a couple friends in Megan and Aqualad. But all that was gone now. He refused to be on a team that didn't trust him. As much as it hurt to leave, he did what he had to do. A presence struck his senses. Naruto paused at the edge of the roof. He turned around to stare into the shadows of the building. You can come out, states the ninja. Out of the shadows emerges a beautiful young woman. The woman is one of the most gorgeous women he ever laid eyes upon. She has high cheekbones, a sharp nose, green eyes like her father, and long brown hair. She wears a green and black full body jumpsuit with matching gloves and boots, and a white belt and holster with a small semi automatic pistol. He has come across many kunoichi and heroines, this woman is one of the most beautiful he ever laid eyes upon. And judging from the way she moves with such confidence, she knows of her beauty. You are good. Would you prefer to speak in your native language? Naruto's eyes dart around. If your hidden partners make a move, I will take you all down. A smile forms on her face. She nods in acceptance. 
I am impressed. It seems that the rumors about you were all true. Naruto stares at her with a blank expression. My name is Talia and I come bearing a request from my father. We wish to offer you a spot within in the League of Shadows. One with your skill and abilities would be at my father's right hand. You would be denied nothing. I don't serve those that are weaker than me. Yet you are on a team filled with those weaker than you including the team leader, replies Talia knowingly. Let me rephrase my comment, if I was to become an assassin I would not do it under the command of another. My skills outstrip all your soldiers including you and your father. I would not need his assistance in being at the top, states Naruto. Talia gains a hint of annoyance at the slight to her abilities. Still, she knew that he was not bragging or being arrogant. This is a child with the abilities and strength to defeat supervillains like Mammoth and Grundy. Not to mention he humiliated the League of Shadows assassins during the Peace Summit. He ruined her father and Luther's plan to use the summit as a grounds to show off a new weapon to get the leaders of Relasia in Luther's favor. In the end, Luther managed to charm the leaders of Relasia, but it took longer than desired. Uzumaki Naruto was not an opponent to underestimate. As much as she loved Batman, she knew that this young man was far better at working in the shadows than the Dark Knight. Perhaps, but there is much about the world that is a mystery to you. And our organization is not as cold blooded as you think. We seek to guide the world down the right path. Save the speech, I have heard it before. You are not the first organization to seek me out for the power I contain. Well, that is not the entire truth. Akatsuki sought Kurama's strength, not his. I no longer wish to speak to you. Leave, says Naruto. A sigh escapes the woman. She snaps her fingers. Assassins surround Naruto. You give me, her eyes widen as Naruto suddenly vanishes. In a split second all the assassins are taken down. Naruto reappears back in his original spot. Multiple thuds fill the air as the assassins drop unconscious. She draws her pistol. Blood sprays from her mouth. Her brown eyes look down to see Naruto in front of her and his fist buried into her gut. This was not the best time to talk to me. I am in a very bad mood, glares Naruto. A second punch to the gut makes her cough up more blood before her eyes roll up into her head. She falls face first unconscious. He turns leaping to the next roof. Talia would forever remember this moment as the first time she came close to death. Mount Justice Canary waits impatiently for the team to get back from the mission to India. She taps her foot impatiently. If the team didn't show up soon she would go to India and find them. Fortunately, it doesn't come to that as the computer alerts her to the bio ship entering the cave. Reaching out she hits a button opening communication with the team. Team this is Canary, you are all to meet me for debriefing right away, she closes the link before any argument could be made. Batman believes that the team should handle its problems on its own, she was all for individuals learning from their own mistakes, but this is a matter that needed to be discussed right away. Canary was going to make the team realize its foolish behavior resulted in a situation that couldn't be fixed. Calder was first to arrive followed by the rest of the team. Where is Captain Marvel? asks Canary curiously. He flew off after the mission, answers Kid. I am starving can't we do this tomorrow? No, states Canary. The team is surprised by her hard tone. This isn't about debriefing, I have another matter to discuss with the team. Is it about Naruto? asks Calder. Canary nods. Kid scowls. Why do we need to talk about him? He is not part of the team anymore. Good riddance. The young speedster gulps as her eyes narrow upon him. For the first time in his life, Kid wants to run away from a beautiful woman. There is nothing to talk about. He knew that there was a traitor and didn't tell us. It almost got everyone killed, states Superboy angrily. You forget the part where he saved all of you, points out Canary. If he had not risked his life to fight against Red Tornado's siblings, none of you would be alive. I don't care if you were Keeptonian because that wouldn't matter if the droids shipped you back to Cadmus to be mind wiped. Superboy folds his arms across his chest and refuses to meet her eyes. Robin steps forward. That is true, but if we had prior knowledge about a traitor then we would have been more cautious. Calder voices his own opinion. Or would we have turned on each other? The team turns to look at Aqualad with questioning eyes. It would be hard to trust one another if we knew that there was a traitor in our midst. Such knowledge might even tear the team apart making it impossible to complete a mission or worse get us killed. I have been thinking on it this entire time. And I agree with Naruto's decision to not tell us. 
It has been on my mind too, admits Megan. Superboy looks at his girlfriend in surprise. Batman knew about a possible traitor because Naruto told him. Even Batman didn't see fit to tell us. If Batman never saw it as important information then maybe it wasn't that big of a deal. Artemis raises an eyebrow, isn't Batman like the most secretive person in the world? A chuckle comes from Robin. You have no idea, smirks the boy wonder. Robin sighs. Alright, maybe we jump to conclusions, but we had a right to know. We are a team. Then as a team, why don't you go ask Naruto the real reason he didn't tell you? Says Canary. Instead of jumping to conclusions hear it from the source. This is a chance to make things right. The members of the team all look at each other. Tokyo. Higurashi's weapon shop Higurashi examines the sword closely. You have been keeping it in good shape. The old shopkeeper sheathes the sword. He looks over to see Naruto examining the kanai and shuriken. A smirk appears on the old man's face. It took him a while, but he soon figured out that this kid was the hero that had started to protect Tokyo five months ago. Took him a few months, but a blacksmith always recognizes his weapons. Several officers and reporters had been going around to various weapon shops to find out if any of the owners were supplying this new child hero with the weapons that he used to take down criminals. Higurashi instantly recognized the kanai and shuriken. He made them after all. A good thing he no longer had the real steel weapons on display or the cops and reporters might have been able to match the weapons to his own. Fortunately, the displays are made of a much weaker metal and easily broken. Good quality, but not mine. I create ornaments and decorations not suitable for any type of real life usage, yawns Higurashi. A nod comes from the officer. If you come by any information let us know, says the officer. Higurashi nods before going back to his book. There was no way that Higurashi was going to sell out his favorite client. Besides, Naruto saved several friends a month back. As far as he was concerned the kid's secret was safe with him. I have been working on creating a new sword for you. It is going to be my finest creation, states Higurashi. The katana I have is fine, replies Naruto. I have no need for a new one at the moment. You won't be saying that once I finish, Higurashi smirks proudly. Naruto places the kanai and shuriken in his pouch. He glances at Higurashi. The shopkeeper tosses Naruto's katana back to him. Catching the weapon, he sheathes it on his back. Higurashi watches as the kid leaves the shop. Laughing, he heads to back of the shop to continue work on his masterpiece. In a swirl of leaves, Naruto appears safely on the roof of the weapon shop. He leaps to several more roofs. It is almost noon. Naruto starts to think on whether he should head home or find a nice place to eat at. Naruto, says a familiar voice. The ninja lands on the ledge of a building. His eyes drift to the sky to see Megan flying towards him. Ocean blue eyes track the movements of several others. Artemis and Robin are zip lining from roof to roof. Superboy is leaping the distance between each building with ease. Aqualad is using his water bearers to create a water platform to move from building to building. Naruto turns his head as a yellow blur runs up the side of the building and is soon standing in front of him. Megan lands next to Kid. Superboy is the next one to land. Robin, Artemis, and Aqualad are the last to land on the building. Naruto stares at them curiously. We want to talk, says Megan. No, we want to apologize. She sends him a pleading look. Aqualad steps forward. Naruto, the words we send back at the cave were said out of anger. We were confused and angry at Red Tornado's betrayal. To find out that our friend might have known information about a traitor and didn't tell us, it hurt. Naruto remains silent. Try to understand it from our position. Why didn't you tell us? asks Robin. Naruto answers without hesitation. The information was not reliable. What is that supposed to mean? frowns Superboy. On my solo mission to Taipei to protect the peace summit I fought against Sportsmaster. He made a comment about Baila. Sportsmaster, Artemis's eyes narrow in anger, you can't trust him. You never did, smiles Megan. I am sure he knows all about our mission to Baila, but not because I believe there is a traitor. Kid frowns, how else would he know? Naruto glances at Kid. It was a failed mission. Our cover was blown from the start. Realization appears in Aqualad and Robin's eyes. Not to mention that all the soldiers we fought including the psychic were left alive to relay information on our presence to others. 
Sportsmaster knowing such information was not a surprise nor an indication of a spy. Batman believed it might indicate a mole, but I did not. I apologize, we should have trusted you from the start, says Aqualad. I'm sorry too, says Megan. She looks at Superboy. He remains silent. A glare from his girlfriend makes Superboy grunt and mumble an apology. Kid grumbles out an apology. Artemis gives an apologetic look, yeah sorry. Me too, says Robin. Aqualad steps forward. Would you reconsider joining the team? He offers his hand. Megan smiles, please Naruto. Naruto can sense no negative emotions. As much as he wanted to say no because of the betrayal, he couldn't. He wanted to be part of the team. Reaching out, he shakes Aqualad's hand. Okay, nods the ninja. It felt good to be back on the team. The end, now we will see you in the next video.